Okay. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me on uh, YouTube?
Hello, everyone. I'm sorry for keeping you waiting. We are just about to kick off with the starting. So please give us two minutes more and we'll make sure everything is connected to YouTube, Facebook, um, that all people who are needed to start are here uh, in Krakow or are connected with us on WebEx. Sure. Kasi wala ko kuya maisip na medyo active. Pa. Kasi wala ko maisip na inquiry activity ko. Hello everyone, uh, can you hear me? Um, I can see some of you, raise your thumb if you can see me. Perfect, thank you. Um, so we are about to start with the conference. Uh, the conference will be opened by the Dean of the Philosophy Faculty of Jesuit University. 
University Ignaciano. Uh, so I will now uh, ask Tomas Homa to to open the conference to kick off with the uh, with the first conference on Christian philosophy organized by Jesuit University Ignaciano in Krakow. I hope this is the first but not the last conference. Uh, so, uh, Father Father Tomas, can we ask you to to come here and to open the conference? Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to open this international conference on Christian philosophy. I am delighted to welcome so many of you from many countries of the world. Due to the pandemic situation, many of you have to participate online. Some of you, especially Polish participants, are on site here in Krakow. I am happy that these difficult global circumstances did not hinder us from meeting together and reflecting together. I first wish to extend to all of you the warm greetings of my rector, of the rector of the Jesuit University Ignatianum in Krakow, Father Josef Bremer. He regrets, but due to health problems, he is not able to personally take part in the conference. The conference theme is Christian philosophy, its past, present, and future. It is organized by the Institute of Philosophy of the Jesuit University, Ignatianum in Krakow. In our university, we developed Christian philosophy since 1862, 67, sorry, when the Jesuit seminary was established in Krakow. In 1932, the Pontifical Faculty of Philosophy was erected by Vatican. Almost 70 years later, at the end of the 20th century, the faculty became so big and diverse that the Jesuit decided to establish university. Today, there, is a, there are two faculties, seven institutes, and 12 programs of study, philosophy, cultural studies, psychology, tourism, and recreation, media and social communication, pedagogy, social work, political sciences, administration and public policy, management and ICT in public sector English language. Around 250 professors teach almost 3,000 students. We run also a school of PhD students for PhD students in philosophy, cultural studies, pedagogy, and political sciences. In all these areas, we strive to provide solid philosophical fundamentals based on the tradition of the fruitful cooperation of faith and reason. We participate in a long and rich tradition of reflection in the Christian context. We would like to continue and develop this tradition. We are very appreciative that so many international scholars have accepted our invitation to attend this conference, held to the mark the closing of our four-year research project called Polish Christian Philosophy in the 20th Century, founded by Polish Ministry of Science and Higher Education. At this point, I would like to thank you, the project manager, Reverend Professor Machibawa, and the coordinator, Professor Piotr Mazu. He is with us for their hard work in the last four years. I congratulate the conference organizing committee 
particularly Jaroslav Kuharski, the chair, and Jakub Prosch, the secretary, as well as the scientific committee, particularly the chair, Professor Piotr Masi. I can imagine the problems which one had to face in order to get the preparation of the conference to this part. Let me now close by wishing you delightful and stimulating days. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Father Dean. And now let me introduce the uh, Chief of Scientific Committee, uh, Professor Piotr Mazur. Thank you. Dear participants of the conference, today Christian philosophy poses a similar problem as it did at St. Augustine's times. We know exactly what it is, as long as nobody asks. So I will not even try to define it at this very moment. The conference consists of two main sections. The first is related to the presentation of the result of research into Polish Christian philosophy of the 20th century, and the second to a more general presentation of what it was in the past, what is now, and what, uh, and what Christian philosophy may be in the future, with its various representatives and uh, bigger and smaller problems. At the beginning of the conference, please let me summarize in several sentences the findings of the research on Polish Christian philosophy of the 20th century conducted by over 60 philosophers since 2016. The 20th century was a period of painful trials. Apart from regaining independence in 1918, Poland became a victim of two world wars, the rise of totalitarian systems, communism and Nazism, as well as organized forms of homicide linked with enslavement and contempt for human dignity. After 1945, when the Soviet Union imposed the totalitarian system on Poland, the political monopoly was accompanied by the worldview monopoly based on official claims of the Marxist-Leninist philosophy. All those experienced strongly influenced Polish culture and philosophy. The great Christian philosopher of that period in Poland such as Woroniecki and Konieczny in the first half of the 20th century and Wojtyła, Krompiec, Kamiński, Zdybicka, Gogacz or Tischner in the, sec in the second half of the century tried to respond to those challenges by referring to various philosophical trends. The Christian philosophy of the 20th century allowed us to preserve the continuity of Polish culture and its connection with the heritage of the West. It also became a guarantee of scientific pluralism. Christian philosophers of that period developed both traditional philosophical concepts and their own original solutions. Consequently, they played an important role in the development of humanities and culture. They formed methods and strategies for education and upbringing. They showed the rationality of religious beliefs and attitudes. They defended the basic principles of civilization and other rules of public lives. They influenced the political changes taking place in Poland and in the world. Among those people, among those people John Paul II undoubtedly played the greatest role but there was many others prominent representatives of Christian philosophy of that period. In the project, we discussed the scientific, scientific uh, achievements of 13, 30 of them, and in a uh, companion to the Polish Christian philosophy of the 20th and 21st centuries, we outlined the achievement of many others. We hope 
or further develop to extend the research carried out so far by opening up to international cooperation. We want to recall the greatest, uh, the great achievement of the past, but also to take up the challenges faced by Christian philosophy in the 21st century. Hence, our conference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now uh, the, the, the schedule uh, gives uh, the, uh, the voice to myself. Uh, thank you very much that uh, this conference is starting right now. Uh, as an organizational committee, we got uh, uh, we, we got this moment of uh, being uh, considering to postpone this conference, to cancel this conference, or to what to do uh, when the pandemic uh, hits the world. Uh, and uh, we received one email from you, from the participants. Uh, in that email stands, uh, sorry for possibly misquoting, uh, don't do that. Uh, you asked us for uh, to, to run this conference. You asked uh, you asked us uh, to uh, make this conference happen, and you forced us to uh, make this conference in that shape that uh, we are experiencing now. So, in the shape of a hybrid one. Thank you, the participants, for doing th that, for inspiring us. Uh, let also. Uh, 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 let, let me also uh, be thankful to uh, uh, first to the scientific committee with uh, with his head Professor Mazur, and the second to the organizational com committee with uh, uh, Jacek Poznański, uh, the Jesuit, and uh, Jakub Prusz. Without them, uh, this conference uh, just uh, won't go. Uh, thank you, thank you very much for your commitment. Thank you very much for your determination and for your creativity to make this uh, make this happen. Uh, again, thank you, the participants that you are here. We, uh, we got participants uh, from over the world, uh, from Philippines to United States. Uh, so uh, I hope that, that this uh, could be a great uh, event, and I hope not the only one event. Uh, maybe, maybe we can turn it together, we can, we can turn it into a periodic event uh, to uh, make some constant uh, reflection on Christian philosophy, its past, present, and Future. Uh, for now, I just want to uh, uh, I, I just want to say something about technical uh, uh, t t technical uh, issues. Uh, first, uh, you, you are now watching uh, either on Webex or at YouTube or Facebook, so-called uh, room number one. Uh, at the room number one, uh, sessions uh, number uh, one, three, five, and seven will be uh, will be streamed will, 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 will be broadcast. Uh, you can also switch into room number two, uh, uh, as the links are given in the description of the of the stream and in the mail you received. Uh, in the room number two, you can participate in uh, sessions number two, four, six, and uh, and uh, eight. Uh, please use the chat to communicate with us. Please use the emails if you uh, have our our emails. Uh, please uh, let us know if you uh, uh, if you have any uh, technical issues with uh, with the transmission or with uh, uh, or with the voice of with, with, with something else. I can see the chat is uh, running right now. Uh, all right. Uh, we want to make this conference not only uh, not, not only be one-sided, but uh, we want to discuss all those theses, all those topics that will be here presented. So you are welcome to uh, um, engage to uh, make some discussions with uh, with us. Uh, right now we are going to uh, sleep. Uh, sleep. Uh, we are going to uh, move to uh, number the room number one and room number two. So please give us about five minutes, and we're coming back with our broadcast. Thank you very much, and let's start it. Okay, for everyone who wants to join session two, please change to the link given before on Webex or on YouTube stream. If you want to participate in session one, please stay with us and give us five minutes and we will kick off with the first talk 
by Jean Gauvet from University of St. Andrews. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. Um, I'm sorry for keeping you waiting. We are just about to start. The, the session num num number two has just started, and we will start with the session one. So the first talk will be given by Jean Gauvet from University of St. Andrews. Um, I have uh, two questions to you. The first, the first request is to, to, sh to show your video, to show the other participants that you are here with us. If you are not shy, please don't be, and show your face to us. And the second question, or the second request, um, is to unmute yourself. And if you want to ask the questions during the, the question session after the, after the Jean talk, um, just please unmute yourself, ask your question, and mute yourself again to avoid the, the echo or other effects. Uh, so I can see that Jean is with us. Hello, Jean. Um, let me start with, with your lecture. We will now display Jean's lecture. It has 16 minutes. And then we will start with questions. First, we will have the questions from the audience on site, if there are any. There are only a few of us here in Krakow, but maybe there are some questions. Um, then we will start with the questions from the people from on WebEx, from you, from the participants. And then we will ask the questions uh, from YouTube stream and Facebook stream. From I will read it from the from the comments. Is that clear? Okay. Um, so let's start with Jean's talk. Um, and Jean Jean will give a talk on extended mind, extended person, and extended soul. Uh, just raise your thumbs if you can see the, the presentation. Can you see it? Thank you. All right. So let's start. And then we will uh, keep all your questions in your mind. And then you can ask it after the talk. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jean Gauvet. And I will be giving my presentation this morning on extended minds, extended persons, extended souls. Before beginning, a word of thanks um, for the opportunity to give this talk, as well as for the organizers, for the um, impeccable organization, given the current circumstances. And a word of welcome. Uh, as you can see, I'm recording this from home. I would have preferred to use the uh, university offices, but I'm currently under uh, quarantine at the time of recording. Um, so welcome home maybe slightly more informal than normal, but uh, the situation uh, dictates so. Um, so let's get down to the proper um, presentation. So the, the article revolves around the notion of distributed cognition. Distributed cognition, the idea that entities external to one's organic brain participate in one's overall cognitive functioning, is understood by functionalists in philosophy of mind to imply that mind is extended outwards of the brain. Some go a step further and assert that since the mind is extended, then so is the person. I argue that these issues are posing new challenges, not only to physicalism, but also to dualism and to, to hylomorphic theories of mind. In fact, the aim of this paper is to investigate whether there is a way in which the dualist or the hylomorphist may accept the notion of distributed cognition without necessarily accepting the notions of extended mind, personhood, or even extended souls. While the dualists and the may hylomorphists the may choose of to dismiss cognition the notion of distributed cognition altogether, as some physicalists have done, I shall attempt to elucidate a second route available that will allow for a non-physicalist reformulation while still accepting the notion of distributed cognition. So what is distributed cognition? The idea is that the mind, or at the very least cognition, is not only located within the brain, but rather extends outwards. While still the topic of much debate, it seems that external objects share in the cognitive process and thus constitute our cognitive apparatus. Thus, objects around us, such as mobile phones, tablets, or even less technologically advanced artifacts, such as notebooks or diaries, enable us to offload parts of the cognitive process in order to help us to carry out specific tasks. 
Furthermore, distributed cognition also implies what Clark and Chalmers termed as the extended self. If the person is where the mind is, and if the mind is extended, then it follows that the person is also extended. I shall refer to this as extended. We should, however, underline a significant objection against distributed cognition, which states that while elements of the external world causally interact with the brain, it does not necessarily follow that these extra neural entities partly constitute cognition. Furthermore, related to distributed cognition is the reality of neuroprosthesis. In these situations, similar to replacing an organic heart with an artificial one, defective parts of the brain are replaced by artificial replacements. Some types of neuroprosthesis are already widely used, such as cochlear implants. Yet we can imagine a situation in which every part of the brain is slowly replaced by an inorganic counterpart, arriving to the point where there are no organic parts left. We can call this an instance of an inorganic self, or as I shall refer to it now as inorganic. Thus what extended and inorganic both show us is that our intuition that cognitive processes are limited only to organic matter is false. In this sense, it no longer makes sense to, sp to speak of the brain, but rather of the cognitive system, which incorporates all the organic and inorganic entities that constitute cognition. I shall now explore how the dualist, materialist, and the hylomorphist react to these notions. To do this, I shall consider Lynn Rather Baker's constitution view as a physicalist view, Aristotle's conception of persons as soul and body as a hylomorphic view, and Richard Swinburne's reinterpretation of Cartesian dualism. The first, Baker views the person as being constituted by the body, having what she terms as a capacity for first person's perspective. Unlike other physicalists, Baker does not accept extended. She separates cognition and mind by introducing a separation between personal and subpersonal states. Whatever happens on a personal level pertaining to mind are those mental states which I am consciously aware of. On the other hand, whatever happens on a subpersonal level, the level of cognition, I am not consciously aware of and may be extended. Baker's aim, therefore, is to show that while instances of cognition may occasionally extend out of one's physical body, this does not mean that the person, or her mind for that matter, also extends outwards. Baker asserts that shifting and transitory hybrids can hardly be persons, and thus rejects the notion of extended. However, this seems question-begging. It seems that Baker's attempt to reconcile distributed cognition with her constitution view seemed like trying to hammer a square peg into a round hole. For example, some argue that the separation between personal and subpersonal states is itself unsupported by contemporary cognitive science and thus seems somewhat ad hoc. It should be noted that while Baker is unsympathetic to the notion of extended, she is less so towards the notion of inorganic. She asserts that mind arises out of an organic body, but can also incorporate inorganic parts, as long as such parts form a single physical entity. Moving on, what about hylomorphism? Aristotle held, as we all know, that all living things have a soul, consisting of three main capacities, nutrition, perception, and intellect. While all living things exhibit While nutrition, things exhibit only nutrition, animals exhibit nutrition, animals exhibit nutrition and perception, nutrition and, and only perception, humans exhibit all, humans all, three exhibit all three faculties. Aristotle could have never conceived Aristotle of the world we inhabit today. Yet in his metaphysics, his metaphysics book Z, he comments on Z. men not necessarily being made of flesh and bones. What then should restrict us from considering only organic matter in Aristotle's dichotomy of matter and form? Nothing, I believe. To hold a contrary position would be to exert a form of organic chauvinism. Dualism is not in a better position either. Swinburne's Cartesian dualism states that the soul is the material entity 
that experience mental states and undergoes mental events. These are differentiated from the brain that has brain states and brain events. The relationship between the two is such that the brain and the soul causally interact with one another. From what has already been said before, a more precise way for Spurenburn to state the above would be to say that each human soul interacts with a cognitive system. Furthermore, Swinburne articulates the location of the soul as being where brain and soul causally interact with one another. Thus, we could theoretically be in a position to say that the soul of a particular individual is either located in some inorganic substance or possibly even extended outward of the brain. All that has been said thus far implies some serious consequences for both the hylomorphist and the dualist. For both theories, inorganic and extended, lead to having to consider the inorganic parts that participate in the overall cognitive system of an individual as deserving of the same ethical value accorded to the rest of the body, in virtue of being in relation to the soul. Where does this leave us? Proponents of either theory may choose to bite the bullet and accept that the inorganic parts should be accorded the same ethical value given that the soul is present in these parts, or alternatively dismiss the notion of extended and inorganic outrightly. I propose yet another alternative, one that can still respect the empirical evidence in favour of inorganic and extended parts, yet still restricting ethical value to the organic living body only. This, I argue, can be done by a separation of the notions of soul and mind. The concept of soul has a much longer history than that of mind. Crucially, while mind has always had the function of mentality pertaining to thinking, the notion of soul, on the other hand, especially prior to Descartes, held within it not only mentality, but also identity, vitality and more functions. In this regard, I agree with Bremer that over time the thinking Cartesian soul was itself identified with the entirety of the Aristotelian soul. Therefore, one soul conceived in Aristotelian terms must remain the basis for ascribing ethical value to the organic individual in the relationship between matter and form. Aristotle speaks of the human body as having such a soul because it carries out and exhibits the three capabilities already mentioned. In this sense, therefore, at least in the case of extended, we already have a manner in which we can exclude such external entities from the hylomorphic unity. Because even if we were to agree with the assertion that such entities participate in the cognitive process, they do not exhibit the other two functions of the soul, namely nutrition and perception. A crude litmus test would therefore be to say that in cases of distributed cognition, the Aristotelian soul resides in the organic body which is animated by unitary life. A crucial clarificatory note should now be inserted here before going further. Some philosophers use the terms mental and cognitive interchangeably. However, Clark and Chalmers do not consider all instances of cognition to be instances of mind, at least in the physicalist sense. This distinction between what is mental and what is cognitive, distinct from Baker's separation above, is of utmost importance and I hold the key to attempting this reformulation. It seems at first that the philosopher cannot both hold that cognition extends outwards of the organic body and assert that these inorganic external entities do not relate with the soul. Yet this separation between mental and cognitive would allow the hylomorphist to do both. Here we may again appeal to the physicalist literature for clarity. Clark formulates what he calls the hypotheses of organism-centered cognition, which states the, follows, the following. Human cognitive processing sometimes extends into the environment surrounding the organism, but the organism remains the core and currently the most active element of cognition. 
Cognition is organism-centered, even when it is not organism-bound. Transposing this hypothesis onto our present debate, we can say that wherever human cognition is present, the soul extends up to and only to the space that is animated by the same unitary life that animates the organic part of the mind. We can still call the cognitive processes that take place in the other inorganic entities as properly mine, precisely because of this hypothesis. It is my cognition because it is centered around my organic body, which in turn is animated by my soul. Yet we have not fully bridged the gap between living organic body and the external organic entities that participate in cognition. How can we speak of these different entities as truly being cognitive, while the soul remaining the locus of what is mental? The external Latin entities are truly cognitive only insofar as the organism around which cognition is centered is animated by a soul having the capacity for mind. This could be another contemporary, complementary interpretation of the controversial divide Aristotle makes between the passive and the active intellect in De Anima Book 3. While many interpretations exist on this particular issue within Aristotelian commentary, the fact remains that Aristotle articulates the soul's capacity of intellect or mind in two ways, only one of which seems to be able to exist outside of the body. The soul's capacity of having a part of the mind that must remain embodied, another and another that need not do so, might be conceived of as the Aristotelian equivalent of the hypothesis articulated above. Thus, Aristotle's active mind affords us the possibility to maintain, at the same time, the hylomorphic unity, while also reconciling the notion of distributed cognition as articulated in extended and inorganic. In the slight more work still needs to be done, my proposal is only that recent advances within neuroscience can be integrated within Aristotelian non-physicalist framework. This is not to say that they should be. Even in the cases of inorganic and extended, as articulated here, they were within the realm of science fiction a few de decades ago. At the same way, similarly, the future still holds possibility that we have yet to imagine or conceive of. The realities of neuroprosthesis and distributed cognition will seem insignificant when compared to greater transhumanist issues that are slowly coming to the fore. Issues, issues which will need, again, a greater examination and reflection. The role of the philosopher, as always, remains the same, from Aristotle up until today. We must continually strive, not necessarily to change our ontological definitions, but to clarify them in order to fit the phenomena we experience. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Jean, for this talk. Uh, welcome everyone who joined in the meantime. It's nice to have you here. Now uh, we will kick off with the questions and let me, let me organize these questions into three groups. Now we'll first have the questions from the participants online. Do we have any questions here? Anyone, uh, if you have any question to Jean, just feel free to come here and ask. Anyone, please don't be shy. There are not many people here in Krakow. Most people join online, but still. Uh, if there are no questions, please, uh, participants on WebEx, if you have any question, please unmute yourself, ask your question, and mute yourself again. All right? And please don't be shy. I see some of you wants to ask the questions, so go ahead. Wojciech, please. Yeah, um, I'm sorry I didn't uh, get uh, very clearly, but I would be very interested in the definition of the soul that, uh, that you refer to. How, how do you understand soul, uh, the soul in, this, uh, in the context of your presentation? Is 
Is this okay? Very good. Okay. <laughs> Apologies. Apologies for that. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, well, the primary aim of, of, of uh, my presentation was, first of all, to show that these theories in physicalist literature do affect and do influence um, dualism or holomorphic theories. Personally, um, I wanted to tend towards the Aristotelian view of soul. Um, now, I think, and maybe I alluded to, to it too briefly towards the end, but I think there is a way in which we could uh, insert a divide between uh, uh, what is, you know, participating in my cognition that is external to my body, while still ascertaining that the soul uh, is one entity with my body. And so, if, if I were to ask on a person level, I would tend towards an Aristotelian conception of soul. Um, however, at least what I, what I, uh, the greater aim of of my my paper, my presentation, is to show that um, at least I think different. Uh, positions can dialogue with this with this sort of let's call it a problem uh, or with this issue uh, within physical literature uh, and come with their own ideas. So, for example, I kind of dismiss Baker's view. Uh, now, Baker, in a in a way, doesn't doesn't conceive of soul. She 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 merely talks of mind. Uh, in fact, so she is what is called a Christian physicalist, which uh, I, I have a bit of um, questions about. That. But anyway. Um, so at least, at least the, the conception of soul is an Aristotelian view of soul, and not a Cartesian view of mind, which is sometimes interchangeably used with soul. Maybe that was a personal peeve, uh, that sort of this interrelationship, in, sorry, uh, coextension of the words mind and soul to refer to the same entity, which I think is slightly uh, misleading and can, can, can cause problems. Uh, I have another question. Here's Marcin Podbielski from Ignatianum. Uh, sorry for not showing up in a person in face. That's quite an early hour. Just a very short one. If you consider soul in terms of faculties, such a mind, but this is, but the faculty is mind rather than cognitive faculty. You move your idea of soul closer, actually, towards the Neoplatonic view of soul, which Aquinas did share and did know quite a lot about, basically through Augustine. And they have quite an interesting argument about soul as related to body, on the one hand, and soul as relating to itself, on the other. In Neoplatonism, so, in order to move entire body, in order to present in the matter, must be present identically and completely everywhere. All differences in soul are differences of faculties rather than differences of parts. And it was very consciously done. They did oppose Stoics, who saw soul as this octopus with eight legs and one central uh, ruling faculty. This was a very materialistic view of soul in which mind, as the ruling faculty, could be separated physically from other parts. Here, we have one faculty, which is a capacity of the soul, omnipresent with the soul. It can be logically distinguished from its other activities. But first, it's actually present everywhere. Second, this is the most important faculty in this kind of soul we are talking about. And actually, this is the organizing faculty. So if you accept this vision of the soul, can you really separate the soul as principle, including intellective principle, from mind, other as actuality, uh, first actuality, using Aristotelian terms, from second actuality? Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I'll try my best uh, to reply. Um, there is a temptation, there is a temptation uh, to divide the soul uh, in the sense of there is a temptation because uh, we look at our body, um, you know, and we can divide, we can mentally divide our body into parts. You know, I can imagine my body without my, my arm or without my legs or, or, you know, with just my head, for example. Um, there is a temptation to think of the soul as filling up the space of my body, 
um, uh, which is a temptation. And uh, in a way, I think with Swinburne, um, uh, goes into, I think, in more detail. Um, so, for example, Swinburne, which again is, is more dualist, um, uh, well, he says himself it's a Cartesian dualist position. Um, Swinburne speaks of the location of the soul and speaks at great length on the location of the soul. So he thinks that the soul is located in that part of the uh, brain where, you know, the physical brain, where uh, they causally affect one another. Um, now, if we were to stick to Aristotle, Aristotle uh, does not speak of a location of the soul. Um, so in a way, uh, uh, it's important that sort of, even in this, when the discussion is going on, we realize that there is this distinction. Um, so there is no location of the soul. So what are we to make of uh, the interaction when the soul, which has no location in this sense, uh, interacts with the body or with other parts? Now, now this is the problem, I think. So um, because I, uh, you mentioned, no, when the soul interacts with the soul itself or when the soul interacts with the body. Um, now, th this is maybe at least what I'm trying to present this is the third problem. Uh, when the soul interacts with um, parts external to the organic body, um, which participate in cognition. So I have this, you know, sort of what position are we going to say? Are we going to say, because these external entities, you know, my phone, which is over here, or I'm writing on a piece of paper, uh, distributed cognition wants to say that these parts are part of my mind. So it is maybe a, a, a relationship between three that we are trying to elucidate, uh, whatever our, our position is between um, these external objects, between the mind and the soul. Um, so I think the Aristotelian position is better um, because mind becomes a subordinate faculty of the soul. So if we were to, you know, put them on a, on a scale, what is more important is the soul for Aristotle. Um, the mind is one of the faculties. Um, and what I, what I briefly alluded to is, is this difference that Aristotle makes between the active and the passive intellect. Uh, it's a very controversial part where, wherein Aristotle seems to give the impression that the active intellect can exist separately um, of the soul. And I think if this is developed, there is a way maybe in which there can be some form of reconciliation by still accepting um, the fact that distributed cognition is a phenomenon that exists. Uh, if you want to do that, obviously you can, you can disagree with distributed cognition altogether. But at least what I'm trying to say is, listen, there is a way that these two phenomena can go together, can hold hands. And one is accepting distributed cognition, and the other is saying, listen, there is an Aristotelian soul which has one of these faculties, which is the active intellect, which can exist independently or outside of the soul-body relationship. Um, so I think that is where I was. I was. I wanted to 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 keep my sort of strict uh, discussion. But I don't know if, if that was a, a good enough reply to the question. Okay. I'm um, sorry for interrupt, Martin. I hope that this answer is sufficient. Um, there is basically a few questions more, uh, and I see the questions here on side, but we need to move on to the next, uh, to the next speech. So uh, thank you, Jean, for the discussion, and thanks for the questions. Um, according to this schedule, we're now going to have Jacek Sujan from Jesuit University Ignaciano in Krakow. Um, before we start, just a few technical words from for the people who join us. In the meantime, uh, welcome. Uh, two basic rules. Uh, the first is let, let the others see you, so turn your camera on uh, if, you, if, you, if you want to. And the second request is to mute yourself if you're not speaking anything and unmute yourself if you have any questions after the talk, okay? So now we, we're going to move to the next talk by Jacek Sujan, and Jacek will, will give a talk on faith and reason, reflection on, on anthems of Canterbury, Unum Argumentum. So let's have uh, some medieval philosophy right now. Um, we're going to display Jacek's lecture, and after the lecture, there will, there will be a time for the questions. Um, so please keep your questions in mind and ask them after the talk. Okay? Okay, so let's kick off with the lecture. 
I believe, I believe, writes Anselm, that I have shown by an argument which is not weak, that in my former book I proved the real existence of a being than which greater cannot be thought, and I believe that this argument cannot be invalidated by the validity of any objection. For so great force does the signification of this reasoning contain in itself that this being, which is the subject of discussion, is of necessity from the very fact that it is understood, proved also to exist in reality and to be whatever we should believe of the divine substance. This final fragment of Anselm's letter to Mung Dao Nilo is the quintessence of what in the history of philosophy is known as the ontological proof of God's existence. This proof is attributed to Anselm of Canterbury, Canterbury although he himself never used the name proof in relation to his argument. Anselm himself called it only one argument, unum argumentu, and not a proof. This is important because Anselm did not intend to prove the existence of God purely rationally, but his intention was to strengthen faith in God by means of a purely rational argument. The monk Gaunido was the first who objected to Anselm's argument, however, he did not question the primacy of faith, but he had doubts about the rational correctness of argument. So, there should be clear that intention of Anselm thinking on God's existence has no connection, for example, with the speculations and objections against ontological proof, which were formulated for Immanuel, by Immanuel Kant, who postulated suspending of reason to do place for faith, what implying that God of faith does not coincide with the God of reason. But in this point of view, there is impossible to understand essence of Anselm's intuition of divine essence and understand the relation between faith and reason. In my presentation, I would like to show what is the essence of Anselm's argument. For this purpose, I divided my presentation into several parts. I begin by presenting Anselm's reasoning in four steps. Then I will present Gaunilo's objections to this reasoning then, Anselm's reply. Finally, a short summary in the form of some conclusions. First step, primary point, priority of faith. Anselm says that he believes in order to understand, and he understands on, only in order to believe. So for him, first of all, there is necessary to have believing because only believer is able to understand. Anselm asks God to enlighten his mind and give him an understanding of divine essence. For Anselm, man has no proper image of God's being, because as a result of sin, man lost the ability to clearly understand God's being. So, in consequence, the human role is only passive. Man can be returned himself to God in prayer with request, and he must weigh, wait on God's grace. Anselm, Anselm believes that God grants man grace to know his nature in some content. This grace is manifested in the possibility of a comprehensive argument for the, for the existence of God. The main problem comes down to the question when a man is convinced that God positively has responded to the Anselm's request. Probably, the answer of this question lies in Anselm's conviction that only the possibility of to be sure of God's grace in this case is to find the absolute limit of human understanding as such, that is, to prove the final impassable limits of reasoning, because only then we can indicate the area of it what can be known. So we could to say that Anselm wants to find the answer for the question what is the limit of thinking and knowing as the boundary between faith and reason? Now, in short, about the Anselm's postulate about faith looking for understanding. Fides querens intellect. Defining the boundaries of the rational knowledge indicates a demarcation line between the areas of faith and reason. Anselm's idea is to indicate precisely what can be known 
in one side and what falls exclusively with the realm of faith in the other side and only in faith on faith should be accepted. Anselm is sure that the very concept of God analyzed only by reason is incomprehensible and using this concept it is impossible to demonstrate his existence. Even more, regarding to the concept of God, we can think of the, his non-existence as a fool when he thinks that God does not exist. Therefore, Anselm must find for the mind, for the reason, another content ascribed to God which could serve complexion of evidence. Anselm, such content is realized by the thesis that God is something than which nothing greater can be thought. Anselm uses his drawn from the faith, but already the result of a thinking of the content of faith, a thesis that is fundamental to all his argumentation. Second step, in which we have two kinds of conditions. First conditions, Anselm says that he will create his evidence without appealing to the authority of the Bible. All arguments in his evidence will be based only on understanding and thinking. For Anselm, the only criterion in proving is a logical necessity. Nothing other than logical argumentation is taken into account. The second conditions. Man can think everything what he can think. Understanding has a primacy before thinking. There are two modes of existence. First existence in the mind and the second in reality, it means outside of mind. Existence in reality is in fact something greater than existence only in, in, in intellect. The common procedure refers to the demonstrating the existence in reality, starting from the existence in intellect, and therefore the way of evidence is from the intellect to reality. Third step, schema of the Anselm's argument. The first stage is following. Knowing is not necessary for existence of something in our intellect, because there can be something in intellect about what we do not know yet what it is. Anselm thinks that a fool who thought that God doesn't exist has in his intellect the concept of something than which greater cannot be thought, because he heard that it, that it is said to him and he understood it. The second stage. Something different is existence in intellect and existence outside of the intellect. Existence outside of the intellect is greater than existence only in the intellect. However, the basis condition of existence, both mental or real, is logical non-contradiction. And if both kind of existence exist, they must not be contradictory. So, if a fool can thought something, it must exist in his intellect. The third stage. The transition from existence in intellect to existence in reality is following. If in the intellect can only be something that is non-contradict, everything which exists in intellect not contradict. However, if we look at the thesis, something than which greater cannot be thought, it is not contradict because the relations of concepts used in this thesis are not contradict. In the inner relation between subject and predicate, we should see correct relation. But Anselm argues that correct relation is only possible if something than which greater cannot be thought exists not only in intellect but also in reality, because if not, in consequence, something than which greater cannot be thought should not be this something, because we can think about something greater uh, of it, about a real existence. As a result, in our intellect would exist something self-contradictory, because this something which uh, could be thought as the greatest would not be the greatest if one could think of something greater in real existence. However, it is impossible, because everything which exists in intellect has internally consistent, it means 
it means is non-contradict. Therefore, Anselm, on the basis of the logical law of contradiction, shows the necessity of recognizing the existence of something not only in intellect but also in reality. Fourth step, return of faith. After demonstrating the, ne the necessary existence both in intellect in the reality of something than which nothing greater can be thought, Anselm tries to answer on the question, what is this something? And that he returns to faith, and for him this something is God. And this something is representation for us of divine beings, so much of a reality that even it cannot be thought of as non-existence. This moment seems to be fundamental because Anselm identifies this something with God on the basis of faith, not logical reasoning. Here then we can see that Anselm's argument is not evidence of the existence of God, but is evidence of the existence of something than which nothing greater can be thought, which Christians should believe by the act of faith to be God. The essence of Anselm's argument lies in the fact that he shows how to use reason which serves faith, and only through faith reason can reach the limit of its thought, because that limit is God. Faith then precedes all reasoning, and without faith reason cannot answer the question of what is this than which nothing greater can be thought. At the same time, man discovers that without God's grace and without God's illumination of human intellect, he is not able to know anything and think of anything as the greatest. Faith gives us the possibility of understanding. Now short about Gaunilo's objection. First objection. Gaunilo says that our understanding of something does not cause its existence in the intellect, and if so, it collapses the basis of Anselm's argument. According to him, in intellect, there could also be false contents which we could understand and which wouldn't have real existence. Gaunilo says Man has knowledge on existence only under rem. It means the words and the contents have logical and ontological sense only if we know what they are in reality. According to Gamilo, Anselm goes from the thinking something to the real existence of something. What is mistake? Because, for example, it, what is false, is also thought because it is non-contradictory. The only condition for existence in intellect, then, is to know it, not just think about it. Second objection of Gaunilo. Objection of Gaunilo. According to Gaunilo, in Anselm's argument, we can find an error of the necessary trans transition from, uh, from uh, intellect to reality. Gaunilo criticized Anselm's unfounded statement on the basis of the existence of something in the greatest in the intellect. This one should be exist in reality. This transition is at the best only possible, but in the case of Anselm's argument, this transition must be necessary, what seems to be absurd. Now, uh, Anselm's reply. Anselm emphasized that his reasoning may refer to only one case, that is to something than which nothing greater can be thought. He also points out that there is a fundamental difference between this content and Gaunilo's concept of something the greatest which we can thought. Anselm's concept is based not on the analyzing on in, uh, of individual things which exist in reality, and could be known through the senses, because in this way we have no possibility to think about one thing which is the greatest. Here is the first error of Gaunilo. Anselm claims that man does not understand the concept of God, which we can find in the mind of a fool, can be born the thought of God's non-existence. However, the thesis, something than which nothing greater can be thought, is understandable, even to full, and this understanding is not the result of some kind of sensual experience. Anselm also indicates the difference between understanding, in Latin intelligere, and the cognition, in Latin cogitare, of something that man can't think. 
Understanding of some, something based only on the law of contradiction. And Gaunino's objection about the false thing, which can exist in intellect, is incorrect. Because there is the fundamental difference between logical contradictionary and the conception of truth. The last is analyzing relation between something which exists in intellect and something, something in reality. But the principle of both is the law of contradiction, which is primary. The point of Anzan's beginning is a a priori concept, which we have in our intellect as the gift of God. But Gaunilo wants to begin from the sensual experience of real things and their generalization in the contents of our intellect. Uh, it means a posteriori. According to Anzan, Gaunilo's way is incorrect in the aspect of realization of the postulate of faith looking for understanding. And now, finally, some conclusions. It is very interesting that in discussion between Anzal and Gaunino, the last one has no objection to the primacy of faith over understanding. Gaunino accepts Anzal's argument that we believe God is the greatest thing which can be thought. He is sure, however, that Anzal has illegally thought as necessary, move from the intellect to reality, which for Gaunilo seems only possible and for Anselm's, of course, necessity. Thus, in Gaunilo's opinion, Anselm's argument is not well grounded, but he doesn't question the act of faith and its primacy. It is worth remembering that in the history of the problem of God's existence, Anselm has been attacked very often for trying to incorrectly prove that God is the greatest thing for our intellect, which for Anselm is only the object of faith. In this sense, Anselm shows proof of the existence of something than which nothing greater can be thought, and not of God. Anselm tries to strengthen to strength Yeah. Thank you very much, Jacek. And now we will start with the questions. For those who come, I remind you to unmute yourself before you ask a question and then mute yourself again after, uh, after uh, asking. And the same to you, Jacek, who will answer the questions. Um, first, we will start with the questions on site. Do you have any questions? People who are here in Krakow, not many of them. Uh, if you have any questions to the Unum Argumentum and St. Anzo, I see no one. No? Okay. Um, so, um, dear participants on WebEx, do you have any questions to Jacek? Please, it's time to, you can uh, show yourself. Please don't be shy and uh, unmute yourself, ask the question and mute yourself again. Thanks. Go on. The floor is yours. Wojciech, I see raising hand. Uh, thank you very much for the really wonderful presentation. Uh, uh, it was very, very interesting. Uh, I have a simple question um, just to clarify things. The argument, the argumentation that was given by uh, Anselm is for believers. Uh, so there is the predominance of faith that create some kind of context in which uh, this argument really makes sense. So what do you think? How, um, how the faith is understood? What is really the faith in, the, uh, in the Anselm's understanding? Where does it come from? Or you know, more precisely, who is the believer that he has in mind somehow when he is creating and uh, developing this argumentation? This is my question. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Yeah, of course, uh, we must think about the uh, medieval area, medieval times, yes, and the specific aspect of understanding of uh, reality and understanding of relation between man and uh, transcendent being, it means God. And in this perspective, Anselm try not to prove that God exists, but uh, only take some uh, some strange argument uh, on his uh, existence. Yeah, and believe in my, in my opinion is a 
consequence something what is the point of start of uh, Anselm's argumentation. It means the the the, the gift of God. Yeah, there is the, there is something what we could find in uh, uh, Platonic's uh, uh, conception of illumination. Yeah, Platonic's are the ground for this conception, and Anselm uh, Anselm uh, think that we have the natural uh, gift of God for uh, understanding of his existence and his uh, essence, but there is not, of course, the full knowledge about the God uh, uh, existence and divinity essence. Yeah, and we must take some uh, boundary for our understanding, our knowing of reality. And if we take to this boundary, to this, to this, uh, to this, to this uh, uh, order, we could find the aspect of transcendental uh, reality of God. There is something like an intuition. And in my presentation, of course, there was the briefly uh, on, uh, introduction to, to, to the argumentation of Anselm's. But uh, I think that the, the main problem and the main um, aspect of uh, Anselm's argumentation is uh, is to find in our mind and in our intellect something what is the full boundary of um, uh, everything what we can know, we can think, and we can understand. And of course, there is the law of contradiction. Yeah, and in this in this point of view, the law of contradiction is something what can like uh, in metaphoric aspect like a bridge to understanding to our intellect to reality of God because God is some what we can think uh, in, in the in the boundary in the in the in the uh, structure of uh, law of contradiction, uh, but we can know on him only uh, something what we uh, could find in 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 his uh, in, in in his reality and there is the effect of the gift of god uh, if you look at the proslogion and the text where we could find the 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 answer argument the answer start with a prayer to god god give me if you uh, if you want yes that I could understand that you exist and you 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 have some some specific nature, uh, and the, the the effect of Anselm's uh, Anselm's understanding and Anselm's process of uh, argumentation for on God existence, uh, divine existence, is. Uh, is the the the, the uh, is is uh, is the uh, clearing that I have this gift from God, yeah, and every one of us could uh, could uh, do it as the individual, personal, and inner uh, inner experience. And there is in my mind uh, there is the aspect of modern and contemporary uh, uh, contemporary. Uh, uh, validity of Anselm's argumentation, yeah, because we could find on uh, 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 this in the perspective of historic perspective, yes, but we could find in this the very important aspect for our, for us as a as a uh, experience of faith. If I believe in God, I could find his uh, uh, his nature, of course, in. Uh, in 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 the in the area of uh, law of contradiction, yeah? and I think that the there is the result of uh, of uh, divine gift, gift divine gift for us. But the, of course, the the, the reason of grace, as a, uh, with a, with a point of view. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I can say something more, uh, the, 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 the answer's argument is very important and very, very interesting because in the history of philosophy, we could find that the, the main problem of uh, argumentation and argument interpretation, answer interpretation for the few of uh, or many of uh, philosophers was not the problem of relation between faith and reason, but the problem of logical structure of his argumentation. And in this point of view, if you look at, for example, in the Descartes' uh, argumentation, René Descartes' argumentation, we could find a mistake in his argumentation if we 
uh, we could find in, in his uh, argumentation the, 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 the essence of Anselm's uh, point of view. Yeah, because for René Descartes, the, the point of start is uh, reason, for, for reason, is, uh, is the thesis that God is the greatest thing uh, uh, which uh, which we could uh, we could thought we can we can thought, but there is not the uh, answer argumentation because in the answer argument we could find some another point of view. We believe that God is something uh, than which uh, nothing can be thought, and the start uh, from faith yes the, uh, is, is is a ground for. For uh, for seeking uh, the, the 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 logical aspect and logical scheme of argumentation. Uh, for, okay. <laughs> Thank you for answering this. Can I have? Can I ask uh, more, more question? Because we we have some question from the stream, and this is the very long question. It has basically it has a few questions, but it can be reduced to two basic questions. The first question is, what's the what's the purpose of building the proof, which is not a, a, a deductive proof? It's not a deductive argument. So if this is argument for the Christians or for the thieves, for the believers, what's, what's, the, what's the purpose of creating it? If, if someone is con already convinced to believe in God, why does he need or she argument for it? if he or she already assumes the existence of God. And the other questions can be reduced to, to this is the, the argument against philosophers, that philosophers basically imagine something, what is necessary, and then philosophers claim that this is necessary. So these are two questions, or maybe one question and one criticism. Jacek, would you, would you like to respond to this according to Anselm? Uh, yes, I try. The first question is very short. Yeah, answer is very short. Uh, bec um, because I, as believer, I believe that God gave me intellect, yes, and faith, and to, and to, uh, these two kinds of uh, uh, the two kinds of uh, 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 experience, and between intellect reason and uh, and belief of faith there is no uh, opposition there is no contradiction but if you look at the uh, text of proslogion in the chapter one uh, chapter two sorry you find the very uh, specific aspect of Anselm's, uh, Anselm's uh, uh, intuition because Anselm's uh, say that uh, every one of us if uh, if uh, take only uh, in intellectual point of view, could uh, think that God doesn't exist. And Anselm tried to answer to the question why. Why it is possible, yes? Because intellect, uh, without the serving of, of faith, um, is, is, able to, is able to think that uh, it is impossible uh, to get access because we can we cannot uh, uh, understand what is the nature or essence of god at full yeah and we must take we must wait for the uh, for the for the for the gift of god uh, uh, to clear our, our uh, to clear is is uh, is nature or is essence and in the, only in this perspective we uh, find the answer to the question why someone uh, could uh, think that God doesn't exist. Yeah. The, the uh, sum up, uh, 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 the, the response to the first question is in short. There is the specific relation between intellect, reason in one side, uh, or mind in one side, and uh, the, 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 the experience of faith. Yeah, the second question is very complicated, of course, because I look at the uh, Anselm's uh, argumentation and uh, Anselm's proof or argument in the perspective of philosopher, perspective of philosophy. But I think that uh, every one of us could find in the Anselm argument something what is uh, uh, what is uh, validity of, of of it for everyone. Yeah, because Anselm tried to clarify in the logical perspective 
that we could uh, we could think about something what is uh, outside of our reality. Of course, uh, there is uh, very important is the point of start because if I uh, I think that everything what I know is only the something what is uh, in in sensual perspective. Yes, uh, some uh, some things what could I uh, understand or no no only in the perspective of sensual experience uh, there is there is the there is the the, 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 the specific uh, the specific aspect but we can we, 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 but we if we uh, think about uh, about the reality at all we could find the answer or the the, the problem of the question what is at the beginning, what what uh, what is in in, in um, perspective of universal point of view, and God, of course, in the perspective of Christianity, is a specific uh, thing about the God, specific understanding of God. But I think that there is the very very uh, validity for uh, everything uh, uh, that the one God is something what could find uh, the, the answer to the question what is the beginning and what is the ground or principle of all the reality. In short, of course, uh, the, the, there is the very complicated question because there is the point of view and, and uh, opinion about the philosophy at all. Yeah? Uh, if, if it's negative opinion, yeah, we have some uh, perspective and some consequences of it. Okay, um, thank you for this answer. Um, we need to move on. Wojciech Szczerba sent another question. I posted on the on the chat. I, j I will just read it, but um, we have no time to for you to answer it. Uh, but maybe you find it beneficial. The the question is: um, Is unbelief possible at all if faith is understood as a gift of God, a priori inner experience, something in innate in human? So. Simply the, the question, but we need to move on to, to another talk. Thank you, Jacek. Thank you, everyone, for the questions. And our next speaker is um, Anna Vargayani from Pajmani Petr Catholic University, Budapest. I'm sorry if I spelled something wrong. Um, <laughs> this is very difficult language, even, even harder than, than Polish. <laughs> So um, we'll hit uh, with the with Anna's talk. Um, let me try the video. I yesterday when we tested, I found it very quiet. So um, let me try if if you can hear it. If not, we'll find another solution. Um, so simply, I will I will display the lecture for a while, and you can talk if you can hear it. Okay. Welcome everybody at the, welcome everybody at the uh, conference to uh, Christian philosophy. First of all, I would like to express my gratitude. Welcome everybody at the uh, conference to uh, Christian philosophy. Jakob, uh, I think you are on mute at the moment. We cannot hear you. Sorry. Thank you, Jean. Um, can you hear Anna? Can you hear what Anna said? Okay, I have the information that on YouTube stream is okay, on Facebook stream it is okay, uh, on WebEx, how do you find it? It's very good, I can hear clearly. Okay, thank you. Sorry, Anna, um, I'll, I'll put it again. And uh, so this is Anna Vargayani from Pajmani University in Budapest, and Anna will give a talk on um, Husserlian transcendental idealism and the question concerning being and original linkage between phenomenology and theology. 
So I guess we are all fascinated to hear the link about the link between phenomenology and theology. Uh, so now we will display the Anna's lecture and then please keep the questions for the time after the after the talk. Welcome everybody at the uh, conference to uh, Christian philosophy. First of all, I would like to express my gratitude to the organizers that uh, they made it possible to hold our lectures online. However, I think it's a very difficult task to hold a lecture uh, without any direct uh, connection with each other. Um, anyway, the title of uh, my paper sounds From the Husserlian Transcendental Idealism to the Question of Being an Original Linkage between phenomenology and theology in Edith Stein's thinking. In my paper, I will highlight the transition of Edith Stein's thinking from the Husserlian transcendental idealism to the phenomenological question on creation by virtue of the problem of being for the phenomenological thinking. Even though the question on being occupied a central position in the early phenomenological thinking, for Edith Stein it became the key factor in elaborating of the Christian philosophy into the context of the 20th century philosophical thinking. Edith Stein wrote in 1932 in a short paper on knowledge, truth, being, that being cannot be defined because, I quote, uh, it is required by every definition because it is contained in every word and in every sense of word. It is recorded with everything that is recorded and is preserved in the recording itself. Man can only state differences of being and of beings, end of quote. This paper is a clear evidence of Stein's gradual turn from the phenomenological position to the scholastic philosophy and that this application has also uh, required a methodological change in her thinking. The scholastic influence in Edith Stein's thinking reflects on an older expectation of the scholastic view of being since it would be considered failure for the phenomenological method not to deal with the question of being, but rather exposing the description of the individual things. The totality of this influence is shaped her phenomenological concept in the direction of the possibility of a Christian philosophy. The first step within the graduate project, which was uh, finally completed in the Opus Finite and Eternal Being, and in the mystical writings, was the transition, translation of Thomas Aquinas' Questiones Disput uh, Disputate de Veritate. Her introductory first sentence on the translation de Veritate shows that from the outset she has been thinking of the dimension of Philosophia Perennis and that the translation was inspired in methodological sense by the common problem areas of phenomenology and domestic philosophy. The starting point in the methodological question seems her to be the question of truth, which even in different ways occupies the central position in both directions of thought. The main question of Edelstein is whether we can talk about the same truth here and there, and whether the truth would be phenomenologically understandable from the perspective of the transcendentals in the scholastic philosophy. The second part of the introduction to the Veritate focuses on the mode of cognition that leads to the knowledge of truth in both phenomenology and in Thomas' thinking, and proves that phenomenological knowledge consists in the adequatio rei et intellectus, while the, for Thomas the truth is the one by which knowledge is measured. I quote, There are many truths, but the truth by which everything is measured, and that is the agreement with the divine spirit, is only one. And since the divine spirit gives us knowledge of the first principles, this first truth is uh, what we judge everything about. The truth understood as the agreement of the human mind with things, the veritas creata, in contrast uh, with the veritas eterna, 
seems as there were many mirror images and therefore many truces. Basically, however, every truth is only true insofar as it corresponds to the one standard that is by agreement with the divine spirit. End of quote. Edelstein found a common point between scholastic thought and phenomenology in the act of knowledge. Edelstein characterizes knowledge in the modern philosophy as, as the view of the essence, as such questions that are central for the modern epistemologist, such as the phenomenological question, what is knowledge according to its nature? Then Stein's view is the knowledge in connection with the epistemology of Thomas. When Thomas wrote in the first question about the differentiation within the real world, then Stein sees it as a differentiation of knowledge. I quote, This differentiation within the real world corresponds to a differentiation of knowledge. There is no general definition of knowledge at all possible. All knowledge is either divine or creature, and none of them can be classified under the same terms. End of quote. According to Stein, the differentiation of knowledge doesn't reveal an epistemological view of the world, but this primacy of knowledge meant the ontological foundation of understanding. If the object of knowledge in both the phenomenological and the scholastical senses is, is being, then there is another commonality in ontological terms, namely the criterion of truth in the knowledge in both cases. I quote, Truth, das Ware, is being in terms of knowledge. The truth, die Wahrheit, is the correspondence of knowledge and being. Knowledge has its measure of things, but of the divine spirit. There are many truths, but the truth by which everything is measured and what is the agreement with the divine spirit is only one. And since the divine spirit gives us knowledge of the first principles, this first truth is what we judge everything about. End of quote. In the scholastic sense, the knowledge of the truth of being creates the connection with the divine truth. In the main work, a Finite and Eternal Being, this theory of truth establishes the possibility for the common essence of Christian philosophy in the modern sense. This analysis uh, of truth consists in finite and eternal being through the analysis of truth in its temporal definiteness. At the beginning, Edelstein deals with the being as such through the problem of the finite and eternal being, but the aim of the work extends to the question of the possibility of Christian philosophy, which Stein wants to realize as the philosophy apparentness of philosophizing. In the center of the investigation is one's own being in its actuality and potentiality, which is phenomenologically determined in temporality. The individual being of the experiencing subject is in relation to the object of experience and eternal, unchangeable being, which time calls puri, and which participates in the act of creation. On the other hand, the puri, in relation to the eternal being of God, as a finite and limited being that plays a time-determined role in the history of creation. In this sense, Edelstein refers to Hedwig Corrad Martius' work, Die Zeit, and describes the temporal definiteness of experience from the timeless existence of the ego. I quote, This means that the being of which I am conscious as mine is inseparable from temporality. As actual being, that is, as actually present being, it is without a temporal dimension, punctual. It is now in between a no more and a not yet, but by its breaking apart and its flux into being and not being, the idea of pure being is revealed to us. In pure being, there is no longer any admixture of not being, nor any no longer and not yet. 
In short, pure being is not temporal, but eternal. End of quote. Uh, the fifth part of the work, finite and eternal being, gets its special importance by Edelstein's distinction between the ways of the phenomenological and theological knowledge according to their different criteria, criteria of truth, respectively, that she synthesizes them in the definiteness of the transcendentals. According to Stein's explanation, the question of being and its different forms and genres in beings led us to the meaning of being. After explaining the relationship of finite and eternal beings through the temporal opening of reality, which bears the essential features of truth, Stein proves how the image of the Trinity in creation sheds light on the connection between person and hypostasis, which can be enlightened through the analysis of the history of philosophy. Analogously, in, uh, in that the person recognizes himself as a person and develops his per uh, personality in time, the incarnated son is developed as the second divine person of the divine hypostasis in the history of creation. I quote, these concepts were essential not only for an understanding of the three personality of God, but also for an understanding of the being of people and generally of thing actuality. End of quote. In this sense, the philosophical understanding of creation is at the same time the gradual understanding of the history of salvation in its factual existence of the world experience. According to the final paragraph of the last chapter in the book Finite and Eternal Being, the connection between the final human being and eternal being is constituted by the embodiment of the Son in Logos as the Logos. The whole mystery of Jesus' historical being forms in the original meaning of Genesis that human being as finite being, being obtains its sense through the participation in eternal creation. The closing words of Edith Stein to the work A Finite and Eternal Being sounds, I quote, For humankind is the portal through which the word of God entered into the created world. Human nature has received the word, and the word is linked in a special way with human beings, by virtue of the unity of common descent, not with subhuman nature and not with angels. As the head of humankind, which combines in itself the higher and the lower reaches of being, Christ is the head of creation in its totality. End of quote. And now I sum up. The previous analysis resulted in the finding that the existential question of Edelstein's religiosity led through phenomenology to the later question of being, which in its final form illuminates the theological questions with natural phenomenology from the perspective of the Christian thinker. The passage to Christian philosophy in the sense of the philosophy of Perennis is reflected in Stein's short essays of the 1930s, where phenomenology is no longer understood as a pure methodological problem, but rather it manifests in the question of whether Christianity is in dialogue with philosophical thinking. In the main work, A Finite and Internal Being, Einstein completely overcame the previous methodological question by virtue of including the facts of revelation in the phenomenological world experience. From the aspect of the Christian thinker, the question of being was illuminated phenomenologically for the natural thinking. However, the Christian philosophy allows us to grasp it, its methodological core through the theological tradition in the act of faith. In this sense, Stein's thesis is that the methodology of Christian philosophy is based on the tradition of Christianity the source of which is the twofold practice of knowledge and faith. Thank you for your attention. And that was Anna. Thank you, Anna. And now we can uh, move to the questions. 
Do we have any questions here on site from people in Krakow? Anyone? Now is the time for the questions. Is, any, is everything clear on the relation between phenomenology and theology and how one can contribute to the latter? I think they understood everything. <laughs> but you have a question. Okay. Um, so please come here and sit. Hello to everybody. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, concerning the relationship between uh, phenomenology and theology, uh, do you mean the current uh, uh, direction in philosophy, which, uh, which is called, uh, did you hear about uh, some uh, movement in philosophy, which is called ontotheology? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, of course. And, uh, <laughs> Well, I, I will continue <laughs> later. So, uh, did you hear about this uh, movement in contemporary philosophy? Uh, do, uh, did you mean this movement? Or you were speaking um, especially about Serbian approach? Uh, Did you mean specifically this movement in philosophy, in contemporary philosophy, which is called ontotheology? Uh, do you mean uh, uh, this was the question? Uh, uh, is your question? I, I wanted to know, uh, in your title, mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in as a subject of your presentation, you announced uh, as, as a part of your topic uh, the really an orig original um, relation uh, between phenomenology and uh, theology. Uh, so, and th this can, can be uh, put, uh, uh, this can be um, uh, considered, your approach, your, what you were talking about could be considered within a movement in contemporary philosophy, which is called ontotheology. Uh, or, yes, or not, or, or you, you didn't mean the, this? Yeah, uh, yeah. Yes, but uh, in my lecture I, uh, I was talking about, especially about Einstein. Uh, ah, but right. I think uh, okay. um, uh, this, what what Einstein um, wrote and, and her, her direction into the Christian philosophy is the first step into the ontotheology. <laughs> Because uh, in this uh, early Husserlian circle, in this early Göttingen circle around Husserl, uh, was uh, raised uh, at the first time the question about being, what, what we can, how we experience being, how we can uh, phenomenologically uh, talk about being. And this uh, was the first uh, point or the first step where Edithstein raised the question whether we can talk about uh, finite being and eternal being, so we can uh, distinguish these two from each other phenomenologically. And um, yes, on to theology. So, um, when we talk about ontotheology, we especially think on uh, Martin Heidegger, who established uh, this uh, uh, phenomenological stream. And uh, Martin Heidegger was also a student from Edmund Husserl and was influenced for, uh, by the Husserlian phenomenology. And, um, and um, and was in uh, relationship with uh, with this uh, Göttingen circle, especially also with Christine, with uh, with, uh, with Roman Garden, and and so on. And uh, and I think uh, this Heideggerian question on being and on ontolo uh, phenomenological ontology 
originates also from the Husserlian phenomenology. And uh, then when we see uh, this uh, temporal uh, uh, philosophical uh, uh, stream, this temporal uh, phenomenological or onto theological stream, especially at Jean Luc Marion, uh, we also find uh, uh, a special influence by Martin Heidegger and um, by the Australian community as well, and uh, Spore Ricker. So I think uh, to answer uh, on your question, I think there is a direct connection with this early phenomenological circle and with this uh, present phenomenological movement. Yes. Uh, because uh, listening to your presentation, uh, I thought that uh, what you were talking about is a beginning of this link between phenomenology and uh, theology uh, in Hus Hus Husserl uh, may be interesting uh, in the context of this new movement uh, in contemporary philosophy, and, uh, which is called onto theology, and uh, especially it, it would be interesting to see how com contemporary philosophers um, it is a mutual, this reciprocal uh, interaction between theology um, concerning the questions um, usually uh, treated uh, within phenomenolog phenomenological uh, philosophy, and reciprocally, uh, it would be interesting to, to see how uh, philosophers um, say uh, tries try to approach uh, questions which uh, were relevant. Uh, uh, traditionally in theology. Mm -hmm. So, and what you were talking about, it is the beginning of, of the, this yes. movement. Yes, so, yes, of course. Um, so, at, uh, at Jan of Marian, I didn't find any direct connection with, with Edith Stein or with uh, Roman Garden or uh, with Edith or Marcius uh, either, but um, that the topics of, of his uh, philosophical um, approaches are very similar to, to this uh, Husserlian, Husserlian circus uh, topics, to, especially to Edith Stein. So, so, so uh, for example, Jean-Luc Marian also um, um, find, uh, look, looks for connections with the, with the scholastic philosophy and, and uh, take, uh, takes examples from the scholastic philosophy and the uh, question on being and, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the question. Um, I think we can move to the questions from the participants on WebEx. So uh, does, is anyone concerned with the this phenomenological and theological combination? Um, just please unmute yourself, ask the question and mute yourself again, please. Okay, uh, I can see one question on the stream. Uh, if anyone, if no one has a question here, I will ask the question, I will read the question, and Anna, please answer to this. And the question is whether this idea of phenomenological contribution to theology applies only to the Husserian phenomenology or also to the contemporary phenomenologists. Um, I think you, you mentioned this in the discussion uh, with um, Evelina, but please, please, would you please respond to this? Mention some other con uh, contemporary philosophers, phenomenologists. Thanks. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, as I, as I ans answered previously, so I can um, mention in Jean-Luc Marion, of course, but this um, uh, this stream or this uh, this uh, yes this 
stream originates, I think, from um, from the philosophy of Paul Ricoeur, who who also uh, connected to the Husserlian phenomenology and and step by step moved to the uh, to the theological uh, um, hermeneutic and and uh, try to explain the the history of theolo theology and or especially only uh, just the the history uh, phenomenologically and so there is a i think there is a, a direct connection between these early phenomenological movements and and uh, the present um, and i can also mention emmanuel Falk, who is also very keen on this uh, topic to to explain the uh, the history of theology or theological um, uh, events, uh, phenomenologically. Mm -hmm. But of course, uh, there are very different topics uh, also in this uh, philosophical area. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you for answering this. I hope it satisfies. Unfortunately, if someone writes a comment, there is no discussion, uh, or maybe someone will ask the question again, but um, there is no discussion with comments. But I, I hope it, it is, is a sufficient answer. Okay, thank you very much, Anna. Um, now we can move to the next talk. I can see... Uh, when I when I look on the schedule, I can see the diversity of the approaches and fields in philosophy. We had Jean talking on some classical contribution to the contemporary philosophical problems. We had Jacek on medieval philosophy. We had Anna on phenomenology, contemporary and uh, 20th century. And now we're going to have a talk by Jakub Prusch on argumentation theory, and then we'll have Kingsley on, on the concept of Christian philosophy. So, so, so you can see, that, see the diversity of what could be a Christian philosophy. So um, now our next talker is, is basically myself. I also recorded myself to show how it could be done for some of you. So I will now display the, the talk and then you can you can ask the question if someone is interested in argumentation theory. Um, and just one thing more for those who who joined, welcome to the conference. Please unmute yourself during the talk. Keep the question in your mind and ask the question after the talk. Uh, and then unmute yourself. Uh, and then mute yourself. Thanks. Hello, my name is Jan. Hello, my name is Jakub Prusch from Jesuit University Ignatianum in Krakow. I'm going to talk on a very specific concept from argumentation theory, that is the principle of charity. And I will show that this principle can be extended by so-called presupponendum, written by St. Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of Jesuits. This might be a Christian contribution to the contemporary argumentation theory, or pragma dialectics. First, I will present the principle of charity in details, and then I will analyze the concept of presupponendum to finally compare these two concepts and to show the relation between them. The meaning of these results might be of great significance for argumentation theory and practice in public debates, especially for Christian philosophers practicing debates. Okay, what's the principle of charity? In short terms, it's a philosophical or communicational principle that requests to, when interpreting someone's statement, to assume the best possible interpretation. Now, let's consider the following example taken from Neil Wilson's article. Suppose that somebody, let's say Charles, makes the following five statements on Caesar. That he conquered Gaul, crossed Rubicon, was murdered on the 8th of March, was addicted to the use of the ablative absolute, and was married to Baudica. The problem is now to determine the significance of the name Caesar in Charles' use. Charles may have used the word Caesar meaning Prasutagus, Baudica's husband. On this supposition, the last statement would be true, 
and the rest would be false. Or we might consider Caesar signifying Julius Caesar, which makes the first four statements true and the last one false. Simply saying, when interpreting, we choose the best possible interpretation that makes the largest statements of the opponent true. That is to say, Julius Caesar. Now, let me give you a brief history of developing the principle of charity. The first mention of it might be found in Jewish writing from the early 3rd century before Christ. This suggests that if any person makes a statement, then it is reasonable to assume that there is a rational reason for the person saying this. Therefore, it is rational to take into account that despite of the fact that something seems to be a pure nonsense, there is a rationale which justifies it. For example, if my wife says that she's good and she's bad at the same time, it's rational to assume that her feelings are mixed, then treat her statement as meaningless. Similar threats can be found in contemporary theories of communication. For example, the Donald Davidson in Radical Interpretation presents a principle of rational accommodation, or accordingly, Davidson develops two similar concepts, principle of coherence, which prompts the interpreter to discover a degree of logical consistency in the thoughts of the speaker, and the principle of correspondence, which prompts the interpreter to take the speaker to be responding to the same features of the world that the interpreter would be responding to under similar circumstances. Similarly, Paul Grease, well known for his contribution to communication theory, develops the cooperative principle. It includes maxims of conversation, which suggest that in most cases, when people make a statement, they are trying to be as relevant, truthful, informative, and clear as possible, if they want to be properly understood. It's also a common thread for the principle of charity. The principle was also discussed by various philosophers, Simon Blackburn, Willard Quine, Daniel Dennett. The last one advises even not to choose the best possible interpretation of the given statement, but to improve the statement on your own and to criticize the strongest version of the argument that you can build. By doing this, you are essentially creating a Steelman argument, which is an improved version of your opponent's argument. This is the opposite of the Strawman argument fallacy, which involves distorting your opponent's view in order to make it easy to attack. It's worth to know that the principle of charity, that is, assuming the intelligence or rationality of your opponent, can be also strengthened by assuming the goodwill of the opponent. This is called Hanlon's razor. It's attributed to Robert J. Hanlon and suggests that one should not attribute malice to action of the, or the words of the person when it can be explained by other causes, like, for example, misunderstanding of the topic. Hanlon's razor can be treated as a supplement to the principle of charity, so it consists of assuming intelligence and goodwill of the interlocutor. Now, it is clear that the principle of charity is an old and good custom of a culture of disputation, and that it may include various components, choosing the best interpretation, improving the opponent's argument on your own, or assuming not only intelligence, but also a good will of the opponent. Having this said, I will briefly move to the instruction on how to implement the principle of charity in discussion. Well, there are three basic steps on charitable interpretation. Firstly, simply ignore minor issues in the argument if they are not crucial to the main point that the opponent is trying to make. Then, extend the principle of charity to intentions. It's about the Hanlon's razor. To put it simple, when it's not clear that there is an issue with another person's argument, it's good to assume that it is unintentional on their part, as long as it's reasonable to do so. It means that if possible, you should give people the benefit of doubt and attribute issues in the argument to a misunderstanding on their part, or to a similar issue, rather than to a malicious intent to deceive. And C. Consider using a logically structured approach. It's highly beneficial, but very rare, to attempt to re-express your opponent's position so clearly and logically structured and fairly, so your opponent could say, thank you for putting my thoughts so clearly. Now, when it's clear what's the principle of charity and how to use it in discussion, we may also ask on the reason of embodying the principle of charity. Why do we embody the principle of charity? 
Well, the first thing that comes to my mind is simply this is the right thing to do. However, it might not be a sufficient reason for everyone. Therefore, let me present a few benefits of embodying the principle of charity in discussion. Firstly, applying the principle of charity make, can make you better at understanding others. It doesn't matter what you're going to do with this knowledge, but it's valuable in itself to understand the others. Secondly, implementing charitable principle improves your reasoning skills. Focusing on fighting the fallacies and practicing of improving them makes you better in building your own arguments. Thirdly, embodying the principle encourages people to talk with you. Usually people like to speak to somebody who's trying to understand what they're saying. Finally, applying the principle of charity makes others more willing to listen what you say. It's very simple. People will listen to you more carefully and interpret you more charitably when, the, when you do the same thing to them. Okay, this is the principle of charity in general. Now, it can be extended in a Christian manner. To see how it works, let's have a look on St. Ignatius' Presupponendum. This is a ground rule for the spiritual exercises a Jesuit retreat that Ignatius puts right at the beginning of the book. It's about the relationship between the spiritual director and the exorcism, a person making the retreat. However, it can be implemented in any form of discourse, as Jesuit Karl Starkloff notes. He himself applied Ignatius' presupponendum to, the, to analyzing the intercultural dialogue in the context of evangelization. Okay, let's have a look on presupponendum. In George Gunn's translation, it reads, It should be presupposed that every good Christian ought to be more eager to put a good interpretation on a neighbor's statement that, than to condemn it. Further, if one cannot interpret it favorably, one should ask how the other means it. If that meaning is wrong, one should correct the person with love. And if this is not enough, one should search, er, search out every appropriate means through which, by understanding the statement in a good way, it may be saved. Well, that's huge, isn't it? Before we put it into small pieces, let me first give you a brief historical background of presupponendum. It is, in fact, a result of Ignatius' life experience. He experienced a lot of less fair judgments, and it influenced him as he wrote this instruction. Ignatius' critic seems to have assumed that Ignatius, who was an unletterman must therefore have been one of the Illuminati, who claim source coming directly from God without the meditation of the Church. Thus, early in his apostolic life, Ignatius came to understand how disposed the human will is to condemn rather than to defend, and how prone the human tango is to speak evil of the others. Even in his letters to Jesuits, Ignatius also emphasized to listen long and to speak briefly or as he wrote to the fathers attending the Council of Trent, be slow to speak. Now, we may analyze these presupponendum in details. There are four basic steps of St. Ignatius' presupponendum. The first step includes the principle of charity discussed above, to put a good interpretation on the statement or to others' intention. The second step is a powerful principle of communication, for it requires us to risk entering into one's mind and heart. It's already something more than the principle of charity. It's another step towards the opponent, a second chance. After putting an effort to interpret it charitably, which failed, we ask for clarification. In this way, we also admit that it is us who might not understood it correctly by a cognitive bias or emo emotional commitment which could drive us to strong and fallacy. Step three, it's worth to emphasize that Ignatius does not say to be a Mr. Nice Guy and to pretend not to see false beliefs or mistakes. We should correct errors, but with love. This means that we value not only truth, but also the person we're talking to. And the last step is a manifest of taking care of the others who may be wrong. Ignatius recommends to search out any appropriate means to save the other statement, for example, sub by supplementing it with additional claim or limiting its scope. This last step seems to be important especially for Christians who are responsible for the souls. However, it also might be a manifest of goodwill among the citizens to approach the truth 
through the process of dialectics. Okay, these are the four steps of Ignatius' presupponendum. To summarize, the true value of presupponendum is its potential for creating dynamic of trust and collaboration between persons. It also gives a broad understanding, which seeks to evaluate the statement itself and the spirit in which it is intended. The principle of retrieving exhibits the importance of the person and the truth. And it also attempts to provide a complete objectivity, that is, a knowledge on how to consider the positive values of the statement and to put aside purely emotional reaction or one-sided prejudice. Now, the very last thing. What is the relation between the principle of charity and Ignatius' presupponendum? Presupponendum is an extended principle of charity because it includes good interpretation of the statement and of the intention, but additionally, it includes a feedback question which gives a warranty against Stroman fallacy. We are making sure if we understood correctly. Presupponendum is also oriented on truth and person, where the principle of charity is aimed to get a better understanding of the statement, which might be used in various purposes, even against the opponent. So, presupponendum requires to adapt the other's perspective. It also shifts the suspicion of error from the other to myself, assuming the possibility of listener's co cognitive bias, lack of understanding or fallacious reasoning. Maybe it is me who is wrong, or do I want to understand it correctly, or am I able to understand it correctly? What's more, it does not stop on achieving a correct understanding of the opponent. It goes further to correct all mistakes, with love, in dialectical process or with any other appropriate means. And lastly, it shifts the accent from correcting the other, or sticking to one's guns, to discovering the truth. In this way, it is dialectical. Now, we may ask, is presupponendum dedicated for Christians only? The answer is, not to Christians, but to all true seekers for it favors not only charity and justice, but every kind of inquiry as well. Prudence and enlightened self-interest also urge us to remain open to the possibility of discovering truth. Also, the care for the other who is, who is wrong, to examine his or her position or change his or her mind, might not be Christian specifically. It might be a result of responsible understanding of civil society. Therefore, presupponendum, although it was created for Christians, by Christian, is not dedicated for Christian exclusively, and the public discourse might highly benefit from it. Now, to conclude, the principle of charity tells you to treat the other's people as intelligent. If you treat people as being intelligent, you will do a better job at evaluating the arguments. It can also be supplied with Hallon's razor, assuming that people are good by nature. Such principle of charity requests to see people as intelligent and good. Ignatius' presupponendum is a radical version of this principle, strengthened or extended, for it also tells you not only to adopt the best possible interpretation before you evaluate one statement, but to make sure you understood it correctly by clarifying question. Then, if you are sure that the statement is false or fallacious, it requests to present your counter-argument with love, and optionally to show how the statement can be improved to avoid fallacy or falsehood. In this way, it decreases the potential for fallacy and helps to build efficient and gentle discussion. And obviously, it's not for Christian only, but may be seen as a Christian contribution to argumentation theory. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. If you have any question, please do not hesitate to ask them now or to write a comment. If you watch us online, you may also send them via email. And please remember to be charitable when interpreting this stuff. Okay, so uh, that was Jakub Prus. <laughs> uh, that is me. Uh, if you have any questions on site, please. <laughs> okay. You are visible, hearable. Thank you.
Thank you, Jakub, for your presentation. Uh, you have just uh, made a precision uh, saying for what categories of uh, believers and not believers, for everybody um, uh, was this recommendation to use charity principle. Uh, but I wanted to ask you uh, for what uh, types of discourse uh, Ignatius uh, recommended to apply this principle uh, most of all or uh, ma making some priority for some types of discourse, for example, for exegete, probably for exegetic uh, purposes. Uh, and uh, this is the first part of my question. Uh, and I think uh, about pragmatic linguistics, uh, the theory of acts, of Austin, uh, and so on. Um, so uh, about the situations where uh, some statements may be not clear, uh, and um, but it is uh, ordinary life, everyday life. So uh, did uh, Ignatius make a difference between different types of discourse? Uh, rhetorical debates, for example, uh, exegetic practices uh, or ordinary life. What was a priority for him uh, to, for, for application of this principle, uh, if, if any? Uh, and uh, another part of my question, uh, uh, another part of my question was, uh, I don't know if I Ah, uh, it is well known that um, Bible is not a simple discourse. It is uh, very close to poetic discourse, poetical discourse. And uh, in poetry, uh, there are many elliptic uh, statements, elliptic uh, uh, yes, metaphors, metaphors. And uh, the value, uh, so what thought, uh, what uh, Ignatius thought about uh, the value of clarity compared uh, to the value of metaphor, of allegory, and uh, uh, what, what, what could you comment um, on the relation? Uh, on, uh, is there any contradiction? Uh, was for him uh, more valuable the clarity or uh, it, it was a distinct thi thing for him from the metaphorical value of Bible of uh, and its strength, its force, uh, because you, you said that uh, the, the principle of charity uh, says that uh, people will understand clear, uh, easily, more easily, if you express yourself clearly. But the Bible is not constructed like that, and there is another value, this, this poetic value, uh, which uh, uh, makes people to penetrate the, the soul of others or the um, profound sense of Bible through metaphors. So, is there any contradiction or, or not, and how, how could you comment on this? Mute. Uh, um, down the screen. Mute. On the left, left, left. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you for these two questions. Uh, the first, the type of discourse, I, I mentioned it in the presentation that Ignatius wrote this instruction for the exercitant and, and the spiritual director. So this is a very narrow application of it. Only for the religious people, two of them, one of them is a spiritual director and the other is the exercitant. And this is this has nothing to do with logic and theory for argumentation. This is basically about two people when one comes to, the, to another and share their experience. And this is Ignatius. And what I did with Ignatius, I applied this to the argumentation theory where you can, where you have principle of charity. And principle of charity asks you to put a good interpretation of it. Ignatius, if you want to follow this, I presented some rationale for this. It says not only put a good interpretation of it, but assume a good will. Ask the feedback question. How do you understand it? If, because I put all my efforts 
to rescue your statement. Nevertheless, I mean, I, I, it, it's not only for the people sharing their experience, it's for us having this discussion. We are on the philosophical conference. We are having, we are maybe not arguing right now, but I hope we will. Um, we are having discussion. And basically what we do, what Ignatius wrote, is a human temptation to put a wrong interpretation of it, to assume that you are irrational or you are you have a bad will, you are a malicious, or... So Ignatius, knowing this, knowing the, the, the temptation to, to, to sin with a tango, I, I, I read the passage from him, is, is saying basically, put a good interpretation, ask how one understands this, and if, and, and if this first and the second step fails, correct with love, or make sure you... You understood it correctly, and you correct the other if you are sure that he's wrong. But first, make sure that you are not wrong. So this is, I would say, that this is the, the top of the top of what you can do to avoid putting wrong interpretation or to, to do a strawman fallacy. Uh, we can ask what, how, <laughs> who could apply this? Because no one, no one of us do this really. I mean, look at us. This is the question I received uh, on the other on the other room. What's the purpose of doing this? Basically, we fail with the principle of charity. So, what's the reason of extending it in a Christian way? And this is a really hard question. Uh, psychologists, psychologists, uh, when they are working with their clients. Okay. So you mentioned you, psychiatrists. Okay, you mentioned psychologists and psychiatrists. I would say that this is a path to follow, and the reason for for creating one is basically to to set the direction which we can be turned to. But um, basically, I I must admit that I fail the principle of charity very often, and I fail the the principle endum a fortiori. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, and the second question about the po poetical side of Bible, I'm not feel comfortable answering this because I I have nothing to do with the hermeneutics of the Bible, and Ignatius Ignatius made it only for the for the two people talking, and we can extend it to build a uh, communicational or argumentational principle. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Um, one more question. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, I see Tony. Hello, Tony. Nice to see you. You can unmute yourself and ask the question, please. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I would like to ask if the principle of charity uh, in discussions uh, involve tolerance, empathy, and correction with love. How can you bring uh, someone who is an extremist or maybe a conspiracy theorist to the realization of the truth against his own errors when he believes so much that uh, uh, empathy or tolerance means weakness and also believes that any opposing view is an attack, a malicious attack on his own view, and also believes that he, ha he, ha he gains from spreading this disinformation or misinformation as the case may be. So how can you bring this stiff-necked conspiracy theorist to the realization of the truth? If you are doing charity in love, do, that is, if you are doing charity in the discussions you are having with him. Okay, that's that's really hard question, isn't it? <laughs> so, if I understood you correctly, you ask how can I apply the principle of charity, extend it in a in an Ignatius manner, to the to the people who are not who are uh, who who have the attitude of 
talking and they are not open to 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 discuss, right? Exactly. Well, mm-hmm. well the, <laughs> the answer would be um, the, the Ignatius made this, this four steps, and the third was the correct with law, and the four the, the four was find any appropriate means. And that, that, that's really interesting. What does it mean? Does it mean it, he meant, probably, use not only argumentation, use any possible means. So not only if, if the, you know, the, the philosophical or logical, rational discourse failed, try another mean. Maybe try to convince, maybe try another way of persuasion. We have plenty of them. Of, co- of course, they, there are unethic, unethic, unethical ways of persuasion, but there are also another one. And maybe try this one. I mean, maybe, I don't know, maybe just, just try to talk, just try to play uh, another language game. If we if we use Wittgenstein language, just if if you failed in the language game called rational discussion, and someone just is fighting with you, and I won't, I will stick to my guns because you won't convince me, even if um if even if I'm wrong. Just try, just change the language game, just change change language game to I don't know, maybe let's share our experience. Maybe we we stop just discussion. And let, let's start talking. If if we have this distinction between discussing and, and talking, sharing my sharing our experiences, I don't know if that answers. Maybe this is this this is the escape from your question. Um, okay, I think I see that we have we have run of time, so we can move to our another speaker. I can see some more questions from the stream, but. Uh, Unfortunately, we must move on. So our next speaker is, um, sorry for spelling, uh, Kingsley, Kingsley Mbara Sebastian uh, from Catholic University of Lublin. Um, and Kingsley will give you a talk on the methods of practicing Christian philosophy with specific reference to Stanislav Kaminski. And I think I'm, I'm fascinated to hear about this because first there will be a Polish philosopher and, and the second reason is finally we have someone talking specifically on Christian philosophy so we have asked all of those questions about whether Christian philosophy exists and how, how is it distinguishable from the non-Christian philosophy. So I can see that Kingsley is with us. I will now display the Kingsley's lecture or the talk, and then please keep uh, all your questions in your mind and ask them after the talk. And a quick reminder, please mute yourself during the lecture or I will mute you, <laughs> and then unmute yourself if you have a question. Good day. Good day, and welcome everyone listening. My name is Kingsley Mbamara from the John Paul II Catholic University of Lublin. The title of my presentation is Methods of Practicing Christian Philosophy with a specific reference to Stanislav Kaminsky. Introduction. Kaminsky proposes a unique method that is truly philosophical, but also Christian in nature. His doctrinal standpoints are philosophically rational, objective, and universal, but it is also most friendly and compatible with Christian faith. It is only in this sense I speak of the Christian nature of his philosophy and the suitability of his methodology for the practice of Christian philosophy. I do not pretend to present all that constitutes Kaminsky's concept of philosophy. I will focus only on those aspects that have immediate relevance to the thesis defended in this paper. The development of Kaminsky's ideas have been divided into three stages. 
non-metaphysical, pro-metaphysical, and wisdom-oriented. The last two divisions bear what is considered as the Christian nature of his philosophy. Without getting entangled in the debate whether there is such a thing as Christian philosophy, and not just philosophers who are Christian, what follows from here is a survey of Kaminsky's concept of philosophy, which he equated with the theory of B or general metaphysics and his methodology of that theory in order to show in what sense it is Christian in nature and why it is suitable for the practice of Christian philosophy. Kaminsky's concept of philosophy. Kaminsky's philosophical ideas were developed within the Lublin Philosophical School, but in dialogue and debate with other schools of philosophy. Kaminsky described the philosophy of the Lublin Philosophical School as classical. It is a philosophy that refers to the Aristotelian Thomist tradition, but further developed in accordance to logical and methodological rigor. It is the understanding he considered the most appropriate and most aptly rendering its sense, first of all, as a particular type of metaphysics, began by Aristotle as having its specific object and purpose of inquiry. The consideration of its object and purpose determined the choice of its method of inquiry into everything that really exists and the discovery of the ultimate causes of existence and functioning of all that really exists. The methodological autonomy and the methodological epistemological unity and approach fitting to this philosophical system was carefully delineated by Kaminsky in the light of the theory of being and in connection to the theory of science. According to Kaminsky, we therefore regard the theory of being as equal in its scope to metaphysics and we identify it with the entire classical philosophy which constitutes a science that is one and indivisible with regard to its formal object and its method of explanation, both in which it is possible to distinguish partially autonomous disciplines due to their particular starting points. The theory of being meets the requirement of not only being autonomous and rational, but the foundation of all branches of philosophy and disciplines. According to Kaminsky, if we assume the, that classical philosophy explains any object given in experience in its ultimate and necessary ontic aspect. Each particular type of reality is ultimately explained also in the way, in the same way as being in general, that is, by the structure of being. This philosophy is an ingenious blend of classical philosophy and modern thought to construct a new philosophical system based on the theory of being in answer to the question, how to philosophize. The explication of this philosophy in terms of its originality clearly demonstrates a strict scientific, methodological, and heterogeneous approach to analyzing objects that is philosophical as one of its distinctive features, which is both the influence and the consequence of Kaminsky's in-depth knowledge and interest in history, logic, and science. As a result, this philosophical system is devoid of hasty generalization, but concisely and systematically synthesizing themes from tradition and contemporary philosophy inspired and guided by metaphilosophical and zoological beliefs and methodological anthropological motivation to perfectly construe his philosophy. The Christian nature of Kaminsky's philosophy. The first indicator of the Christian nature of classical philosophy as understood by Kaminsky can be found in its function with regard to theology. According to Kaminsky, the aspiration of theology to be a true scholarly domain can be aided and fulfilled more perfectly by philosophy, which is the natural cognition of reality. The knowledge acquired by metaphysics expressed in general and abstract terms does provide theology and supernatural knowledge with tools for explaining the truth of religious faith and the human being in relation to God. Such assistance and function by philosophy in relation to supernatural knowledge and theology is not found in every philosophical system that tries to explain reality. The second mark of the Christian nature of classical philosophy can be seen in its concept 
of God. As mentioned earlier, classical philosophy starts from experience and examines real being under the general aspect of existence and searches for the ultimate reasons of being. The concept of the theory of being, Kaminsky claims, presupposes the rational character of the world and the possibility of its ultimate theoretical explanation. For in the process of the ultimate explanation of, of being, the absolute being is recognized as the reason for being in general. And so a system of thesis concerning the existence and essence of the absolute should fit in general metaphysics as its culmination. Thus, the metaphysical concept of the absolute is compatible with the Christian understanding of God, even if neither concept of God nor the thesis of God's existence are, are capable of becoming the starting point of explanation in the theory of being. Therefore, Kaminsky's metaphysics, to the extent that it is open to transcendent reality and helps to understand the rationality of faith, could be said to be Christian in nature. Third, Christian nature of Kaminsky's philosophy can be sought in the tradition to which Kaminsky adhered. Andreas Brunk has identified the double heritage that Kaminsky enjoyed as the scholastic and the tradition of the Lulu of Warsaw School. Through philosophical and theological studies, he placed himself within the framework of existential Thomism. This dual heritage had influenced his analytical synthetic approach and the direction of his interests. Consequently, he conceived metaphysics to be indispensable and sufficient for full establishment of the rational basis of a worldview and for validating strictly philosophical implications of scientific cognition. That worldview was shaped by Christianity, which at the time Kaminsky wrote was under the attacks of Marxists and positivists who rejected metaphysics and the worldview it supports. Kaminsky's theory of being was partly a reaction to this attack, though it is far from being a philosophical polemics for Christianity, it is most friendly and reconcilable to Christian doctrine. Fourth, Kaminsky endorses the long-standing tradition in classical philosophy of equating and associating philosophical knowledge with wisdom. Philosophy constitutes and generates special kind of knowledge, that is, wisdom. Wisdom here is understood to mean more than the accumulation of information. It is about having the knowledge of the value, ultimate principle, and purpose of things in relation to themselves and to life and existence. From the metaphilosophical perspective of classical philosophy, Kaminsky claims that complete metaphysical cognition constitutes the fundamental element of the house of wisdom, and the wisdom, taken ideally, is the necessary model, the beginning and the aim of philosophizing. If such metaphilosophical as well as metaphysical and anthropological assumptions are accepted. The category of wisdom becomes indispensable in philosophy. Such emphasis, which reference philosophy with wisdom, resonate with Christian theology and are not peculiar to Kaminsky. Stronger relation of philosophy with wisdom appeared in the writings of Pope John Paul II in his book, Crossing the Threshold of and as well as in the cyclical Fides Eratio, where he expressed the need for a philosophy that has a true metaphysical range and wisdom-oriented character. Before Pope John Paul II, Jack Maritain asserted that wisdom is the highest knowledge, most fundamental and ultimately granted. Its systematized version is to some extent constituted by philosophy, or more specifically, classical metaphysics, which is located between science and wisdom. Similarly, Kaminsky's, Kaminsky maintains that wisdom may come also from sources not typical to natural cognition, but from supernatural faith. Then the deepest understanding occur in the light of the revelation. Its systematized form is usually theology. The two orders of wisdom are not contrary or contradictory to each other. Neither does one supplant the other. Rather, one leads to the other. Kaminsky's classical philosophy tends naturally towards transcendence and consequently towards theology. Thus, Kaminsky's 
metaphysics is Christian philosophy in the sense that it indicates, in the words of John Paul II, a Christian way of philosophizing, a philosophical speculation conceived in dynamic union with faith. It does not, therefore, refer simply to a philosophy developed by Christian philosophers who have striven in their research not to contradict the faith. It will not be impossible, but certainly strange and difficult to distance Kaminsky's metaphysics from the religious undertone underlining its Christian nature. The suitability of Kaminsky's methodology to practicing Christian philosophy. Methodological development and exploration in both science and philosophy are some of the most important areas of Kaminsky's contributions to philosophy and science. Kaminsky's method is conciliatory, analytic, and innovative in its approach to well-established tradition on the one hand, and on the other hand, new developments and approaches in philosophy. Hence, Kaminsky writes that the conception of being cares not for the faithfulness that either to Thomas tradition or to some likings of philosophical thinkers. Instead, it seeks to be faithful primarily to its natural object, the existing reality. Thus, the suitability of this philosophy also arises from the fact that it makes use of the method of objective cognition, for the reason of which it examines and explains apprehended and objective reality so that truly transcendental knowledge is acquired and consequently avoiding the error of falling into idealism, subjectivism, and relativism. If one takes into account that the concept of human dignity and truth are central to Christianity, the relevance, contribution, and suitability of Kaminsky's concept of philosophy and method in relation to practicing Christian philosophy should be evident. Kaminsky's approach has its origin in the desire to formalize and systematize philosophy for the reasons of understanding, meaning, clarity, precision in both thought and expression, but does all for the sake of explaining reality by reference to the ultimate ontic reasons as a theologian, methodologist, and analyst. These goals were actualized through the conception and explanation of the theory of being by the Thomistic and the analytical logical method, Kaminsky understood clearly the strength and the deficiency of each method and therefore combined or synthesized both methods to form one method that could overcome the weakness inherent in a single method taken alone. This is a very significant advantage. Kaminsky's concept of philosophy and methodology thus provide a constructive method and philosophical rigor for Christian philosophers that constitute an important advantage crucial to engagement in the contemporary philosophical discourse, debate, and dialogue, and consequent to the emergence of a genuine theological philosophical worldview that is also genuinely Christian in its outcome and nature. Kaminsky's philosophy shows that it is possible to search for truth with autonomous methods and acquire objective knowledge and at the same time, be open to the transcendence. In conclusion, if the argument is valid and true as presented by Kaminsky, in order to understand the deepest objective truths about man and his position within the world and in relation to God, a theologian must employ a metaphysical theory of reality the argument points to only one fact, that is, such a philosophy has elements that are agreeable to faith or simply that it is Christian in nature. Kaminsky's concept of philosophy and methodology meet all the requirements to be considered as Christian in nature without compromising its status as pure, universal, objective, and autonomous Thank you very much, Kingsley. That was um
Stanislav Kaminski and his idea of Christian philosophy. Stanislav Kaminski was well-known methodologist Polish in the 20th century. So, um, do we have any questions here on site? I see no questions. Um, maybe we will move to the questions from WebEx participants. I can see Daniel. Hello, Daniel. Uh, just please unmute yourself, ask the question. Hi there. Uh, thanks, King Lee, for that. That was that was really engaging. Um, I, I, I wasn't familiar with this with Kaminsky before, so thanks for making me and privy to him. Uh, I, I, I do wonder a bit about um, wisdom and sort of this transcendental knowledge that he talks about, and obviously this is uh, quite common in the Catholic philosophical tradition. Um, you say um, his his philosophy and especially his metaphysics are specifically Christian, but then it seems to me when he gets to the wisdom stuff, um, he, he, I think there was a quote in there where he seems to seems to say that this um, this wisdom is almost an indispensable part of Christian philosophizing or the apex perhaps of Christian philosophizing. Um, and I guess maybe one of my worries there is I, I'm channeling sort of Pascal here when he has his experience saying, oh, this is not the God of the philosophers, but the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Um, so I guess, um, to, to what extent do you see wisdom as a necessary, like an absolutely necessary component in Christian philosophy? Or does Kaminsky see this as a necessary component? And, um, where's the, um, St. Paul's shaming of the wisdom of the world, uh, you know, and reveling in the sort of the foolishness of the cross. Where does where the foolishness of the cross come into this? Does that make sense? Uh, can you hear me? Okay. I, I think you, you, you don't understand to that when St. Paul about uh, wisdom, uh, we mean that contradicted the, the Christian faith, or contradicted the person of Christ. And within the years, when philosophy developed and Christ Christianity fully met uh, uh, the, the Western world and Western philosophy, and the period of personification of wisdom, it was mostly recognized as uh, as equivalent or as a personification. Christ now becoming a personification of, uh, of wisdom. And it is in this sense, too, that we see uh, philosophy to the extent that uh, it helps to explain faith, but it helps to explain the person of Christ that it represents such kind of, such kind of, uh, such kind of wisdom. That's why I remember the quotation there I made of uh, what Jean Paul II said that it is a good. Would deny or reject such kind of uh, wisdom if it helps. Okay. I don't know if I asked the question very well. Okay? Kings, we can't hear you very well. Um, and I on YouTube. Okay. Now, um, we have some we have some troubles with the yeah. connection. Um, could you? Are, would you be able to respond? Very well? Yeah, yeah, better. But this is about internet connection, I guess. Yeah, it's maybe about internet connection and microphone. Okay, Daniel, did you did you did you understood the the? Yeah, no, I got most of it until until the end there. I think I think I get the general um, trend of where Kingsley's going with that. I might I might send you a, an email, Kingsley, to ask a further question if that's all right. Okay, no problem. I would be glad to see your question. Okay, any one more? Any any questions? Um, we have two questions from the stream. And I like the very one. <laughs> uh, the first, I will ask both. And just, just um, the first question is: 
what's the what's the relation between theology and philosophy? If there is a concept of Christian philosophy, what is it? Isn't it that simply theology? What would you say? What would Stanislav Kaminsky say? And the other question, and I love this question, is whether is there a Christian physics and is there a Christian mathematics? If we say about Christian philosophy, um, so what would you say this, and what would Stanislav Kaminsky answer to this? Thanks. Yeah. If you have been following closely a debate within there is a debate within the philosophical school of Lublin about the existence of Christian philosophy or non-existence of Christian philosophy, and there are those who clearly say it doesn't exist, and those who say that it exists. But Christian philosophy is differentiated from, from theology and also differentiated from natural the and natural theology, because as I said there, that um, philosophy is pure natural wisdom, wisdom, pure natural wisdom, and has its own specific methods and uh, object of uh, studies, and which is different from uh, theology, which has also its uh, uh, the object of, uh, of study and thing. And whether if there is Christian Christian uh, physics or Christian uh, physics or Christian in such manner because um, uh, philosophy deals with objects different from men. Uh, uh, metaphysics and uh, phys uh, physics, which deals with uh, ordinary things, physical things that you can touch and feel. And, and theology also deals with things, particularly to that we cannot really tangible with hand, it makes it more closer with uh, philosophy. And so in that sense, uh, we can't talk about uh, Christian physics, or we'll talk about uh, Christian uh, chemistry, or we'll talk about Christian uh, uh, mathematics. These are general, general concepts or general things that ordinarily everybody should cognize and uh, differentiate uh, from pure understanding of cognition or methodology of understanding things such as philosophy, such as philosophy, philosophy, or tries or tries to do. Okay, um, thank you for this. I'm not sure whether I understood everything correctly. Uh, I hope it will be hearable uh, on YouTube screen, stream, more or less. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Kingsley. And uh, thank you all. And that was our last talk on the session one. Now we are going to have a break, coffee break, 30 minutes. And after the break at 12, uh, we will have a keynote lecture by Alexander Prus from Baylor University. And this will be streamed and available on this, on, in this room, in room number one. Um, so let's have a 30 minutes break and please be invited on to the lecture. Lecture will have 40 minutes and then we, will, we could have a discussion with Alexander. Alexander uh, is in Houston right now, so uh, I hope he will wake up <laughs> to answer our questions. Um, okay, so 30 minutes break. Thank you.
Tenemos muchas cámaras. Um, hello. Uh, can you hear me? I see some people here. Jacek, Jarek. Okay, you, you can hear me. Lovely. Um, so we are about to start with the keynote lecture. Um, just let me know. Um, can you? We are we are back. Okay, welcome after the break. Uh, we will now hit with the lecture of our keynote speaker. Um, so our, our keynote, keynote speaker is um, Alexander Proust from Baylor University in Texas. Uh, Alex is seven hours behind us. So probably he's sleeping right now, but he will wake up to answer the question after the lecture, which will have around 40 minutes. Um, and the lecture is titled God and Beauty. For those who join us in the meantime, uh, please mute yourself. After the lecture, I will ask you to raise the questions and then please unmute yourself, ask the question and mute yourself again. So now let's share, I will, I will display the lecture and please uh, note all your questions. And Alex will be there after the lecture to, to answer our question. Thank you. I would like to start by thanking the organizers for arranging this wonderful and very important conference and for giving me the honor of an invitation to the beautiful city of Krakow where it would have been nice to give a talk on God and beauty. Alas, I shall have to give this talk remotely from Waco, Texas. Among the arguments for the existence of God, some are abstruse. They are of appeal mainly to logicians and philosophers and the like. Gödel's ontological argument is the example par excellence of this. Such arguments do not move almost anybody, and perhaps anybody, in the direction of faith. On the other hand, many religious people are very much pulled by this conviction that the world around them is deeply beautiful, and that this beauty tells the glory of God, as the psalm says. At the very least, we can say that psychologically, the beauty of the world makes it easier to believe in God. The question before us today, however, is not about whether psychologically it does so. I shall assume it does, and it will in fact be a part of one of the arguments. But whether the beauty of the world, as well as other considerations having to do with beauty, provide an epistemic reason to believe in God, whether they provide at least a little bit of evidence for the existence of God how much will be a good question to ask during the discussion. I'm going to sketch three families of epistemic reasons connected with beauty and directed at the existence of God. The first will be based on the very concept of beauty. The second will be based on the empirical fact that we have a sense of beauty. And the third will be based on the arrangement of the world, which is what you might call friendly to beauty. It has lots of beauty in it, but not only that, it, has, it makes that beauty accessible to 
the intelligent beings in that world, at least the ones we know, namely ourselves. And then I will end by comparing the argument from beauty with the argument with design arguments and discuss the problem of evil and whether it has an analog in the problem of ugliness. And I shall argue that the problem of ugliness is much less problematic than the problem of evil is. So let's start with an observation about beauty. Beauty is extremely diverse. So Plato says in the Symposium that one progresses, ideally, from one body to two in appreciating beauty, and from two to every lovely body, from bodily beauty to beauty of institutions, from institutions to learning, and from learning in general to the special lore that pertains to nothing but the beautiful itself. We do indeed pursue beauty wherever we can find it, and we pursue it as if it was something that mattered to us, as indeed it does. The diversity of beauty is bewildering. Here is a beautiful person, a beautiful human being, but is the face beautiful? Maybe, but in a very different way from that in which presumably Helen of Troy was beautiful. Here's a different kind, a different beauty. Also, this is a purely physical kind of beauty. Another one, and one that is brought forward by an artist. Here's something very different, but also beautiful, Jackson Pollock's work. Here is something much more humdrum, but still has a kind of beauty to it, the beauty of fine industrial design, which highlights how important beauty is to us, how much we want to be surrounded by beautiful things, even in everyday activities. There's mathematical beauty, sometimes of a, of a sort that's not that different from the beauty we find in the universe around us, the beauty of leaves that are symmetrical or nebulae that are colorful. But sometimes we have abstract forms of beauty that we cannot express very well in pictures where the true beauty is much more abstract. We can express it in words, or at least we can express the thing that has the beauty in words. Maybe the beauty itself we may not be able to express in words. Maybe we can only grasp at it once we've expressed the thing itself in words. But those words are also words of a highly technical language, the language of mathematics, for example. We have the beauty of poetry, which has two forms. There's the beauty of poetry, as the sounds, the play of sounds, the beautiful sounds, which cannot be translated from language to language, which we have in the top of this picture, or we have the beauty of the meanings of those sounds, the interplay of meanings that we have at the bottom preserved in translation. We have the beauty of mathematical proofs, which is very different from the beauty of mathematical objects, like uh, the Lie group G2, for example, or like the uh, fractal that I showed earlier. The arguments themselves can be beautiful. We have a twofold beauty in the laws of nature. One kind of beauty found in them is that the laws, considered as abstract statements, have a kind of elegance and compellingness and beauty to them. But second, they are true, and the fact that the world exemplifies those elegant statements makes the world more beautiful. We have the beauty of mathematical facts. There's something particularly beautiful about the fact that there are only five platonic solids. You'd kind of think, Maybe there's like none, or one, or infinity, but no, there are five. Mysterious, 
but provable. So we have beauty coming to us in a manifold nature. We can divide it up into three categories. The concrete, where we have natural laws considered as true, not just considered as abstractions. Natural functioning, natural objects, and natural landscapes and other scapes. Communities, institutions, customs, laws that we have created for ourselves to govern ourselves by. Arts, connected to senses, visual, auditory, olfactory, tactile, and gustatory, and with the two kinds of aspects that we saw in Mitzkevich. There's the sensory aspect, how it sounds or, or, or feels, and then there's the meaning behind it. We have actions, performances, even whole lives. After all, what is beautiful about Mother Teresa most is her life and thoughts. And of course, at sort of the summit of the concrete, if he exists, is God. But then we have abstract things that are beautiful. Theorems, proofs, mathematical objects, theories and arguments in mathematics and elsewhere, plots, settings, and characters. Here I'm thinking of literature, film, and so on. Platonic objects, like the Lee group G2, if there are platonic objects. And then we have combinations. We have expressions or echoes of one kind of beauty and another kind of beauty. For example, of a natural, be concrete beauty in an artistic creation. We have conjoinings of instances of uh, the same and of different kinds of beauty. We have the meal prepared by the wonderful chef, where each item in the meal is beautiful and combines gustatory, olfactory, and vi visual and tactile beauty. And then the different parts of the meal themselves combine into a whole meal. So we have got this vast array of beauty and I went on and on and on just to emphasize how vast it is. And we now have the deep question. What do all of these things, which seem so very different in kind, maybe even crossing ontological categories, what do they have in common? That is the question of the concept of beauty. We have two kinds of answers we could try to give. One kind of answer involves the character of the beautiful thing itself. And the three main suggestions that have been made are, it's a brute feature. It just happens to be beautiful. There's nothing more to be said. It cannot be analyzed. It's just some things are beautiful and some things are not. That's all there is to it. Or perhaps it has to do with proportion. Plato may have thought this. There's like a mathematical characterization we can give of the beautiful. Or perhaps it is goodness that makes things be beautiful. But there's another approach, perhaps a more modern one. It's not so much the thing that is beautiful. Well, the thing is beautiful, but what makes the thing be beautiful is its relationship to something else. And here we have three primary options for what that thing it is in relationship to is. Us, the perceivers, the creators of the beauty, which could be us, but could be something other than us as well. Or it could be a particular metaphysically or ethically special being, like God. The last of these six kinds of answers explicitly invokes God. I'm going to argue that some of these answers are not very compelling and that the best versions of all of the ones that are pretty good lead in some way to God. So let's go through them. 
Brute feature theories. That's one of the ones I don't like. And I don't like it because it's giving up. It's a surrendering. Brute feature theories should always be our last resort, philosophically speaking. We should try to give explanations. Maybe we will fail, but last resort. Proportion theories. They just fail. Think back on the pictures I showed. There isn't mathematical proportion in a number of these. Think of the beautiful arguments or the beautiful lives. You can kind of stretch maybe the concept of proportion to get some of those, but it is a stretch and it's a stretch that will not actually let you distinguish the beautiful from the ugly. The best hope for a proportion theory is classical art and even there it fails to correctly predict which pieces of classical art are beautiful and which are merely technically adept. The good is particularly promising among the theories focusing on the character of the beautiful thing. I think it's promising because the good uh, involves a similar kind of diversity to beauty. There are so many very different kinds of things that are good. Indeed, all of the things in the categories I listed earlier can also be good. So the goodness theory starts out well. It does justice to the diversity of the good in a way that proportion theories do not. It's an underappreciated theory and I think the main reason it is not appreciated is because of a focus by thinkers on things that are beautiful but evil. For example, Leni Riefenstahl's propaganda film Triumph of the Will. Has, it has a kind of beauty to it, but it is promoting the horrible Nazi ideology. I think the goodness theorist may have some ways out of this. First of all, the goodness theorist can point out that often in a beautiful work that is serving something evil, there is a good respect in it. For example, in Riefenstahl's Triumph of the Will, there is the goodness of the camaraderie between workers. A camaraderie that the Nazis and the Communists then distort. But nonetheless, the camaraderie in itself is a good thing and is shown as good, albeit in a distorting context. Secondly, and more radically, one could simply say, yeah, that thing that you said was beautiful but wasn't good, it's not beautiful. It looks beautiful, but it isn't. It's just an illusion. It's an illusion, it looks beautiful, it looks good, but even though it looks good and looks beautiful, it isn't. It's deceitful, it's mere propaganda. It appears to be beautiful, but isn't. So I think that there is an answer for the good theorist who says that uh, the good is the beautiful to the problem of evil works. But, and it's a solution that I myself will want to adopt. I will want to adopt both of these kinds of solutions for my preferred theory. But I think there is another problem with simply identifying the good and the beautiful. The beautiful pulls on us. It pulls on us, on our hearts, in a kind of more visceral, more mysterious way than the good does. And it points beyond itself, more directly, more fully than the good, or maybe I should say more obviously than the good does. So there's something not quite there in the good theory. Only if the good is seen as somehow pointing beyond itself, pointing to something deeper, like maybe God, is the good theory of the beautiful very plausible. 
What about the theories that relate the beautiful to the subject and make it be beautiful because it is perceived in a certain kind of way, for example? So we have subjectivist theories. The beautiful is what we perceive as beautiful or we are attracted by. Now, the attraction theory is implausible. Morbid curiosity can attract us to the ugly, quay ugly. The perception theory seems to require there to be something like a quale, a, subject, a subjective kind of feeling of beauty. But the problem of the diversity of beauty comes back at the level of this quale. For there isn't a single feeling, a single kind of quale that one is, has in one's mind when one listens to Beethoven's Ninth or eats a piece of culinary art or reads a mathematical proof. So given the diversity of the beautiful, the idea that there's some kind of perceptual element in common between all of them seems to me implausible. The attraction theory didn't have this problem because we can be attracted to a variety of different things. Here's, but maybe we should be a little more intellectual about this perception. Maybe it's more of an intellectual perception than something sensory where there's a quality. Let's think about that kind of version. The subjectivism can come in different levels of subjectivism. You could have a particular level subjectivism. Every particular thing perceived as beautiful is beautiful to the perceiver. You could have a rules theory. As a society or as a human race, we have rules of beauty that we have socially instituted and everything that accords with those rules is beautiful because it does so. So the beauty is explained in terms of us, the perceivers, the social perceivers. Or we could have a subtler theory, a kind of version of Lew David Lewis's theory of laws of nature on which those things that are beautiful are precisely the ones that are going to get counted as beautiful by the best systematization of our judgments of beauty. Our social judgments. I don't think any of these three theories is very promising. First of all, the, theory, the particularist theory fails from the problem of bad taste. It cannot explain what it is for somebody to have bad taste. Because the person who allegedly has bad taste, their judgments of beauty are just as true for them as for anybody else, as anybody else's are for them. The particularist theory does not make possible error, and yet error as to beauty is clearly possible. The rules and patterns theories are too extrinsic. They ground beauty in society. Now suppose that I am far from society perhaps, maybe on an island, and I'm contemplating some piece of beauty. And while I'm doing so, there's great social change going on out away from where I am, and the rules change. People, how people view beauty changes. Surely, my judgment that say this landscape is beautiful or ugly doesn't change in truth value just because far away people are starting to talk differently and starting to appreciate things differently. There should be something more intrinsic about beauty. It should be sort of closer to the perceiver and the perceived rather than grounded in far away contingent things. The subjectivist theories also make it somewhat mysterious why beauty matters. 
you have to talk about contingent benefits. And it seems like there's more to, be, to the importance of beauty than that. Here's another option. Maybe the be beauty is relative, but not to society, but to a kind of perceiver, a natural kind of perceiver, such as a human being. The beautiful relative to humans is maybe what a properly functioning human perceives as beautiful. Now there's room for error. Some humans are not properly functioning. Their judgments don't matter. There are some problems with this, too. Given the great diversity of kinds of beauty, it would mean that the human nature somehow has to have this vast set of norms embedded in it as to what to judge as beautiful. And if these norms are merely random, then we can't, why should beauty matter to us like it does? Theism here can help. If you have this theory about say that our nature is an image of God and that God from amongst the infinitude of possible natures chooses which one to instantiate and does so wisely and in part so that their perceptions of beauty might have a certain kind of coherence and diversity, then we can have a kind of answer to the question of why beauty still matters. Second problem, it seems that very plausible that just as there's beauty that some people like me cannot appreciate because they are tone deaf, musical beauty, there should be beauty that no humans can appreciate at all. There is a solution here. Maybe you could say the beautiful, there's such a thing as the beautiful simplicator, and it is what is beautiful relative to some kind or other. And so for every kind of beauty, there is a kind of being, a possible kind of being that would appreciate it. One problem is this may let too much in. Now it seems like, couldn't you imagine a kind of being that appreciates pretty much anything? And so now it seems everything is beautiful, simplicator, and then by parallel, ugly simplicator, because it could be disappreciated by some possible being. Again, if God exists, we might have a solution to this problem because we might say natural kinds necessarily are images of God. And not, e not every combination of judgments could be natural to some kind of being. Certain combinations just are, couldn't be there because they could not be found in the nature that reflects God. We might try to say that uh, what makes something beautiful is a certain connection to its creator. I think the most serious problem of that is that a creator is beautiful in creating. And this leads to an endless regress. You might say it leads to God, but it will push past God. It will ask, where's God's beauty come from? Or what makes God beautiful? It has to be that God has created by something else that beauty comes from, the creator of the beauty. That leads to vicious regress. So I want to consider the sixth of the theories. It's a very strange kind of theory. The idea is this. God, take this word divine. God is divine fundamentally. But everything that participates in God is divine derivatively. It doesn't mean it is God, but it is derivatively divine. When we perceive something as beautiful on this theory, we are perceptually representing it as divine. The beautiful is the divine. This explains the attraction of beauty without making it be non-rational or merely contingently beneficial. For we are drawn to the divine if there is a divine. It explains the mystery 
of beauty and the way beauty points beyond itself, or at least the way created beauty, the beauty all around us, points beyond itself. Um, what kind of theory of God does this require? That's a question for further investigation. Prima facie, it seems to work with classical theism, which I think is the correct theory, but it also may work with panentheism and so, at least some varieties of pantheism. In all these cases, we could talk of the beautiful as the derivatively divine or fundamentally divine. This coheres very well with the well-known cross-cultural link between religion and beauty, the focus on beauty in all the religions that we know of. Let's look at some objections. Problem one. Atheists appreciate beauty. But if beauty is supposed to be a if, appreciate, if perceiving beauty is perceiving divinity, then that means atheists are perceiving divinity, and that seems false. Well, we have to be careful. Perceptual representation is not conceptualization. When we see red, I think we are perceptually representing it as giving off light in a certain wavelength range. But we are not conceptualizing it as such. That's just what it means for it to be red. But we are not aware of that always. Problem two. It seems a little extrinsic that beauty would be connected to God in this way. Isn't it that the Rocky Mountains, for example, or the Tatras, are beautiful in themselves and not just in connection with God? Well, here I think we want to say this. Participation in God is very in intimate. The very nature of creatures and their accidents is to be by participation. If an instance of green or of beauty did not participate in God, its very being would be radically different. So it is actually, maybe in some sense it's extrinsic, but it is also, in some sense, deeply intrinsic. Here's another problem. Doesn't this make for too much beauty? On classical theism, Everything is God, or participates in God. So everything is beautiful. Maybe. Um, two options to get out of this. First, let's relativize this theory a little bit. Beauty to a kind of being, K, is a divinity perceivable by beings of kind K then maybe we could say that everything is beautiful simpliciter, but not to humans. Humans are not capable of recognizing the divinity of everything. And so, some things are not just not beautiful to humans, but they are beautiful to some possible kind of being. Another option, everything is beautiful, even a dead cat, but we have to see it the right way, see it in its divinity, and that's difficult. And, of course, participation in God can come in degrees, and so can beauty. We also have the problem of evil beauty, which I think can be handled in ways very similar to the problem of, of evil beauty in connection with the good theory of beauty. So I think uh, some of these theories that we had have promise, but all the ones that have promise involve God, at least as a way of responding to some objections. And hence, we have an argument for the existence of God based on the concept of beauty. Let's quickly think about some other arguments. Here's something indisputable. We have a sense of beauty. We have the sense whether or not the sense is objective or not. Even if there is no such thing objectively as beauty, we still have a sense of beauty. And it's still a puzzle why we have it. 
We need an explanation. For moral and epistemic norms, we can give some kind of good evolutionary story as to the benefits of thinking clearly and acting in ways that benefit society. And so we can give an evolutionary explanation of how we got the sense of the morally right or the epistemically proper. In the case of beauty, we can speculate. Mate selection. The beauty of fruit, which are also uh, good for us. Expensive uh, mating displays and the like. But yet, so much of the beautiful seems useless, or at least was useless to us at the stage at which evolution was particularly busy with us. Take mathematical, the beauty of highly abstract mathematical objects, which we knew nothing about when human beings were evolving from other species. Moreover, so many forms of beauty are tied to the harmful. Think of tigers or the beauty of mountains from which you can fall. We can try to come up with speculative evolutionary theories about the sense of beauty. I am not particularly convinced by these, and I think they're not going to cover all the cases of beauty. We can again discuss this during the discussion, if we wish. What about God? Can we give a God-based explanation to a sense of beauty? Well, yes. But it will be different depending on whether beauty is objective or not. If beauty is objective, then God has a reason to give us a sense of beauty so that we might recognize this objectively important and good thing. But if beauty is subjective, God still might have a reason to give us a sense of beauty. For it might be that the sense of beauty leads us to activities that are valuable. So theists can actually accept a number of the evolutionary kinds of stories you might give about social cohesion, mate selection, healthy food, relaxation, etc. And they can add a further story about the religious pull of art, which pulls us to recognizing divinity. So even if evolution can give a partial explanation, evolution plus theism can give a better one. You might worry a little bit. What if beauty seduces us away from the good? Maybe that's a reason for God not to give us a sense of beauty. I think it's outweighed, but it's worth thinking about. And the third argument. The third argument is the most straightforward one. It is the one that actually most people who are drawn by beauty to God make implicitly or explicitly. It's, why is there so much beauty around us? Vast beauties like galaxies, tiny ones like atomic structures, structural ones like laws of physics, abstract ones in mathematics. But also there's another aspect that is a little bit less thought about. Why are there any beings capable of appreciating, creating, and uncovering beauty? Here we get back to evolution and fine-tuning. Well, there are many reasons for God to make there be beautiful things and to make us be capable of accessing them and seeing them as beautiful. Beauty points beyond the everyday and draws us to God. It's objectively good, arguably, and so is its appreciation. And even if it's not, it's an innocent pleasure, and innocent pleasures are good, and God wants us to have goods. Um, perhaps very importantly, God wants us to do good science, and yet he has made a world where beauty is a guide to truth in science, especially in physics. And artistry is good. So God is an artist, and artists, arguably, make things beautiful. Abstracta, on the other hand, are grounded in God, because God is ultimately beautiful, and abstracta are maybe aspects of his mind. So we would expect beauty in the world of abstracta if God exists. So beauty, I think, is more likely to be found, instantiated, 
and observed if God exists than if God does not, and hence it provides some evidence for the existence of God. I think the conceptual argument from beauty is in some ways actually stronger than the, the argument from morality. Why? I think the divinity theory of beauty is a better theory than divine command theory is. And I think they're pretty good non-theistic moral theories. But I don't think there are pretty good non-theistic aesthetic theories. On the other hand, subjectivism is more attractive for beauty than for morality. And moral reasons, perhaps, are overriding in a way that makes them more mysterious. So in some ways, maybe the argument from beauty is not as strong as the moral, moral argument that is more familiar to us. On the other hand, the argument from the sense of beauty, I think, is stronger than the argument from the moral sense, because the evolutionary benefits of a moral sense are much easier to find, while those of beauty are much more mysterious. What about the problem of evil? There's an analog to it, and it's the problem of ugliness. And it sure looks like there are things that are ugly, as you can see. More, so design arguments for the existence of God are weakened by arguments from evil, or maybe even overthrown, some people would say. Is the, the, are arguments from beauty similarly damaged by ugliness? I don't think so. It's a lot easier to give an Augustinian holistic solution to the problem of ugliness. Artists use ugly things as parts of greater works, and in the light of the whole, an isolated ugliness can be unimportant or even beneficial. Look at this ugly hand here, holding a stick. It looks like, I don't know, some kind of... Football, maybe? I don't know. It's a very strange shape, this hand. It's not much of a hand. But let's zoom out. Zoom out. And zoom out. There is actually a reason why the hand is so poorly formed. The hand is physically in the middle, in the central portion of the painting. If it was well formed and clear, it would draw our attention and draw our attention away from the things that are significant in the paintings. The two persons, the umbrella, the clouds, the light. It is important for this painting that the hand not draw our attention. So it is, very, it is very plausible that often beautiful things, sorry, that ugly things are subsumed into a more beautiful whole. In the moral case, this is a risky kind of argument to make, for it risks treating the suffering of individuals as means, treating them as means. It is risky, I think, to judge an artist untalented on the basis of a part, as the Monet painting showed. In much of the best art, the whole can overcome expectations coming from the part. But we can say this, an artist who has talent in a small part has talent. Look at the talent in this painting. But now let's zoom out. Wait, it's completely transformed. This picturesque town, somewhat grayish, is just background for this amazing dynamic uh, play of colors. The meaning of it has completely changed. The meaning, focus, we are focused on something else. The miraculous drawing up of fish. And yet, even from the part, we could see talent in the painter, even though we couldn't see the meaning of the whole. So we can more confidently make positive judgments on the basis of a part of a work of art than on the basis, whereas the negative ones on the basis of merely a part. So there's an asymmetry between ugliness and beauty. Sorry, between ugliness and evil. Arguments from ugliness are much weaker than arguments from evil. I think arguments from beauty do provide evidence for the existence of God. In some ways they are stronger than moral arguments and in other ways <clears throat> Thank you very much. And that was Alexander Proust from Baylor University, Waco, Texas.
I, I can see that Alex is already with us. I think it's early morning in, uh, in Texas right now. So thank you, Alex, for joining so early. And, and now we can kick off with the questions. There will be uh, three types of questions. First, questions from the audience on site, then questions from the participants on WebEx, and then I will read the questions uh, from Facebook and YouTube stream. So now let me pass um, um, the voice to the, to the second room to ask the questions from the participants on site. Are there any questions to, uh, to, to the lecture we just heard? Okay, I think we don't have it right now. Okay, thank you. There are not many people here in Krakow. Um, okay, so do we have any questions here on uh, on the WebEx from the WebEx participants? Any questions to Alex? I can see Daniel. Uh, please unmute yourself, ask the question, then Parker, and, and go on. Uh, thank you, Alex. I'll try to ask this question without waking this baby here. Um, and it's more of... Uh, I just want to hear your thoughts a bit more and on sort of the perennial worry about the participation metaphysic. Um, it seems like, I mean, from where I sit, everything is defined by participation. Everything is going to be defined by participation. Uh, participating in God in some sense. How, how, in your mind, do you avoid the collapse on the one hand, or else, um, on the other, just saying the phrase um, divine by participation is simply trivial? So, I, I mean, if there was some reliable mechanism by which we could all perceive the divine in everyone, say something like um, Vedanta meditation or something like that, well, it seems like there's at least going to be a phenomenological, if not ontological, monism there that's going to very strongly pull us in that direction. Um, but otherwise, at least it seems to me that the thing is defined by participation and is just loose speak. We don't really mean that they're divine in any sense. Uh, you know, if by divine I mean which creates which creates and sustains anything by participation. And, but if you want to say yes, then it seems like you're back to the pantheistic problem. So I'd just like to hear your comments on that, if that makes sense. Um, Daniel, um, I think we, we couldn't understood you, all of what, what you said, uh, because of the internet connection. So could you please type the question on the chat? Uh, I don't know, what, Alex, did you understood the question? I got uh, a sl a p portions of it, I think, but uh, most of it broke up. Okay, please type the question and we can ask another question. I can. I saw Parker having a question. Uh, yeah, um, thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay, um, mine might be uh, from what I caught very similar to Daniel's. Um, I'm wondering about the, the mechanism of participation and how this might avoid uh, what seems to be a possible collapse if you involve the doctrine of divine simplicity. Um, so if you had any thoughts on that, that would be uh, lovely to hear. Uh, could you explain a little more how you think uh, simplicity would lead to a collapse? Sure. Um, well, if the... Um, forms, so to speak, would be God himself. So if um, perhaps justice or beauty itself, uh, by, by virtue of the doctrine of simplicity, are simply God himself, um, it seems that things that we would want to uh, label as justice 
uh, would simply be God. Uh, so I'm wondering, um, because I know that the perhaps I'm unclear on the mechanism of participation and how to distinguish participation from justice or beauty itself. Yeah, so I do think that the view, the more I think about this, the more I think it's hard to deny that the view does imply that everything is beautiful in some way. Um, I think it implies that everything is, and this may be an answer in part to Daniel's, well, the parts that I heard, uh, that everything is beautiful insofar as it exists. Um, but there are going to be degrees of participation. And I think the diversity there is going to be on the side of creatures. We're going to have something like Aquinas's story that um, the simple God, though uh, simple and uh, his perfection is infinite, and can only be reflected in finite things through a diversity of things. So you, there will be many beautiful things. They will, but they will vary, I think, in the degree to which they are beautiful, because they will vary in the degree to which they participate, and participate in ways that are um, sensible to us. Okay. Um, so let me look at Daniel's question and see if. if could, could you please read it or should I read it for you? Just for the people who are not uh, present yeah. in the chat? Briefly, when you speak of everything being divine by participation, how do you avoid collapsing into pantheism on the one hand? Parenthesis. If there is a mechanism by which we can perceive our divinity by participation, this threatens at least phenomenological, if not ontological, monism, or triviality on the other, uh, i.e., if divine is identical with that which creates and sustains all things, I am, I don't think in any way, that which creates and sustains all, not even by participation. Hope that makes sense. Thanks. Okay, so that's that is actually a different question from the one that I thought I heard from the little bits that that came by. Let me think. Um, Yeah, so let's see. I don't want to have the divine here uh, be defined as that which creates and sustains all things. That, that I think, it won't help here. Um, I guess my favorite kinds of definitions of God are ones that God has all perfections. Um, and being creator and sustainer of all is... Uh, well, actually, maybe I, maybe I shouldn't say that. I don't like that. Um, the, being creator and sustainer of all is one of the perfections. I think it's a perfection that we participate in when we create things, in turn, sort of particularly relevant, in fact, perfection to artistic creation. The artist creates things. Um, and while we don't sustain all, so we don't create all, but we co-create some, and we don't sustain all, but we co-sustain some uh, in a very limited kind of way in which we help our neighbor to survive and, and keep ourselves in existence. Um, why call, now you're asking as a follow-up, why call that divine? Well, 
I should say I'm using, you know, divine here in this weaker kind of sense. I mean, this is not divine in the sense of being identical with God. That would indeed be pantheism. This is like, uh, you know, it's hot. I think it's a sort of somewhere between uh, the divine cheesecake that you might see advertised in a store window and uh, and the God became man that we might become God that uh, St. Athanasius talks about. I think it's closer to the second, but I think there is a kind of um, natural, true participation and natural way in which we can, we can say that we are all divine, or all things are divine, uh, that is no more pantheistic than Athanasius's claim, but doesn't involve grace in the way that Athanasius's claim does. So I think I th- there's there will be levels, and uh, the Athanasian kind of uh, participation in the divine will be a higher kind of participation. It's wrought by the incarnation. Okay. Um, um, Daniel, I, I hope it's, it is sufficient. Now we have a question from Martin. Yeah. Uh, actually, the question was partially answered by pointing to a kind, higher kind of participation. Because I actually was quite interested in what you said as repeating a path which was already followed in civilization and uh, which imbues, in a way, all our thinking about art. Because what you say about participation showing up relies on Platonic view that beauty shows itself and shows through itself the formal order of things. And this idea was followed up by Neoplatonics, especially by Plotinus on the one hand, and on the other hand by later Platonics like Hermeticists, and they reached quite a different idea, quite a different conclusion. Their conclusion was idolatry, proud idolatry, because when this world is formless, when form as participated is shown in the sensibles, then when we add form, when we create something like, not a mark, but a beautiful statue, which participates in the forms that make up the divine order of the world, then this is a kind of not only more beautiful, but a more divine thing. And in the Asclepius, the Hermetic treatise from 2nd century AD, most probably, it's clearly said that when we make a statue, this statue is divine and may be worshipped and serves us as God, because it participates in the divine. In in a sense, this statue is like Lenny Rittenstahl's movie. It participates in the divine order of this world, the created order, it adds more order when we see chaos, and then it is used as a kind of tool of moving this world around. Is it really or magically for, uh, uh, for uh, hermeticists or through people's mind in, 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 the view of, in the view of ideologists? In any way, this kind of participation, the participation created order, points only to created gods. This is my problem. So you need to define this higher kind of participation very precisely so that it's not a kind of participation such as Platonic defi- uh, defined it, which is a participation very similar to participation if in laws of nature, when you have one law of gravitation, which is in deep level, a purely mathematical law ruling, uh, ruling the quarks. And when, where this law imbues every point and informs every point of reality being all the same, the one and the same law. This law can be viewed as divine because it's more stable than us, but it's not God. So a participation in beauty of God must be different. It's my point. Yes, so 
That's very interesting. And I, I agree that there is a, a danger there, something in, I thought about including, but it didn't for, I think I didn't because of issues of time is this question whether they're part of the problem of an interesting aesthetic aspect of the problem of evil is the way that um, beauty can lead us to focus on the creature in a way that distracts us from the creator. And I think that's a real danger. We see, we see that in idolatry to some degree. So I don't know how much, like in literal idolatry, I don't know how much of it is in fact a focus on the beauty of, say, the statue as much as on, you know, I mean, some of the, some of the, some idols are in fact not that, be not very beautiful indeed. Um, and many non idol statues are much more beautiful than many idols. Um, but it can be uh, beautiful and can draw us away from that. But we also see it in things like uh, the way that um, the beauty of nature can draw people away from God, away from love, even love of fellow human beings. Uh, you've got like the radical environmentalists who would like there to be no human beings at all and who are uh, not recognizing uh, the, the, the greater kind of, I think, beauty that is found in, in human relationships. Um, so I think there is a real danger there. Um, I think the danger, though, does in fact suggest that does provide some confirmation for a theory on which uh, beauty is a divine participation, uh, precisely uh, because it's, um, I think, early in the morning for me. Um, well, because it shows that we are reacting to it. Uh, that people do in fact react to beauty as if it was divine. And I think the, the explanation of my story is going to be, well, they do this, but they lose sight of the fact that participation crucially has a pointing beyond as a kind of, uh, you know, the, it does point, it's divine by participation. And, and it's not like, um, you know, so, so in, it is a little bit platonic, but, is, but, but it is more like the Platonism of Plato than of contemporary analytic philosophy. So in contemporary analytic philosophy, when things participate in a form, there's, they've got all of the reality there. So a green thing is just green. Or for Plato, you know, the, the things that participate in the form, they're reminders of this much greater reality. And then all the forms are sort of, other than the form of the good, are reminders of the form of the good. Uh, so there, in Plato, we do have some of that pointing beyond. We may lose some of that uh, in uh, the Neoplatons. I think it's still there, this pointing beyond. And I think it's the pointing beyond that we need to safeguard. No, just one remark, very short. In Neoplatonists, actually, you need to go beyond that level. It's one of steps that lead beyond created order or the generated order. That's all. Alex, any response to that? Um, I will de I will defer to Marcin on uh, the the history there. Okay. Um, two. We have also a few questions from the stream on YouTube and Facebook. Um, let me just briefly ask them. Uh, the first question is: God and beauty. What a fantastic lecture! How beauty is changing our relation with God. Alex, would you like to 
Would you like to? <laughs> I'm not this? sure what to say. Uh, I mean, in a variety of ways. I was focusing on the positive ways in which it draws us. It points uh, beyond this world and points, uh, and all beauty points uh, to God, and therefore it sort of is divine by pointing and divine by participation. But then uh, Marcin's question also points to the danger in which uh, we can, you know, you've got the pointing finger and then you can focus on the finger itself too much. And I think the right metaphysics of participation, which is something that I, I wish I had more to say about than, you know, just what one gets from a superficial reading of Aquinas, say, um, I think is going to give a good balance to there, but that's a future project. Okay, uh, one or two questions more. Uh, the question from Balint Bekefi, is also, he's also our speaker. Uh, why think there is an underlying commonality shared by such diverse instances of beauty? In example, abstract mathematics and art. Can't the category beauty be a merely contingent semantic phenomenon? I think it's a... Uh... So you could have a disjunctive account of beauty on which it's, uh, you know, there, there's beauty one, beauty two, up to beauty n. I think uh, that faces the same kind of problem that we have, that we would have in the theory of mind if we said, okay, what is pain in humans? It is the firing of sea fibers. What is pain in Martians? Well, it's, it's uh, the activation of some other kind of brain structure. What is pain in uh, Vulcans? It is the activation of some other, some yet other brain structure. And uh, what is pain in intelligent computers? It is a certain kind of computational state. Uh, and there's something, there's something missing about in that account. And one of the things that's missing in it is a, an answer to the question of what pain is in species that we hadn't thought of yet. And I think there is such a thing as a beauty, as a type of beauty. I think it's very plausible given the diversity in, in beauty and the way that our minds can be opened to new types of beauty that we have not yet experienced. Uh, that, um, and then we say, oh yes, of course, that is beautiful too. When our eyes have been opened, for example, uh, a lot of people have, uh, do not experience mathematical beauty. Uh, ever. And some of them, they can when they have an excellent teacher, an excellent mathematics teacher who opens their eyes to this uh, new form of beauty. And they say, oh, yes, of course, that is beautiful. Uh, and I don't think they're thinking this is like, uh, it, it's, it's just another disjunct. Then there would be uh, something arbitrary. They've discovered something. This is also a form of beauty. And it seems, it, it would seem to me very implausible to think we've discovered all the forms of beauty and now we have the dis and the beauty itself is like the disjunction of all the ones that we've discovered so far it there has to be it has to be a concept i think that can apply to things that we have not discovered perhaps are even unable to observe okay uh thanks very much and the very last question from the stream is do we need God to define beauty and ugliness? Do we need a concept of creator for it? So in philosophical language, is it, do we need theism for the aesthetic theory? Um, I think you already sh did shed some light on it, but you could, could you please answer to, to this? Yeah, I, need is a strong term. I was arguing that this is a good theory of beauty, that it has some difficulties. I think its main difficulty is the the one that, that came up already in the questions, namely that it has the danger of making everything beautiful and has dangers of triviality, as in Daniel's question. But it's a good theory. 
all the others are not so good. I do not have, I think, are not as good. Is it, do I have, I don't have an argument that it's the only possible theory. Um, and even within the theory, as far as it goes, I don't, I haven't given an argument and I don't yet have a great argument that it has to take a theistic form, that it couldn't take a deistic form or a pantheistic form or maybe a panentheistic form. So I, I'm actually not sure what the difference between panentheism and uh, theism is. Um, so I think there could be other kinds of um, ex-theism kind of uh, theories that, that it would work with. So I myself am a theist. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for, for the talk, for the lecture, and for answering the questions. I'm sorry we can't ask all the questions for now we're going to have a lunch break. Uh, Alex, again, thank you for joining us. I know it's uh, six in the morning in the Waco, Texas now. So have a good day, <laughs> good morning. And uh, I invite all of you to, to have a break. For those who are here on site, I, I invite you to the lunch. And if, to the others, please have a good lunch uh, at home. <laughs> and please, um, we'll meet at three o'clock in Polish time to have a session three and four at the same time in two rooms. Uh, for the session three, please stay in this room. It will, it will, uh, it will remain as it is. And uh, for the session four, please go via link to hear uh, something about Polish Christian philosophy. Thank you very much. Have a good lunch.
Hi, Tony. How are you doing? Good. Uh, we will wait a couple minutes more, and we can start in five, ten minutes with the first lecture of the session three. Just waiting for the people to, to connect and make sure streaming and everything is, is going. Sorry, sorry, Tony, I, um, you, you should unmute yourself. Um, okay. okay. It's good to meet you online. Yeah, finally. Okay, um, a few minutes more. Uh, hi everyone, just three minutes more and we will start with the first lecture of the, of the session three. Okay, ju just testing whether YouTube uh, YouTube is working properly and Facebook stream. Hello, Alex. Good to see you here. Hello, Parker. Uh, hello, Anthony, Sylvia. Okay, it's working. Thank you. Um, I 
Peter. Hij gaat ook in de wist, Mr. Peter. Oh, uh, Oké, okay, just testing the microphone. Father, could you just say something? Raz, dwa, raz, dwa, raz, dwa. Mówi się, mówi się, słychać? Can you hear me? Not really. Okay. Okay. Oh. Mm. Okay. 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 Can you hear us? Yes, yes, Tony. Confirmation. Thanks. Um, okay. Uh, oh, there's another confirmation. Okay. Yeah, that could be to each other. Teraz jestem... A nie jesteś. Nie, teraz mam miód. Tak. Ok. Um, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome back. After the lunch break, we will just start session three. A few technical issues for those who joined. Uh, I have one request only. If you are, uh, if you would like to just show us your face, that's good. Thank you. And the second request is to unmute yourself during the lecture, uh, to mute yourself during the lecture and unmute if you will have a question. Uh, we will start the session number three with Father Darius Dankowski from Jesuit University Ignaciana Mi Krakow, a Jesuit. And uh, Father Darius will speak about discern justice and discursive justice in dialogue. So now um, Father, Father is with us on site and we will have a lecture and then we will have questions from the people on site, from WebEx participants and from the streams. Um, okay, Father, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, good morning everybody. Can you hear me? Okay, so there's a contact. So uh, my name is Darius Dankowski. I am a Catholic priest. As you can see, I belong to the South Poland Jesuit province. I do teach philosophy, social philosophy, and Catholic social teaching at the Jesuit University Ignatianum here in Krakow, in the place of this conference. Um, the goal of my presentation is to present the idea of discerned justice, which is the module of justice rooted in the spirituality and pedagogy of Saint Ignatius Loyola, the 16th century founder of the Jesuits. Probably you never heard before this term, the discerned justice. I will try first briefly explain what, what is the meaning of this term. And next, I want to examine the legitimacy of this kind of justice in public debate within a constitutional democracy. Uh, therefore, I will refer to the conception of public reason by John Rawls and to the ethics of discourse by Jürgen Habermas. Uh, is my speaking okay? Everything works. Okay, so let's go to the first point, discerned justice. The pastoral documents of the Society of Jesus, the Jesuit order, do not offer any specific theory nor conception of social justice. However, Ignatian spirituality and pedagogy, when combined with the principles of the Catholic social teaching and the practice of recognizing the signs of time, introduced by Vaticanum Secundum, make room for creation of a module of discerned justice. Briefly speaking, discerned justice is 
the concretization of the ideal of social justice presented in the Catholic social teaching. Deserved justice is the set of general principles, maxims, and judgments directed to respect rights of individuals and social groups and to strengthen the participation in the common good based on the spirituality and pedagogy of St. Ignatius Loyola, on the principles of the Catholic social teaching and on the deciphered signs of time in the meaning of Vaticanum Secundum. So there are five analytic elements which structure this module of justice. Three substantial elements, like apostolic priorities of the Society of Jesus, the principles of the Catholic social teaching, like the common good, solidarity, subsidiarity, personal dignity, family, preferential option for the poor, ecology, and third, the deciphered signs of time. And there are also two quasi-procedural elements of this uh, module, the method of Ignatian pedagogy, which includes five domains, context, experience, reflection, action, evaluation, and second, the rules of Ignatian discernment. Uh, Jesuit pastoral documents do not offer academic definition of social justice. Nevertheless, they present various significant aspects of justice and the most blatant examples of injustice in contemporary world. Among those aspects, they point the problem of poverty, oppression, violence, abandonment, human rights, racism, ecology, preferential option for the poor. While none of these ideas are unique to Jesuit thinking, application of these ideas is distinctively Jesuit. Uh, and now we go to the discernment, the process of discernment. As Father James Martin puts it, for the Jesuit, discernment means something more than wise judgment and the ability to choose carefully. It is the heart of prayerful decision-making that uses specific spiritual practices. The Jesuit tradition of discernment is rooted in the spiritual exercises, the classic manual on prayer written by St. Ignatius Loyola. Discernment for St. Ignatius means being aware that God wants us to make good decisions, that God will help us make good decisions, but that we are often moved by competing forces, ones that pull us toward God and ones that push us away. We feel, for example, pushed and pulled by a variety of inner forces, selfish versus generous motives, free versus unfree motives, and healthy versus unhealthy motives. So discernment is the ability to see clearly what those forces are, to be able to identify, weigh, and judge them, and finally to choose the path most in line with God's desires for you and for the world. It takes into account the richness and complexity of a person's life and most importantly, assumes that God is active in the decision-making process. As Ignatius says, the creator deals with the creature directly. How does one discern? <clears throat> there are many practices and methods outlined in the spiritual exercises. Let me highlight some general ones. First, you try to be indifferent. That is free of anything keeping you from following God's desires. For example, if you are discerning whether or not to visit a sick friend in the hospital and you are overly worried about getting sick, you are not free. Something is preventing you from doing a good thing. Indifferent does not mean that you don't care, but that you are free to follow God's desires. Second, you ask for God's help. Discernment is not done on your own. You need God's help to choose the right path. You also need to reflect on the gospel and church teaching as a way of starting with a good foundation. That is, you would never discern if you should murder someone. All this is done in the context of prayer. But the intellect is fully engaged as well. And this is an important point. Third, you weigh the various movements within oneself to see which may be coming from God and which may be not. 
or someone progressing in the spiritual life, says St. Ignatius, the good spirit will bring support, encouragement, and peace of mind. Think of someone who decides to forgive another person and who feels a sense of calm consolation when they think about it. The opposite is true of the evil spirit. That spirit causes gnawing anxiety and throws up false obstacles designed to impede one's spiritual progress. Usually this manifests as the voice of selfishness. In the case of the person seeking to forgive another, the evil spirit will say, if you forgive, people will see you as a dormant. Interestingly, says Ignatius, for the person going the opposite way, from good to bad, things are reversed. The good spirit is not encouraging, but instead wakes you up with a start. That's the sting of conscience. The evil spirit, by contrast, is encouraging of bad behavior. Don't worry, keep stealing from your company, everyone does it, go on. The person who is experienced in discernment soon becomes adept at identifying these often subtle movements of one's heart. Fourth, if there is no clear answer, you can rely on other practices, each suggested by St. Ignatius. You could imagine someone in the same situation you are and think about what advice you would give him or her that can help lessen the influence of our own selfish desires in the discernment. Or imagine what you would want to tell Jesus at the last judgment. That doesn't work for every decision, but particularly for complex ethical decisions, it can be clarifying. Or think of how you would judge your decision on your deathbed, so in the last minute of your life. This helps prioritizing what is more important in your life. There are more rules. I skip some of them because of the shortage of time. This module offers a unique kind of balance between the general principles of justice and equity, traditional epikeia in the Aristotelian sense, which is also translated sometimes as reasonableness, restrictive interpretation of positive law based on the benign will of the legislator who would not want to bind his subjects in certain circumstances. Um, the process of discernment is both intellectual and spiritual. The question is, can we express its conclusions in public and universal terms, just in the public debate as it happens in the society? Let's analyze the case of Catholic parish activists who advocate welcoming of refugees in the town, putting the burdens on the whole local community. They are motivated by the commandment of Christ's love. Christopher Eberle speaks about the overreadingness of religious obligation, meaning by this that the obligation to obey God is the most important obligation for religious people, such that in case of conflict between that obligation and some other, they must opt in favor of obedience to God. Design justice can mitigate this tension by creating a unique balance between general principles and commands, and equity, I mean epikeia, in particular context. And now how we can see this kind of the process of discernment and the discerned justice in the public debate from the perspective of deliberative democracy. I want to briefly reflect to the public reason of John Rawls and discourse ethics of Habermas. John Rawls presents his revised version of the proviso of public reason as follows. The first aspect of public political culture is that reasonable, comprehensive doctrines, religious or non-religious, may be introduced in public political discussion at any time, provided that in due course proper political reasons and not reasons given solely by comprehensive doctrines are presented that are sufficient to support whatever the comprehensive doctrines introduced are said to support. According to this conception, religious truth has to be translated into political values. People arguing from religious premises to political conclusions should sincerely believe that other people might reasonably be expected to endorse their reasons from their own points of view. 
citizens are not required to accept one another's conclusions because reasonable people may disagree about what is the most reasonable combination in any particular case. For the public, political culture is bound to contain different fundamental ideas that can be developed in different ways. This was quotation from political liberalism. Rose believes that political liberalism treats both religious and secular doctrines in the same way. Reasonable people might order political values in various ways and come to various conclusions. Those who oppose abortion because of religious convictions should be ready firstly to present their background and secondly to present their view using political values and reasonable way of ordering them. These values are respect for human life, respect for women's rights, and the ideal of social procreation. And the same works both for those who oppose abortion and those who are pro-choice. Similarly, those who advocate a welcoming of refugees because of religious convictions should be ready to present political values, human rights, solidarity, global peace, humanitarian arguments. The religious genesis of political convictions does not violate the principle of reciprocity. Those who advocate welcoming refugees in their town can still engage public reason at any time, as long as they refer to fundamental ideas that are themselves seen as implicit in the public political culture. And now I go to Habermas. I skip the introduction. Um, Habermas proposes an institutional translation proviso according to which religious citizens should be allowed to express and justify their convictions in a religious language if they cannot find secular translations for them. Habermas holds that religious citizens in such cases do not have to replace their religious arguments with secular arguments, though they should enter into the process of translation. So they should speak in open way from their religious perspective, counting that everybody will participate in this translation process. Religious citizens can fully express their comprehensive views under the condition that they recognize the institutional translation proviso and trusting that their fellow citizens will cooperate for accomplishing a translation. Of course, there is a risk that religious voices will remain untranslated, which happens. But this should not discourage religious citizens, because their statements are important, both for their own participation in the public life and for other people in the learning process. Nevertheless, this expression of religious views has structural limitations. In the end, laws will still have to be passed on the basis of secular reasons. And this is the difference comparing with John Rawls' conception. Habermas declares that there is a need for a filter, such as will translate a white political speech into more formal language of the kind that allows only secular contributions to pass through. The parliamentary rules must empower the House leader to have religious statements or justification expounded, expunged from the minutes, from the agenda of, of, of the floor. In Habermas' proposal, a state law would never be based on religious reasons alone. Religious arguments can only become a part of coercive law <clears throat> if the necessary translation already occurs in the pre-parliamentary domain. Concluding, Habermas' proviso seems at first glance to be more inclusive and more open to religion than Rose. One, religious activists advocating welcoming of the refugees in their neighborhood might be, however, misled. In Habermasian model, citizens are aware of the institutional filter which sets a condition on the legislative process and obviously affects the learning process Nevertheless, in Habermas' view, all citizens can be expected not to deny from the outset any possible cognitive subst substance to these religious contributions. This, this might sound very promising for religious citizens. 
However, this might be often ineffective, counterintuitive, and highly contingent in reality. Citizens make this effort despite the priority that secular reasons enjoy in the political arena. Thus, the success of the Habermasian model rests very much upon a voluntary acceptance of the learning process by citizens. So, coming to the very conclusions, both Rawls and Habermas stress the value of achieving stability for the right reasons, of achieving integration via constitutional values, and of reciprocity of expectations among citizens. The translation proviso cannot work fully if it is not accompanied by the requisite changes in mentality, which makes the whole conception counterintuitive and highly idealistic. I argue that the module of deserved justice can satisfy the proviso of public reason, according to John Rawls, while at the same time the satisfying of the Habermas institutional translation proviso might be more complicated, even though Habermas tries to offset the asymmetry between religious and secular statements, it's still very contingent and can be not fair in certain cultures, even in highly uh, developed democratic society. The model of deserved justice offers a way of learning process in a more complex sense, including spiritual, pastoral, and educational perspective. For example, this model brings new values to public debate, like pride, humiliation, forgiveness, atonement, repentance. The Zen justice goes beyond ethical and juridical analysis. It is open for spirituality, economy of superflux or superabundance, for example, introduced uh, um, by Ricoeur, integration of experience and action into reflection. The deciphered signs of time receive a sort of gravity power. They are the source of consolation. Communal discernment presumes listening to the voices of all those who are affected by the subject of discernment. Naming of the signs of time allows for the inclusive language and referring to the cross-cultural values, at the same time stressing the spiritual experience might be the sort of exclusive approach. And conversation about this experience is the matter of further dialogue and further discernment. Thank you very much for your attention. I can see the signs of Mr. Speaker, so I end up. I will be very grateful for your comments, for your questions, for your statements. So I press. Uh, thank you very much, Father Darius. And now we will kick over with the, with the questions. Uh, first, the questions. Yes, questions um, the on site. Okay, I have to remove for a moment. Uh, click on the screen. Okay, thank you. They will hear my voice. <laughs> uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I was, ah, I, I was uh, very interested uh, by this question: how to discern uh, which among our decisions uh, comes from God and uh, which do not. Uh, it, this question interests me personally at this moment because when I was going to Krakow, uh, my flight was cancelled, and uh, uh, there were colleagues, uh, parents, uh, relatives, uh, friends who uh, were saying that. Probably God doesn't want that you go to Krakow. Uh, so, uh, in uh, and I, uh, I found another solution. I uh, found uh, tickets for bus and the combination of trains. Uh, but and I came here. But uh, according to the teaching of uh, Ignatius Loyola, uh, what could justify my decision to come here? Okay, okay. Well, thank you. And another question uh, related to this question. Um, uh, now we have COVID-19 uh, inf infection, yes. and uh, th this, th this infection, uh, in your, uh, not in your opinion, but according to the teaching of Ignacio uh, Loyola, uh, how to interpret uh, correctly, uh, from his point of view, uh, the reason why we have this infection, uh, probably God uh, wanted people to, um, wanted to teach people uh, something important, uh, and uh, wanted to change their mode of life, uh, or not, or, or it's just a punishment. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for these questions. Merci beaucoup. Uh, first question is a very deep question, and people spend sometimes their whole life to answer this question. What comes from God? What comes from not from God? From uh, evil spirit? Um, according to Ignatian spirituality, there are some signs of confirmation that I'm following God's path. For example, my inner peace, feeling of peace in my heart. Next, good relationship with all my friends and family. People who are spiritually balanced, usually they uh, get alone with people around them. Um, yes. Also, if I keep consistency in my choices, I'm not changing the most important choices of my life from Monday to Tuesday, from Tuesday to Wednesday. If I am a balanced person, consistent if my uh, personal choices, this is another confirmation that I'm following the, the right path. But also uh, in Ignatian spirituality, what is recommended is the spiritual guidance to have a spiritual director who can talk with me and can objectivize my movement of my heart, of my soul. Speaking about COVID, uh, I think St. Ignatius Loyola would skip partially this uh, answer and would say, uh, this is uh, God's mystery, uh, this is a providence, and we cannot judge it. However, he would be more talkative in terms of freedom. Uh, am I free to visit my sick friend uh, under the circumstances of COVID? Of course not. Uh, COVID changed uh, our sense of freedom when, uh, and our fears, our fears, because we have to respect the facts. This is such a dangerous uh, pandemic that. Excuse me, but yeah. I did visit my sick friend Robert Gillish. Uh, we could speak uh, on, uh, on WhatsApp, and mm -hmm. I was looking at him through the window. Okay. So we can. Uh, find uh, this was the specification of these questions, uh, but. Uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, the, the confirmation comes both from our, our heart and the relationship with the world. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm ready for other questions. I press mute. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, now we can move to the questions on WebEx. Uh, one or two questions. I can see that we have questions on YouTube stream also. So one or two questions. The quick one, please. Uh, to Father Darius on this on this concept of social justice, is it social justice? <laughs> is there justice? Okay, Alex, I can see raising hand. Just please unmute yourself and ask the question. So, so Father, um, what I found a really interesting connection with the roles in Habermas is that normally when we think of religious reasons, we're thinking of ones that are statable in language, and that at least, if not public, they are sort of semi-public in that they are accessible to other members of the religion, and who may translate them or at least will understand them themselves. But it's kind of interesting in the discernment models, we've got these reasons that cannot be expressed to others, except in sort of vague terms like, hey, Jesus wouldn't, wouldn't do this, or from the point of view of my deathbed, this looks like the wrong decision. Okay, can one make use of uh, reasons like that as a legislator or as a voter? Okay, now, can I talk now? Thank you very much for these questions. I was thinking about this dialogue with other religions when working on my another article specifically about discerned justice. In this model, there are some inclusive and exclusive elements. What is inclusive is referring to the signs of time. If we observe what happens in the world, respect for human dignity, for human rights, uh, for the, the role of women in contemporary world, uh, all the emancipation and the liberation movements. This is something uh, that we can talk with people of different cultures, different worldviews, and also different denominations. We can come to sort of overlapping consensus, 
and we can feel a sort of consolation even if we use different names for this spiritual movement we we can all feel for a moment happy from different perspectives as jews muslims atheist catholic protestant people when we see that something really good happens in the world the end of war, uh, the end of uh, uh, racial segregation, uh, whatever, then we can, we can come to bridges over cultural and over denominational. However, what is uh, exclusive in this model of design justice, it is not only intellectual, it is not like uh, natural theology, like theodicea. It is a combination with spiritual experience. So someone really has to be moved in his or her heart in making the, in making the decision. However, let me give you just an example. In our Jesuit high schools and at the Jesuit universities, we do not employ only Catholics and only practicing Catholics. Sometimes we do welcome scholars who come from different cultures and different religions. What is the point? Do they identify it with our mission? And this is the discernment process. Will be the good colleagues and good workers together with us, even being not Catholic, being uh, Jewish, Muslim, uh, Protestant, uh, and coming from different from different denominations but i think it is very very wide problem uh, and this this would be the point for further discernment and further work how to make the results of discernment more accessible to other religion i think what might contribute to this topic is the highly developed interreligious dialogue today and the work of theologians uh, who spent much time and energy to make this dialogue alive. Does it answer your question? I was actually more wondering about the, the reasons that, that are, cannot be communicated even within one's religion, because different people will have a different judge because the, you can just put it into these vague terms uh, that are meaningful to oneself, but will not uh, have the same meaning to others. So from the point of view of my deathbed, I see something uh, as the right decision. From the point of view of yours, you, see, you may not see it that way. I, I agree. I agree. It happens very often that within the same religion, we have, for example, conservative Catholics and liberal Catholics, and sometimes they don't have common language when arguing with each other. However, what is helpful here in the context of my presentation, the political philosophy can contribute also to inner religion dialogue. For example, public reason of John Rawls, it is like looking for common language and common values among people who are divided. Sooner or later, even if the country is 100% of one denomination, people start to get divided uh, under different uh, uh, criteria. Some are more conservative, some are more uh, liberal, some are more pro-European, some are skeptical about European Union, sometimes are pro-ecological, some other are moderate about ecological issues. And sooner or later, we realize that even within our own church, we need sort of overlapping consensus and sort of, let's say, public reasons to talk with each other with respect. So in this case, even if we can, if we, if we have difficulties to find the common language in our own church, sometimes I think the, the proviso of public reason can instruct us, can be the key opening something in us what is closed, what, what, uh, what is the problem in our communication, even in our communion. Uh, but then discernment, uh, I have no time to present all the rules of the so-called communal discernment. Uh, 
Uh, this is another topic when people gather together, they precisely pick up the topic, they talk about procedure, about the methods, they present all the pros, all the cons in absolute freedom, and they, they pray, they gather together and they share until they all agree that we are on the same side, that we, we are quiet, that we follow the proper path. I think I should end up. Um, okay, um, thank you, Father Dariush. Uh, I have one more question, a very brief answer, please. The question is, uh, I don't understand the concept of the justice you presented. Is it Habermasian, is it Rawlsian, or is it yours? So I guess the question is whether, what, what is exactly your contribution, where Habermas, where Rawls ends, and where your concept starts? Uh, okay, brief answer. My very contribution is the desert justice, because I tried to make the synthesis of Ignatian spirituality, Ignatian pedagogy, Catholic social teaching, and the science of time, and uh, I introduced this new term, the desert justice. So this is it's not that I started from zero as Daniel Jankowski, but I made this kind of synthesis. So this is my contribution. And Rawls and Habermas are the, the sources of the concepts when we are talking about public debate. And this is uh, for me useful um, to take from them their ideas and to, uh, to test the same justice in public conversation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Unmute. Okay, uh, thank you. I hope it satisfies the the people who who are interested with this. Thank you very much, Darius, for the talk, Father Darius. And uh, now we will, we can move to our next speaker, which will be uh, no Parker Parker Haratine from University of Saint Andrews. Hello, Parker. I can see that you are with us. And Parker will give a talk on Augustine's theory of illumination, a case study of faith and reason. So um, I will now display the, the lecture of Parker, and then we can have uh, questions. Please keep the questions in your mind and ask them after, after the lecture. Mm -hmm. Mm, oh, not this one. Sorry. Uh, okay. okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to this talk. I've entitled it Augustine's Theory of Illumination, a Case Study of Faith and Reason. Augustine's confessions contain beautiful passages on the roles of reason, faith, and knowing God. Yet it is not immediately clear from this picture whether there are two distinct ways to know God, and if so, what distinguishes them. At times, Augustine writes as if there is a philosophical way to know God, a way which relies upon discursive reasoning and is unaided by special grace of revelation. He writes of how he saw that which is, and how philosophical literature enraptured him, though was incapable of fully capturing him because the name of Christ was not there. At other times, Augustine makes apparent a theological way of knowing God, a way where faith and God's special grace or revelation are necessary. He writes how he received a divine command in the garden to pick up and read scripture, how therein was the name of Christ, how his heart is affected, and even later, how the spirit is the means to truly see and love God. This talk aims to clearly draw out Augustine's use of faith, reason, and God's work to know God. I propose to use Augustine's theory of illumination to better understand this distinction of faith and reason, terms that I will use as signposts for the theological and philosophical ways to know God. A theory of illumination pertains to how one knows things with respect to the cognitive process. process. It is a theory of illumination because the response to this involves external illumination of the cognitive activity at some stage. In short, I argue that the metaphysics of cognition and illumination mean the mind can know things philosophically in a certain way. To determine the mind's capacities to philosophically know things is to determine the philosophical methodology of knowing God. If there is an alternate way of knowing God, either the philosophical way collapses as untenable or there is an alternate way. This distinction is precisely what one sees in the confessions, though. 
The distinction of faith and reason as we use it postdates Augustine. To think that Augustine would operate under the Enlightenment agenda of starting from no assumptions, or nil, is anachronistic. Instead, Augustine readily recognizes his reliance upon epistemic capital, borrowed belief, and trust. As the scholar John Rist notes, Augustine recognizes a variety of brute facts to be believed. Other beliefs, such as mathematical and logical truths, where understanding precedes belief, and still other types of truths where belief precedes understanding. So to be clear, I understand and distinguish the philosophical way by its reliance on discursive reasoning and lack of reliance on special grace and revelation. The philosophical way will render knowledge in the second category where understanding precedes belief and is limited in its scope. The theological way renders knowledge in the third category of belief where belief precedes understanding and is broader in its scope. I will first discuss the theory of illumination, second, the philosophical one, and last, the theological one. A theory of illumination is defined by the way it answers the following question. What does it take for the human mind to regularly complete some or all of its normal cognitive activity? Occasional, special, or mystical thoughts and experiences are beyond the scope of this. A single instance would otherwise be definitive for regular cognitive operations. The theory can account for some or all of the following four cognitive activities. The process of cognition, the information of cognition, the insights of cognition, and the certainty or justification of one's insights and information. It is a theory of illumination because in opposition to naturalistic explanations, something extra illumines the mind in at least one of these stages. Minimally, Augustine's theory maintains certain types of conclusions and insights come from God, and types of information come from God. Regarding the first, certainty of conclusions and insights, Augustine states, when it is a question of those things which we see by the mind, that is, by intellect and reason, we are speaking of things which we see as present in that interior light of truth by which the inner man is enlightened. He also writes, about those things which are understood by reason, we consult the interior truth. So when it comes to the intellect, Christ as inner truth gives certainty of belief and therefore knowledge. The intelligible realm is distinct from the sensible realm. A person can have certainty of sensible objects or state of affairs by virtue of their presence. A person has certainty about a full moon by looking at the moon, though only belief if they hear about the moon. This means that Christ as inner teacher consistently gives certainty about types of truths, ones within the intelligible realm that the intellect discerns. Just as Christ as inner truth gives certainty in the intelligible realm, so too does God as inner Eternal truth illumine the information from the intelligible realm. And on the teacher, Augustine writes that one learns by the things themselves which are manifest from God, disclosing them within. He reiterates this and on the Trinity, we contemplate inviolable truth by eternal ideas. As is common, I will take Augustine to mean that the eternal types are in God's mind. Some argue that this theory of illumination philosophically compromises Augustine. Lydia Schumacher neatly articulates the concern of various scholars. Quote, where the divine light interferes with the cognitive process, it precludes an account of the way knowledge is acquired through the ordinary process of discursive reasoning and so seems to overtake the work that is technically proper to the mind. While interesting, I do not think this concern is entirely problematic. A theory of illumination and cognition both must account for how the mind regularly completes its four normal cognitive activities. Though Augustine's theory requires divine aid, what matters is not that it receives divine aid, but that this divine aid is common and regular for all persons' cognitive activity. While the mind's activities are not fully its own, the mind is always engaged in the process when it receives this aid. The divine aid treats the cognitive activity as, at most, a precondition and, at minimum, a concurrent condition. 
One can consequently treat this as a closed system insofar as there is no special intervention and the cognitive activity is consistent. Indeed, this is generally how Neoplatonists executed their theory of domination. One can consequently treat the mind with all its cognitive activity and illumination as capable of knowing things philosophically. Earlier, I minimally defined thinking philosophically as a reliance on discursive reasoning and a lack of reliance on special grace and revelation. Augustine's sketch of the mind's cognitive activity and illumination clearly checks both of these boxes. Because the theory of illumination pertains to cognition, this means three, that it is the intellect and not the will that is working to acquire this knowledge. One can also anticipate that, four, the scope of this knowledge is limited by that which is available to discursive reasoning without special revelation. It is important to note the relation between the mind's philosophical capabilities as a metaphysics of mind and the philosophical of way of knowing God as a type of epistemology or methodology. My claim is an entailment claim. If the mind operates as and consists of X, and X serves as a constraint on what one can know, then it follows that the mind can only know things in terms of X. The metaphysics of mind harnesses the epistemology. Naturally, therefore, one can expect the philosophical way to know God to be distinguished by the very same characteristics. And if the philosophical way does not abide by these parameters, the distinction collapses, or there is another way to God. Augustine uses the philosophical way to know God in On Free Will and the Confessions. In On Free Will II, Augustine maps out three categories of existence, which lay the grounds for his argument for God's existence. These three categories are existence, life, and understanding. He writes, Therefore, a nature that only exists and neither lives nor understands, such as an inanimate physical object, is inferior to a nature that only exists but also lives, but does not understand, such as the soul of animals. This nature is in turn inferior to one that at once exists and lives and understands, such as the rational mind in human beings. From this hierarchy, Augustine argues that God must be greater than reason. This eventually develops into a type of ontological argument for God's existence and comprises several minor theses and arguments. One, that intelligible objects are mind independent. Two, that intelligible objects are immutable, eternal, and incorporeal. Three, that intelligible objects are greater than reason because they judge reason. And four, that intelligible objects are a unified single thing. As the scholar MacDonald notes, Augustine's initial strategy in On Freedom of Will II appears to rely on the assumption that what is higher than reason must be God. But this assumption quickly develops into the familiar view that God is something than which nothing is higher. Or, to put it formally, X is God if and only if X is more excellent than our minds and nothing is more excellent than X. The entirety of the process in On Free Will is one of discursive reasoning, does not rely upon special grace or revelation, and is executed by the intellect. The type of God that Augustine discovers is abstract, cool, and discarnate. Augustine attains nothing more than propositional knowledge of God's existence and his invisible. What happened? No. I think that no, not Hi, really. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, Thank you. what time have we finished? Around The Spirit's grace is necessary to properly recognize goodness of things, and this work is special. This theological mode of knowing is broader in scope of content that is believed by faith prior to full understanding. This theological mode also relies upon special grace of revelation and assurance. 
and is more affective in nature. Using God's work prior. Is this the right moment? Um, okay, I'll. Their scope of tenants. Their scope of tenants. The garden had been made. The garden had been made. I was not able to keep my vision fixed there. Beaten back by my own weakness. Which earned my own husband's places. Taking nothing with me. Taking nothing with me. But a loving memory of what life is for me. Taking nothing with me. But a loving memory of what life is for me. Taking nothing with me. But a loving memory of what life is for me. That I could smell but could not yet eat. Here, Augustine indicates he had not taken the Eucharist and remained weak. His intellect saw a beautiful, though limited, picture of God. His invisible attributes, that which is. His coordinates with the method and on free will on all four marks. Discursive reasoning, no special aid, the intellect, and limited knowledge. The accounts are clearly philosophical accounts where understanding precedes belief. The theory of illumination helps us understand the philosophical way of knowing God because it sketches how the mind can philosophically know things, what exactly is meant by philosophical knowledge of God, and the scope of what knowledge one can attain of God without special aid. Where the philosophical way exhausts the mind capacities, the theological way expands to encompass God's special work, a turn of the will, and faith in a broader scope of tenets. The Garden Passage of Confessions 8 is exemplar for the theological way. Augustine directly hears a revelation from God when the children chant Prole Lege. Indeed, it was a divine voice commanding him. He picks up the text and lets it speak to him at its own pleasure. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in its lusts. As soon as I reached the end of this sentence, the light of assurance was poured into my heart and all the clouds of doubt melted away. Augustine further confirms that he is the passive recipient of God's work, saying, For you had so turned me to yourself. So this includes God's special work, a turn of the will, and faith in what he knows. God's light of assurance pours into his heart and mind such that Augustine believes in God's work prior to fully understanding it. Confessions 13 repeats the importance of divine aid and how the will or heart knows God. Augustine writes, God would not be loved except through the Spirit whom he has given, because the charity of God has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. The Spirit is necessary to fully see and value God. Augustine elaborates that it is through the Spirit that we see whatever in any way has being is good, for it is from him who does not have being in just any way, but is who he, but is who is. Echoing the Hebrew scriptures, it is the I am who serves as the basis for all existence and correlating goodness of such existence. The Spirit's grace is necessary to properly recognize goodness of things, and this work is special. This theological mode of knowing is broader in scope of content that is believed by faith prior to full understanding. This theological mode also relies upon special grace of revelation and assurance and is more affective in nature. The garden experience does not merely add propositions to the repository of knowledge about God. It also involves a turning of the will and consequently interpersonal knowledge. While the theory of illumination sets parameters for what the mind can philosophically know, the theological way complements this and addresses what is outside the scope of the mind's philosophical capacities. Augustine's theory, therefore, sets a type of starting point for the theological way to pick up at. It is clear from the text that Augustine holds two different ways to approach knowledge of God. It was unclear, however, what the exact features of each were. I draw a couple of entailments about God's work here. Christ as inner truth is necessary to know about God. Yet Christ is insufficient to enter into communion with God and to know of Christ. For Augustine, both Christ and the Spirit are necessary to enter into communion with God, to know God and to see God as Christ in his fullness and interpersonally. For people who require a turn of will and the Spirit's special aid to see God properly. 
Augustine's theory of illumination helpfully sketched out some basic parameters for philosophical knowledge of God. With these parameters set, the theological way complements and completes the picture of ways to know God. This is not to say that either supersedes the other, or even at the moment, to determine whether and in what ways these could be mutually exclusive. Rather, it is to say that Augustine's theory of illumination helps one to understand the beautiful drawing. Um, thank you very much, Parker, for this talk. Now we will start with the questions. Do we have questions on site? No, please. Okay, we have one question from Father Darius. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, thank you very much for this presentation. I have a question, um, like confronting uh, the ideas of illumination. A famous German theologian, Karl Rahner, introduced the term of anonymous Christian, uh, someone who lives out of Christian tradition. Uh, however, he or she is the person of love, is able to love his or her neighbor uh, also with divine love, not with just uh, human friendship. And how would you relate this conception with this modern interpretations of uh, illumination uh, theory? Because I guess uh, they don't get along with this traditional uh, uh, idea of illumination. Um. So to be clear about your question, you're uh, stating that Carl, one of Carl Rahner's idea is that people um, who perhaps haven't been converted uh, live within the Christian tradition and act out of love. And uh, you're wondering the possible correlations between the theory of illumination and that. So this would be like in, incompatible uh, terms. Oh, I am. Um, I was attempting to clarify the question. Um, are you asking the compatibility of someone who is who is not a Christian uh, yet lives within a Christian culture uh, and acts in a loving way, and the compatibility of what I'm saying with that idea? Yes. Okay. Um. I mean, it, seem, it seems that the person who is uh, acting within a Christian tradition, yet is unconverted, so to speak, um, can be acting according to God's common grace. Um, and in, insofar as that could be true, I, I would say that there's a type of correlation. Um, one would want to say that it's a common grace that the person is tapping into and not a special grace. Uh, typically, uh, by my lights, I think special grace uh activity happens more uh, within the tradition where people have been converted. Okay. Thank you very much. That was a question from Father Darius. Uh, we can move to the questions from the from our second dimension, which is Webex uh, Webex participants. I see that uh, John. Hello, John. John has a question. John, please unmute yourself, ask the question, and please mute again. Thanks. Good morning. Thank you, Parker. I enjoyed your paper very much. I'll be saying some of the same, going over some of that area you've covered as well in Augustine Confessions, Book Thirteen, but. I'm a little troubled by the way you presented it. If I want, to, it, it sounds as if I think you're drawing too strict of a distinction between that initial way of reason and then the way of faith. And the reason would be if we follow Pope Benedict's interpretation, where he says truth is a gift, like hope and charity, so that he he even re refers to. 
on free choice of the will, that Augustine's discovery of truth is more than just an abstract disincarnate knowledge. Now, I agree it, it needs to be more incarnational to go the full distance, but it brings an effective resonance. There is a joy in truth. And I would just compare the ascent in book seven with the ascent in book nine, that they're almost exactly the same. What grace brings is a more steady grasp and living with the truth. So um, would you agree with that statement? Um, in part, uh, in part, I would I would agree that grace does bring a sustained participation in this truth. Um, I want to maintain, however, that there, uh, the scope, perhaps, of the truth is larger uh, when uh, one does have that sustained grace. Um, Augustine states in Book 2 of the Confessions that philosophical literature just didn't do it for him because Jesus' name wasn't there. Um, and there are explicit, um, there's an explicit lack of uh, the name of Christ uh, as well as many other names of God aside from kind of the abstract classical theist names when you find in Book 7 as opposed to Book 8 and 9. Um, so I'm trying to maintain that there's this turn, that there's something larger in scope uh, in addition to being sustained by grace. Okay, um, thanks. Is it, does, it, does it satisfy you, John? Or? You know, uh, almost. You know, I just would recall that in the City of God, he does single out Plato and say he had the true religion. He uses that word. He has the true religion because he knows the true God, and he knows the Logos, not as Christ. So I do think the Platonist don't fall under that statement in book two that that you're mentioning but that's that's just fine tuning I, I really think you're you're on to a great point here and I would leave it at that thank you thank you thank you John thank you Parker I have a one uh, we have time for one more question uh, so we will leave it to Daniel and then I will uh, pass to you the question that I received from YouTube stream okay? Um, so, Daniel, please raise your question. If this, uh, I've typed it because I have a bad connection. If it's too similar, we can, I can go to the next question too. So if you just have a read, we can skip over it if it's largely what John just said. Okay, um, Daniel uh, asked his question on the, on the chat. Uh, okay. so, um, so you can see it. And he says, I'm curious about what looks very much like a Neoplatonic mystical ascent in Confessions 9, right before Monica dies. In your view, is this part of the philosophical way, for example, as its apex beyond discursive reasoning, as in Plotinus, Plotinus? Some aspects of the theological way, um, also perhaps its apex, as in someone like Eckhart, Hugo St. Victor, etc., or is it maybe a third way? I'm keen to hear your thoughts. Perhaps there is a third way according to Augustine. Um, I mean, I'm open to to the idea of there being a mystical ascent um, insofar as um, the text does lend itself to that. I wouldn't know the necessary parameters to demarcate that at the moment. Um, I wouldn't say that it would supersede or take place of the philosophical way or the theological way. Um, I think the text is lending itself in those ways as well. I would just need to find a little bit more uh, data to uh, outline the parameters for what a mystical way might be. Okay, thanks. Um, I, I sent to you the question that I received on the stream, so you could, so after yeah. after the conference, you can you can just uh, read it, and we will move to our next speaker. For the time is short. Um, so our next speaker will be um, Evelina Deineka from University Paris, 8 um, Saint-Denis. Uh, okay, um, so Evelina will give a talk on the philosophy of mind, um, defining human consciousness through the concept of oneself as another, from the history of Christian thought to the contemporary 
philosophy of mind. Um, so Evelina is with us. Um, I'll, I'll you Just, just, just say a few words. I'll check, check if you are hearable and visible on screen. Yes, do you hear me? It's okay? Do you hear me? Can you hear me? No? Not yet? Yes, 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 yes they can. And simply the last thing is this window. Oh, simply. Okay, they can hear you and they can see you, so just go ahead, it's the 16 minutes, please. I will give you a sign to finish. Okay. What to begin? Uh, I don't need to do it. Um, that's fine. That's fine. Go ahead. <laughs> Hello to everybody. Uh, I will. Uh, my presentation will be dedicated to the notion of uh, intersubjectivity, uh, revisited and reconsidered within the uh, tradition of uh, Christian philosophy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, about uh, what this notion could bring uh, to the philosophy of mind. Uh, in recent years and decennies, uh, there were a lot of debates in sciences, in philosophy, in social sciences, in anthropology, in linguistics, biology, cognitive sciences, uh, and especially in neurosciences, about the problem of defining specific nature of human consciousness. Uh, where this problem comes from? The matter of the fact is that starting from 1970s, uh, the application of new technologies and research paradigms in sciences resulted in unexpected empirical findings and brought revolutionary changes to the existing picture of the world. In this context, centuries old cultural stereotypes and uh, rational convictions started to be questioned and some of them uh, have been profoundly reconsidered. One of the most affected and criticized representations became the uniqueness of human mode of experiencing the existence compared to those of non-human animals, but also those of humans with severe mental disorders uh, and even those of artificially created humanoid robots. Coupled with the great uh, 20th century uh, social, political, and economic upheavals, such as world wars, local armed conflicts, and revolutions, genocides, and humanitarian crises of unprecedented scope, they both listed shifts in scientific and philosophical views on what means to be a human being, put focus uh, on the categories of identity and alterity, and resulted uh, in particular in liberalization of individual re religious experience. Uh, the, that is to say, more attention started to be paid to individual peculiarities of spiritual experience, to plurality of such experiences, and namely uh, in practicing religion. This new state of continued dialogue between religion, philosophy, and science generated uh, the following fundamental question. Is ontotheology uh, onto still possible in 21st century? And if so, what scientific and philosophical grounds uh, it could be based today? Uh, since, of course, the dialogue uh, of religion with science and philosophy seems inevitable within contemporary epistemological paradigm. In this connection, and uh, taking into account that a large part of the present conference is dedicated to 
Polish philosophy. Uh, I would like to quote my friend, Polish philosopher, Price, the professor of Academy Ignatianum, a specialist in Paul Ricoeur's philosophy, philosophical hermeneutics, uh, Robert Grzywicz. Thus, in his introduction to the collected text of Paul Ricoeur, uh, Nazwaj Boga, the name of the God in English, uh, here arises uh, the following question. Is the sphere of pluralistic co coexistence of a large variety of religious discourses, uh, is it possible to ind indicate, at least for an individual human subject, any rational approach to the problem of priority of this particular religious discourse uh, that is his own? Uh, through birth, education, cultural affiliation. What to do with the randomness of such personal rooting in a variety of religious discourses? Uh, does this case still fall under some rationality? Finally, what kind of talking about God, if any, is still possible today after the devastating critic of the great uh, theodicy and me metaphysical traditions of the West, especially all kinds of ontotheology? And he adds that in particular, none of these and similar questions were indifferent to such a uh, Christian philosopher as Paul Ricoeur. Uh, as for Paul Ricoeur himself, he is known as the author of one interesting concept, oneself as another, uh, soi même comme un autre en français, in French, uh, which he coined in his eponymous book edited in 1990, Titled in French, I, I have already said. Uh, in this book, he wrote that uh, I will not give all the quotient, uh, only the final. Uh, well, I will read it. Uh, one will readily grant that there is no place for a straightforward concept of otherness in Aristotle. Will Christian agape? be sufficient to do justice to it? Or will we have to wait until the idea of struggle spills over from the field of politics to the field of interpersonal relations, uh, transforming as in Hegel's phenomenology of spirit, the contemporary conflict of this, uh, of the splitting of consciousness into two self-consciousness? Or is it only in our open day that a thinker like Levinas dares to reverse the statement, no other than self without a self, substituting for it the inverse statement, no self without another who summons it to responsibility. Uh, another well-known contemporary philosopher, Polish philosopher, um, specialist uh, among other different subjects in philosophy of mind, uh, rector of Academy Ignatianum in Krakow, Professor Józef Bremer, uh, in his uh, quite remarkable book, uh, Interdiscipli Interdisciplinarne Znaczenie Nernauk, in English, Interdisciplinary Significance of Neurosciences, published in 2016, uh, discusses the results of an interesting research work in which uh, the authors attempted to find neurological correlates in brain for the process of experiencing God uh, through the prayer. Uh, so he said, uh, I will not quote, uh, all the abstract, uh, only the final lines. These results support the hypothesis that religious subjects accepting the existence of God and expressing gratitude to him activate areas responsible for social cognition during prayer. Uh, it is then said in this research that praying God uh, is an intersubjective experience comparable to interpersonal interactions. Uh, indeed, uh, this uh, intersubjective component of human spirituality probably could allow to get access not only to the intimate experience of sacred, uh, to the mystery of prayer in particular, but also to the specific nature of human consciousness. It seems that uh, after the devastating critique of the great theodicic and metaphysical traditions of the West, Christianity provides philosophy, especially philosophy of mind, and probably even sciences indirectly, uh, with a new fruitful paradigm based on its fundamental revolutionary and unique, compared to other religions, idea of unity of all humans with God and each other through the figure of Christ. 
as it is said in the Bible, I do not pray for this alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, uh, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us. And the glory... Sorry, this is the slide. Yes. Uh, and the glory which you gave me, I have given them, uh, that they may be one, just as we are one, I in them, and you in me. Uh, John 17, uh, 20, 23, 23. The novelty of an extended contemporary philosophical interpretation of this canonic Christian dogma uh, consists in developing it in the following double aspect. Uh, the first point is another as oneself, which gives empathy, compassion, moral uh, imperatives, uh, altruism, equal uh, deontology for all humans, anti-essentialism and plural pluralism, uh, liberalization of otherness, uh, unconscious, uh, projective, or voluntary legal extension of these principles to other human-like uh, entities, like animals, uh, natural environment, robotic entities, with uh, artificial intelligence, uh, so-called uh, concept of um, social robotics. And another aspect is oneself as another, uh, inverse uh, term, uh, which uh, uh, is related with specifically human properties, abilities, and features um, qualitatively different from supposedly similar phenomena in animals uh, uh, or in systems with artificial intelligence, such as language, cognition, social relations, and others. Of course, scientific researchers and even philosophical considerations would not serve directly to build a new ontotheology on the basis of extended interpretations of human intersubjectivity, but they can defend the thesis of uniqueness of specifically human mode of being. Yeah, um, in the world. Uh, here, once again, I would like to quote uh, Professor Josef Bremer, who emphasizes. Uh, the fact that even the most sophisticated neuroscience cannot tell us anything about God because the object of brain research is man, not God. However, uh, the problem of questioning human specificity and uh, searching for scientific and philosophical arguments in favor of qualitative uniqueness of human nature, na human mind, human consciousness is far from being different, indifferent to uh, Christian theology. Thus, I would like to quote in this connection um, a recent uh, article titled Human Specificity and Recent Science, Communication, Language, Culture. The authors of the article remarked that recent years have, been, have seen the uh, publication of a great uh, many books dealing ex uh, explicitly with the issue of human specificity, human uniqueness, the difference, specialness, and so on. They stress the idea that this is a trend that cannot be overlooked either in the scientific sphere or in interdisciplinary contexts, such as study of science and theology. Indeed, theology itself should not uh, remain indifferent in such developments, namely in these three uh, directions. But, how, however, uh, there are other opinions, and uh, on the other hand, recent years have been marked by an enormous number of scientific and philosophical publications which defend the idea that the difference between human and animal consciousness and among those in different species are just qualitative, uh, quanti quantitative. Sorry. Uh, some sc scholars, even like uh, David Dubrovsky, uh, even argue that at least in future some robotic entities could acquire all necessary features that would allow to assimilate their artificial intelligence to human consciousness. Almost all traditional arguments in favor of human uniqueness uh, have been refuted by recent scientific findings. Uh, animals uh, are able of logical thinking, creating elementary abstract categories, uh, creating and manipulating tools, uh, communicating with others using rather developed science systems, 
uh, demonstrating empathy, um, compassion, altruistic behavior, exploring actively the world, uh, uh, and so on, uh, developing rather complex hierarchical uh, social relations, ritualized behavior, uh, li even lying, manipulating and imitating others, uh, simulating, disguising themselves, uh, and even recognizing themselves in the mirror. Uh, but uh, if, if we uh, look at these researchers, indeed, uh, there is some similarity. And uh, I ask myself, what could be the ultimate um, criteria uh, to uh, distinguish animal consciousness and uh, human consciousness? Why robots, uh, because it seems obvious that robots uh, can't replace man, that uh, the artificial consciousness can't be uh, comparable with the consciousness uh, of humans, but uh, what it could be, uh, this principle. Uh, and there are um, scholars who uh, are not agree with this interpretation with their colleagues. Uh, for example, Herbert Terrace um, argued that uh, shims can't con uh, have conversation and uh, uh, apes uh, can't recognize themselves in the mirror, so uh, it's not so obvious. Uh, so, intersubjectivity, and um, as a conclusion, I, I could suggest this ultimate criterion uh, in a curious way, the concept of oneself as another coined by Paul Ricoeur, uh, opens an extremely rich perspective to multidisciplinary questioning about specifically human way of being in the world, and in particular about the uh, distinctive features of specifically uh, human forms of consciousness. Uh, that is to say that only humans are able to uh, speak with themselves, to uh, maintain internal dialogue. And what, what does it mean? It means that uh, we are able to integrate in our subjectivity uh, another person. Uh, animals are, are not uh, able of this, and it is very difficult to imagine uh, technical systems, robotics, uh, robotic entities. Uh, it, it, it is not clear how to uh, create this. Turing uh, suggested uh, 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 child machine, um, but he, he tried to, realize, to uh, bring to reality this project. He couldn't because uh, to bring to reality this project he had to recreate man. Uh, thank you for your attention. and then have a discussion. Thank you very much, Evelina, for, for this talk. And now do we have a questions. We will start with the questions on site. Uh, yeah, Father. Okay. Okay. Um, so do we uh, we'll change the... Uh, the direction. Do we have any questions here on uh, WebEx participants? I see that John has a question. John, just please unmute yourself and, and ask the question. Thanks. Yes, thank you for that presentation. And I, my question is, is back to the beginning and the question about Aristotle and otherness and just a resource that I, I don't see picked up on, and that is there's, there's an acknowledgement of the sociality of animals, but I, I, I'm not aware of the evidence of politics as such among animals. That is, Aristotle's account that there is, in fact, a way in which we must come to acknowledge the other as other politically to establish a common good, and that this is done not just through the rituals or socializing or bonobo swapping of favors, but it is the use of speech to establish a standard of justice, which is then a matter of common deliberation. I, I guess I just don't see the 
I, I acknowledge all these other great discoveries, but I, I, I see the political life as something still distinctive and something that requires our attention in a global society today uh, to deal with politics as politics, not reduced to other kinds of explanatory features. That Does that make sense as a question? Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, I can give you two uh, resources. Well, I'm not. Uh, I will not speak about political uh, po politics because uh, I have no uh, references. As, as you have said, yes, I, I I can't provide you with references, but I can provide you with uh, uh, references to researchers uh, which uh, um, treated about. Uh, creating a kind of culture by cats. Uh, and uh, I, I can send you uh, an abstract from uh, uh, one conference uh, in um, Copenhagen, Copenhagen in uh, 2016. Uh, it was, um, th th this conference was organized by International Biosemiotic Society. Uh, and another reference which I could give you, it is uh, uh, a book uh, by uh, Pauline, Pauline Delaye, de, de, de Laye, Pauline Delaye, uh, it's my colleague from Paris uh, 4, uh, linguist. Uh, she wrote uh, recently, last year, she published, published a book, uh, and uh, her thesis, doctoral thesis, was dedicated to this problem. Uh, so she tried to show that uh, she, she found, and she, she uh, discusses in her, her book, uh, one research dedicated to the re ritualized uh, uh, behavior in elephants. Probably you will be able to find this reference on YouTube, because I, I remember he, uh, she showed me um, a kind of funeral uh, uh, ritual actions uh, in elephant in community of elements uh, elephants uh, so but but the question is uh, uh, are we projecting something from our own experience of our social experience of our political experience of our cultural experience on animals uh, and uh, this uh, t t uh, Herbert Terrace uh, whom I quoted uh, he uh, says that it seems to us, that animals have this kind of behavior, but we can't be sure there is uh, an um, epistemological gap, ga gap uh, because we can't know what it means for animals. Uh, how do they experience these practices? Uh, so uh, the classical viewpoint uh, in biology is that uh, it is instinctive uh, behavior. Uh, uh, there is a stimulus and uh, the main stimulus, it is um, uh, food or some instinctive sexual behavior and so on. Uh, so it's not clear. But now the democratization, the liberalization of otherness uh, extended, uh, it, it tends to extend our representations about our culture, about our uh, mode of life uh, on other categories of uh, entities, of subjects uh, like animals, like ro robotics, because you know, uh, many people are speaking about their computers uh, like about their friends or uh, human beings. Uh, so. Uh, it, it, in my opinion, it is very important to find uh, some uh, 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 criterion which would be recognized by scientists, by philosophers, and by uh, religious people who, uh, which uh, would uh, uh, maintain uh, the idea that uh, human beings are have a particular status, that is to say, uh, there is uh, a qualitative difference between uh, human consciousness and all other possible um, types of consciousness. Thank you. I would like to receive those references uh, sometime. Thank you. Okay, I have, I think we have a time for one question more. Uh, Tony, please unmute yourself. Thanks. 
Thank you for that presentation. It's uh, fascinating, and uh, it kind of links a little bit to what I'm going to be offering in the next segment. But um, I, I wanted to ask you, do you have any um, reference or research regarding feral children, children who are not uh, raised by another human being, have been abandoned in some ways, and th their lack of development um whereby they they perhaps don't recognize themselves as, as human and they don't have the, the those characteristics that you describe as unique to human beings. Uh, yes, thank you very much for this question, brilliant question. Uh, and I thought about this question uh, because in my presentation, probably I, I had not enough time to put you all slides uh, for a long time. Uh, so. You have the notion of uh, f feral or um, wild or mildly uh, children uh, in my presentation. You, you can show. I, I don't remember this slide. Ah, this is the last, the last one. The last one. Okay. You, you, can just read it. you can just read it. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. But I, I will just read you. It was uh, in conclusions in the ne in the last slide. Uh, due to such internal alter ego, uh, which is being constructed gradually in ontogenesis, absent in young infants, feral, wild, mowgli children, uh, there are different ter terms, uh, feral children, uh, schizophrenic individuals, because we can ask ourselves uh, what is the difference between the consciousness of the schizophrenic individuals and not normal individuals, because th this liberalization of otherness uh, concerns also uh, very various, um, very different uh, types of otherness, um, and uh, in particular, uh, psychic di diseases. Uh, so, men mental uh, patients with mental disorders. Uh, so, uh, so, so I will read. You, uh, I continue. Uh, ensures our specific human self awareness, which uh, could not be assimilated uh, qualitatively with any other animal and uh, artificial intelligence uh, features. So, uh, speaking about uh, uh, feral children, it is very interesting question, and uh, in practical sense, uh, uh, because uh, the question is why, after some particular age. Uh, normally three, five years old, uh, it is impossible to uh, compensate uh, language, uh, cog cognitive abilities, uh, what happens in the brain physically, which makes impossible uh, to compensate this deficiency in uh, uh, adult uh, state. Uh, so this is a, a piece, uh, this is the way uh, which we can use to, uh, some suggestion for scientists, for biologists, uh, for uh, neuroscientists, uh, where they they should uh, search for this uh, point. And in my opinion, um, uh, such in, uh, such children uh, had not. Uh, this intersubjective experience, because animals don't have this intersubjective, human intersubjectivity. So children um, need to have contact with uh, people, with uh, at least one human who has already this inter human intersubjectivity to get it, to get it. And uh, if, uh, but then what is interesting that it, 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 it is possible to get it only under uh, some particular age, uh, three, four, five years. Why? This is an interesting question. And this could uh, potentially um, bring light, light on the question uh, where we should uh, search for mechanism of intersubjectivity uh, in the brain and how it is related to the construction of the mind, of the consciousness. So it's a very, very interesting question. Okay, we just run off the time. Thank you for, for the talk. Thank you for the questions. And now we will move to our next speaker um, to, to keep the schedule. Um, so our next speaker will be Anthony Bartlett from Bethany Center for Nonviolent Theology and Spirituality. 
and Tony will talk on uh, dynamic contemporary replacement of tradi for traditional Christian concept soul, relatio aliter quam esse. So, um, Tony, I will now display your lecture and I ask you all to keep your questions for the end and then uh, you will have an opportunity to, to ask them. Hello. The title of this talk is Soul as Relation Otherwise Than Being. Christian tradition has long been dominated by substance metaphysics. And while significant voices have been raised challenging this mode of thinking, actual church community and practice remain firmly wedded to this outlook. A key example is the soul a presumptively independent entity carrying individual human identity even after death. To replace this concept with that of relation and relation conceived as otherwise than being offers the possibility of a profound and opportune shift in religious existence. In classic Christian thought, the soul is immortal, separate in substance from the body and able to subsist without it, including the continuation of consciousness. In more popular terms, the soul is a projection of corporeal life, not immortal in the philosophical sense, but still substantive in some experiential sense, surviving the body in a reduced state as authentic residue of an historical human being. There are several pressing problems with these beliefs. To begin with, number one, a separate or separable substance surviving beyond death suggests another existential order than the material one, either a so-called spiritual universe above or a world or realm of the dead. These alternative orders seem antithetical to and in tension with the existence of flesh and blood physicality and limited human time and the historical need always to enhance life on planet Earth. In contrast, the worlds of the dead Valhalla, Elysium, etc., serve as a perpetual vindication of war and militarism, the place where the youth who kill and are killed in war live on in glory and reward. An alternative spiritual realm provides thereby an alibi for the systematic practices of human violence. Number two, philosophical de deconstruction has shown the soul to be a logocentric product of language in particular when connected to Socrates' thought of philosophy as the practice of death. In the Phaedo, Socrates, in preparation for his own death, claims that the philosophical life is a matter of focusing the soul in and on itself in separation from the body, and as such it becomes its own self-testimony of immortality. As Derrida says, the psyche as life as breath of life, as pneuma, only appears out of this concerned anticipation of dying. Even as it anticipates death, the soul holds itself back and avoids death. In this context, the soul also becomes the essential vessel of truth and one constructed by the philosophical tradition precisely for that purpose, but in functional separation from the body. Three, in parallel to the above, mimetic anthropology tells us that the soul is the cultural projection of mimeticism, witnessed especially in the practice of funeral rites, which repeat the responses and mythology of the surrogate victim. Every dead person is a victim, and so every dead person is somehow sacred and immortal. As Gerard pithily puts it, if every god ultimately is a dead man, then it becomes comprehensible that there should be societies in which no one dies without becoming a god. The immortal soul is, of course, very close to this logic. It is the dead person assimilated to the same mythological matrix which makes the sacred victim survive beyond death. Finally, four, from the perspective of church life and spirituality, the substantive soul 
becomes an object to be possessed and insured in a specialized banking system over against the threat of eternal loss and torment rather than a vital relation to and within concrete human existence. Against this background, the substitution of a radical concept of relation in place of the soul becomes a necessary philosophical intervention. The meaning of soul is nothing but the tensile relation of human life to all life, including paradoxically, but integrally, the end of life. Developing this thought of relation allows us to make emphatic our human responsibility to the world while confronting human existences negation in the event of death. To demonstrate the concept of relation, I shall turn briefly to a reading of Heidegger's Fourfold, interpreting it through a decisively Gerardian lens. The thought of fourfold is the product of Heidegger's mature or late thinking, sometimes seen as the third period of his work. What is exceptional is the way it moves beyond strict ontology, the thought of being, looking instead to a relational structure of the world in itself. This emergence is remarkable for a philosopher who has spent his life devoted to the question of being. Of course, his previous thinking is not abandoned, but there is no doubt Heidegger's phenomenology has moved to another key altogether. The fourfold consists of earth, sky, divinities, mortals, all connected in a revelation of the nature of the thing. These elements are relations which contribute to the disclosure of the thing. And we can say, therefore, that what we call a thing is relational in its essence. Earth is the ground of phenomenality, the bearing up, in Heidegger's language, of all things from a groundless ground. The sky is that which allows their appearance, the necessary space or clearing in which the ground appears. The realm of divinities is the point where appearance becomes meaningful, where some kind of message of meaning is given, providing what elsewhere might perhaps be called the semiotic. With the, the mortals, we are in the familiar Heideggerian territory of death as the disclosive temporality of Dasein. In the Brahman lectures, Heidegger says mortals, those who die, are the essencing relationship to being as being. Namely, it is death which creates the essential relation to being. We can now look at these latter two elements, divinities and mortals, as a phenomenology of relation as it arises in what we call the human. In this way, we can identify relations that have served to produce the, the, the thematic of soul. Namely, the soul has always been seen as the seat of human meaning and understanding. And as already outlined, the phenomenon of death is the constitutive event of the soul. Looking first at the latter theme, we know from a Platonic or Gostinian perspective, the death of the body is the supreme moment where the soul realizes or fulfills its independent existence. From a Gerardian perspective, however, we should say it is the death of the other which constitutes the soul. The phenomenon of the immortal soul is in parallel to and intrinsic to the immortality of the sacred victim. Turning next to the theme of meaning, we know that the surrogate victim is itself the primordial moment of abstraction, of non-instinctual relation, which is the relation of meaning as such, classically conceived in and as soul. Thus, what for Socrates would have been remembered truth by the immortal soul, in Girard is first myth or the misrecognized truth of murder but nevertheless still the grounds of intellectual order and at the same time, as said above, the origin of the soul's immortality. The soul in this sense is the effect of the murdered other, bringing simultaneously the primordial space of meaning and the cult 
of the human immortal. The relation of divinities may be best understood as the medium by, by which this primordial meaning is spread in and through the totality. Looking at the Heideggerian formulation, as Andrew Mitchell explains, the divinities not only allow for communication with the divine, but for the communication of meaning as such. The divinities ensure that meaning can reach us. In Gerardian terms, what is being spoken of is relation in and through the sign. Given that the victim necessarily produces the formal sign, the moment that there is a recognition and repetition of the original murder. Heidegger expresses this, this meaning in terms of something he calls the wink or the hint, a language which very deliberately avoids the use of symbol, sign or metaphor, which, which belongs for him to the distinction of sensible and non-sensible and thus the domain of metaphysics. From the perspective of semiotics, a wink or hint is much closer to sign than Heidegger realizes. A sign always needs a further interpreter. It is in its own way always a wink that needs an explanation, in which case the divinities are the realm of infinite semiosis, the multiplication of human meaning from its original anthropological basis. Mitchell adds an important elucidation. These hints are fragile, delicate, and easily missed. They could not exist at all were it not for the buoyancy of the medium that supports them. For Heidegger, this medium is the holy, that's Heiliger. Any conception of God, the gods, or godhood can only appear within the medium of the holy. The divinities are the messengers of this, informing us that hints in godhood are all tied to the medium of the holy that supports them. In other words, there is a medium of communication or relationality that gives us the divine. This fits very neatly with the Gerardian primitive sacred as the medium of religion, but it obviously extends beyond that, both in Heidegger and Gerard, in the development of culture and the system of signs and meaning generally. It is at this point that we can now interject the most radical consequence of our reflection. Hints or signs cannot be categorized or defined in advance, and there is always the chance that an inbreaking relation may transform the fundamental relation to death, which instigated the very thought of soul. Inasmuch as the, tr the transcendence of the victim can be transformed, by the Christian gospel from one of passive density of violence to one of active outpouring of forgiveness, then the core relation that we call soul, the founding relation to the death of the other, can become a relation of overflowing grace and freedom. The whole point of the gospel is, is that it radically changes the character of the sacred medium. Paul expresses this as Christ raised above all powers and principalities. From a Gerardian perspective, it is an anthropological shift at the root of our existence. In the respect of the soul, it means that the hinting messengers are not transactional quanta of grace doled out by an inscrutable other world, but the this-worldly impact of signs received by a being constituted by and for such signs and the relations they build and realize. All of Heidegger's plethora of language, insisting on the hints of meaning in a doctrine of unveiling, can be recruited to the inbreaking of the gospel, coming to a pre-constituted world of meaning to create radically new meaning. In parallel and coherently, the soul becomes itself the possibility of an entirely new core relation. In sum, the soul is first created by violence, and then it is remade by forgiveness. In this frame, it is not a substance, it does not subsist according to being, but it erupts into life as relation, 
as relation as such, first constituted by violence, then transformatively by love. In respect then of death, which was and is the core concern of the soul, we might say that the relation of love is its own triumph over death. To die in love is not to die at all. The inbreaking of the gospel promises not so much the survival of the immortal soul, but the final and yet still also personal triumph of this revealed relation. Okay, um, thank you very much, Tony. That was um, Anthony Bartlett from Bethany Center for Nonviolent Theology and Spirituality. I, I can see that Tony is with us. So if we have any questions, we can start from the questions on site. Would you? Okay, um, so we, we will start from the question on site. Would you please? Thank you for your presentation. Uh, uh, it, it's not really a question, it, it is uh, a kind of remark. Uh, I have uh, another friend, uh, Anna Leone, uh, who is studying an interesting phenomenon uh, in uh, uh, different uh, quarters in Naples, in Italy. And uh, uh, she she is anthropologist, f f f specialist in uh, philosophical anthropology. Uh, so she studies uh, a real social phenomenon, uh, which is being developed today, but uh, has a long history. Uh, people from different um, quarters um, choose um, local saints, uh, burnt in uh, medieval ages uh, or somewhere, they find um, tombs, uh, uh, tombs uh, the, the place where they were uh, bur burned, and uh, uh, they uh, be be began to consider them uh, as protectors. And uh, there are uh, discussions, meetings of alive people of neighbors, uh, but uh, these uh, meetings are organized around uh, honor they give to their saints. And uh, all, uh, every quarter uh, has his saint, his uh, um, uh, particular uh, holidays, uh, and uh, it is a very interesting phenomenon. It's difficult to find uh, explanation to this phenomenon, but uh, she uh, tries to reveal what, what uh, social conditions could lead to developing such practices. Uh, so there is some connection uh, with your uh, presentation. Well, yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Am I audible? Okay, thank you for that. Yes. Um, it will, uh, I, I was uh, brought up in England and moved to the United States um, about 20 years ago. And when I went back to Europe, it, it, and especially France and Italy, it struck me how many places were named after saints. In, in, in North America, there are no saint names in the towns. So it was immediately very, um, very impactful the way uh, locals, uh, localized settings were given their identity and meaning through these uh, persons, these special um, dead persons uh, who still live on in some fashion. And it's in that relation that, that, that these places then have their significance as localities. And something very different is the case here in North America, and it would take a long time to talk about that, but I think the whole point of uh, finding meaning in the other, and in especially in the dead other, other in this instance, uh, where whereby uh, th that distinctive human, human communication arises and human identity arises, is is very relevant. And I'd be interested in in that in your colleagues' uh, research. Thank you. Uh, 
Thanks for the question. Um, do we have any more questions? Um, John, yes. Could you please unmute yourself? Yes, Tony, thank you. I'm very interested in, in your study of Girard. And I just wanted to ask a question, pushing back a little bit on that one. I mean, deeper into the Girardian theory that, um, of course, prior to victims, there's always the mimetic rivalry. And I, I just finished this book by Girard on Dostoevsky, which is just very profound. And I thought the way he explains basically that there's a destructive kind of relationality that one has to work through, that mimetic rivalry of envy, and then there is the discovery of, of the act of love. So I just wonder if your comment, some on that, that need to um, work through the, the mimetic rivalry, and then in Christ, that discovery that one is under God free in conscience, not defined by um, the others whom have either, you know, taken your space or your identity or threatened your identity, but that there is a freedom before God in Christ to, to be a son or daughter of the Father and therefore act with some initiative to to give yourself. So uh, Gerard's quoting Dostoevsky, quoting the gospel, that the seed must fall to the ground and die. But that, I, so I guess I just, I, I like what you're doing, but I think the relationality, doesn't that need more explaining on, on that, that, that could be a bad thing if it's the mimetic rivalry without reflection. Absolutely. Thank you, uh, John, for the question. I'm glad you asked about Girard because I was conscious I didn't really introduce the thought of Girard. I just dived straight in. But yes, um, uh, Girard, it, his, his theory is uh, an evolutionary theory. It goes back to the very origins of humanity. Um, but the inter very interesting thing is that we repeat those origins in uh, in historical life, in other words, the uh, the primary scene of murder, which he 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 describes as the origin of uh, the, the distinctively human, uh, the collective victim becomes the first moment of non-instinctual attention. It gives birth to religion, the God, and and the transcendent. That we're re always repeating that. Um, in various ways in our wars and in our, our scapegoating, whoever we choose to be the, the current victim, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a very, it's an evolutionary theory and also a very current theory, you know, it's, it's, it actually describes our, um, our contemporary experience, especially, I think, in, in, in the West um, for all sorts of reasons. But anyway, um, what what then I derive from that, which which is kind of a little a step further from a step uh, that goes further than Gerard, is that the inbreaking of Christ, which is what you're talking about, the inbreaking of the biblical um, narrative and its and the humanity it describes, uh, and the relation to the divinity, which eventually culminates in Christ, uh, that we, we see, um, this introduces a completely new starting point. Um, and there, so there is that kind of Dostoevskyan choice that you have to make between um, the, the, the conflictive, rivalrous human being and the, and the possibility of a humanity founded in love, founded in giving to the other, of, of complete giving to the other, which is very difficult for us as humans, uh, but is modeled in Christ. And so in that, in the possibility of imitation of Christ, then this other humanity is born. So it is, it's, it's pivotal what you're, what you're saying there, that, and, and that description of, of a choice is pivotal. And what, what is very exciting for me in this research is that it gets away I mean, and this is probably fairly controversial in this in the setting of this conference, 
is that it gets away from a lot of the Greek inheritance, the the idea of um, of of uh, the divine of of the divinity is somehow constituted in this intellectual world in intelligible realities rather than in relational realities, which I think is what the which with the scriptural biblical tradition is doing. Uh, does that go uh, help to answer your question? Yes, yes. No, uh, Gerard has just been a remarkable uh, researcher, and I'm, I've been very moved by his writings, and the Dostoevsky book really, to me, was the best I've read of his yet. So thanks for your paper and your answer. It, it was quite good. Thank you. Uh, thank, you, thank you very much, Tony, and thank you all for the questions. Well, we need to move on to the to the next talk, uh, which will be our last talk in this session. Uh, I can see Francisco is with us. I think uh, it's a bit early in Houston right now. Um, so good morning. And we will start with uh, Francisco talk on... Christian philosophy as an existential habitus. So I will display the lecture right now and please keep uh, your mind, keep in mind your questions to ask them and have a discussion after having the lecture displayed. Hello everyone, my name is Francisco Plaza. I'm from the University of St. Thomas in Houston, Texas. And my paper today is a defense of Christian philosophy following Jacques Maritain's understanding of it as an intellectual and existential habitus. While many Catholic philosophers have advocated for Christian philosophy in the past century, particularly against the aggressive secularism of contemporary philosophy, there have been some, even within the Catholic sphere, that have questioned the possibility of its existence altogether. The typical challenge lies in the use of the term Christian. How exactly does Christian modify philosophy? Is it a separate branch, such as ethics or metaphysics? If that is the case, what is the object or scope of this science? Critics are quick to point out here the seeming absurdity of proposing a Christian mathematics or Christian biology. Perhaps it refers instead to a different method for engaging in philosophy. In this case, how does it remain as philosophy if faith is introduced at the starting point? Are the advocates of Christian philosophy guilty of covertly transforming philosophy into theology? At the heart of these questions is a matter of faith and reason altogether, how they are distinct and how they complement one another. In this paper, we shall propose Jacques Maritain's solution to these difficulties, as his explanation of Christian philosophy remains among the best on the subject. Maritain explained that the key to understanding Christian philosophy is to think of it not as a separate science, but as a reference to the existential state of the Christian who pursues philosophy. In other words, it points to the habitus of philosophy within the Christian philosopher as a person, which is a lived experience and practice of philosophy on the part of the Christian. This has more to do with the intellectual virtue within the philosopher rather than philosophy as a science in the abstract. Thus, while philosophy itself, as a science in the abstract sense, remains the same, the outcome is different depending upon the philosopher. And this is not because the science itself changes, but because of the particular differences and existential considerations on the part of the philosophers themselves. To be clear, by Christian philosophy, we cannot mean the assumption of precepts given by revelation, wherein they would form parts of the logical arguments offered by the philosopher. If we begin with revealed truths from a logical standpoint, there would be no true distinction between philosophy and theology. Yet, the Christian does, in fact, use revealed truth to aid in his understanding of truth as a whole. So, how is this to be reconciled? In his book, Science and Wisdom, Maritain wrote the following on the matter, quote, We need to distinguish the nature of philosophy from its state. 
In other words, we need to distinguish the order of specification from the order of exercise. Considered in its pure nature or essence, philosophy, which is specified by an object naturally knowable to reason, depends only on the evidence and criteria of natural reason. But here, we are only considering its abstract nature. Taken concretely, in the sense of being a habitus, or a group of habitus existing in the human soul, philosophy is in a certain state, is either pre-Christian or Christian or a Christian, which has a decisive influence on the way in which it exists and develops. Thus, when we speak of Christian philosophy, we are making an existential claim about the practitioner of the science, not an abstract claim in which we define a new science of philosophy. When the term Christian philosophy is challenged today, it is typically done by those who think of it as an abstract category, rather than in this existential state that Maritain is describing. The key is to focus on the philosopher, not philosophy as such. We can see a simple illustration of Maritain's point if we consider even the differences among our fellow philosophers in our own lives. Some of our colleagues choose to focus on ethical questions, while others are more inclined toward metaphysical ones. The impetus for such inclinations is in many ways pre-philosophical. When philosophers are asked why they chose to focus on one thing rather than another, they typically point to something within their lived experience outside of philosophy, properly speaking, which accounts for this. Consider then how much more these differences are magnified when comparing a Christian to an atheist philosopher. More importantly, from the Christian standpoint, there are certain truths which the atheist philosopher will miss precisely on account of these existential considerations. For instance, Maritain argued that only the Christian will be able to produce a moral philosophy adequately considered, that is, one which gives the complete answer to what moral philosophy seeks, namely, the true path to complete happiness or beatitude. The force of Maritain's answer, then, is not merely in accounting for the differences among philosophers of different faiths, but in his argument that only the Christian philosopher will reach a certain level of wisdom. To be clear, Maritain's claim here applies to sciences which have an overlap with, with religion based upon the matter being discussed. This is why there is a prima facie absurdity with a hypothetical Christian mathematics or Christian biology. The scope of such sciences, quantified matter and living matter, does not have a shared concern with religion, whereas philosophy, on the other hand, does. As Maritain explained in Ransoming the Time, quote, philosophy, however, though distinct from Christianity, is in interrelation with it and must deal with matters pertaining to religion if it is to understand and analyze concretely the problems of human life and human conduct, not after the fashion of any necessary requirement but after the fashion of a concrete and existential suitability. The natural manifestation of the eternal word, or logos, in which philosophy is rooted, in a certain sense, invokes a supernatural manifestation of the incarnate word, that is, Christ as logos incarnate, in which faith is rooted. We've added the Greek term logos here for clarification purposes, since... This was the original term used that calls to mind eternal truth, rationality, order, etc. Of course, in the Christian setting, this is linked with Christ himself in the Gospel of St. John. What this suggests is a connection between God, and especially Christ, with truth. Logos is more than just truth in being, but also truth through reasoning, the essence of wisdom. This is ultimately what philosophy is after, and what makes philosophy possible in the first place. Through Logos, then, there is a natural connection between Christianity and philosophy. 
Traditionally, it has been understood that the philosopher not only seeks truth, but also searches for truth that transforms his way of life. Moreover, the philosopher, as a lover of wisdom, will wish to make use of all available data in this search for ultimate truth. Professor Raymond Dennehy explained Maritain's position as such, quote, Owing to the limitations of the human condition, the imperfection of our understanding, the fact that we are confined to sensible things for our evidence, etc., unaided reason cannot in itself give us the ultimate and complete truth. Now, Maritain does not regard philosophy as a merely conceptual experience. It is for him a search for truth which, to the extent that it is discovered, transforms one's entire life. End quote. From this perspective, it would not make sense for the philosopher to ignore religious input, not for the sake of his arguments necessarily, but for the sake of his own never-ending search for the truth. Professor Dennehy continued, quote, if he, namely the philosopher, finds a source of higher truth or truth which he believes cannot be grasped by unaided reason, then just because he is dedicated to the truth, he incorporates it into his life. But if this higher truth cannot be grasped by reason alone, then it cannot, according to Maritain, be fused with philosophy, which relies on unaided reason to form a single unified discipline, end quote. This is in keeping with what we have explained prior, namely that the Christian philosopher incorporates revealed truth into his life and this has a natural impact on his thinking. But as a philosopher, it is not fused with philosophical arguments themselves unless these truths can be shown from the vantage point of unaided natural human reason as well. Essentially, this is the harmonious relation between faith and reason understood by the Catholic, with the end being that faith and reason must fly together as much as possible. Indeed, there are certain mysteries of the faith that require revelation, such as Christ's dual nature of God and man. And to some extent, these will elude most rational explanations. With that being said, the Christian, in particular the philosopher and the theologian, will attempt to find the logic in these revealed truths to the best of their abilities. However, the philosopher has the specific task of attempting this within the confines of natural human reason alone. In other words, while the Christian philosopher comes to accept revealed truth through faith as a Christian, he would, as a philosopher, try to find a way to express the same truth without the aid of revelation in his own work. Now, whether we are talking about speculative or practical philosophy does make a bit of difference in this consideration as well. We can agree that a hypothetical Christian mathematics does not seem to make sense, while Christian ethics does. What about Christian metaphysics? This seems a bit trickier. Again, in this case, there seems to be a shared concern between the metaphysician and the Christian, especially the theologian, but how much does revelation truly impact metaphysical conclusions? Let us conclude then with the following clarification. Maritain considered that speculative philosophy possesses a degree of autonomy from theology that practical philosophy does not. Then he explained that Maritain held this position because the search for wisdom has a dynamism. The lower wisdom seeks the higher wisdom. In other words, since the subject matter of metaphysics is being insofar as it is being, it is rightfully called first philosophy, since there's nothing more universal than being qua being. Moral philosophy, however, is less universal as it is concerned specifically with the human good. So, from a hierarchical standpoint, Maritain argued that moral philosophy is subalternated to theology on account of its shared end. Professor Ralph Nelson has a very clear explanation for what Maritain means exactly by moral philosophy adequately considered. He wrote, quote, 
What precisely does Maritain mean by an adequate moral philosophy? Maritain employs this term with the meaning it possesses in the Thomistic definition of truth as adequatio re et intellectus. A moral philosophy adequately considered is moral philosophy taken as constituting purely and simply, simpliciter, a true moral science in a state which makes the mind of itself adequate to or in conformity with its object, that is to say, human action. A moral science inadequately considered would be one which is not adequate to this object and hence not a science in the Aristotelian sense of the term. It will be inadequate, says Maritain, if it is in ignorance of the concrete conditions within which human nature, as it actually exists, is placed in its journey toward its end. Historically, we have been presented with two important examples of moral philosophies which are inadequate in this way, the Nicomachean ethics of Aristotle and Ecclesiastes, end quote. The completion of moral philosophy for Maritain, as for St. Thomas Aquinas, requires the import of revelation for the final answer, so to speak. But this is not to say that there is no natural philosophical content to speak of. For example, there is still virtue, natural law, happiness in this life, that is, imperfect happiness. So we can summarize then that moral philosophy from Maritain's perspective can only go so far from the vantage point of natural reason alone, and indeed it can go far, but its absolute completion requires supernatural truth to reveal what lies ahead. This complete form of moral philosophy would be what Maritain thought of as moral philosophy adequately considered, and it is a clear example of what makes Christian philosophy. Uh, thank you very much for this talk. Now we can uh, ask some questions. I can see that we have some questions already on the streams, but we will start with the questions uh, on site. Do we have any? Mm, if not, we can go to the questions from the participants on WebEx. Uh, do you have any questions here uh, in the room one? Uh, any ideas on Christian philosophy as, as an existential habitus? Um, okay, uh, I will read the questions we already received, and if some of you will, will have a question, just please raise your hand or let me know in the chat. So there are three three questions. Francisca, I will read them one by one, uh, just to make sure that everyone every every one of them is is answered. The first question is a bit long. Uh, regarding the idea of defining the Christian philosophy by its scope. Would you classify the philosopher investigating the Christianity with philosophical tools, its history or theology, and draw philosophical conclusions as a Christian philosopher? Therefore, Nietzsche, Richard Dawkins, Stephen Law, or Hitchens would be a Christian philosophers. And by the way, if we speak about Christian philosophy, would we have also a concept of anti-Christian philosophy? We could then classify aforementioned philosophers as such. Just please unmute yourself to, to answer this. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I, I unmuted you, so, so go on. All right, thank you. Um, I think that, so if I, if I understood the question right, uh, the first part seems to suggest that by talking about Christianity, that this is somehow part of Christian philosophy. Is that correct? Okay. So I would say in response to that, and then the, the next part I know is about, about the possibility of anti-Christian philosophy, but I, I want to take this in two parts. So I don't think that... Uh, to say that Christian philosophy is talking about Christianity, I don't, I don't think that that's quite right. 
Uh, that's certainly not the way that Maritain is conceiving of it here. It's not so much that the subject matter of Christian philosophy is, um, you know, Christianity itself. That that seems more to suggest that uh, the kind of view that I was talking about at the beginning of the paper of uh, trying to paint Christian philosophy as its own kind of separate science. So the way that Maritain is setting it up here, that wouldn't be quite right because philosophy is philosophy. Uh, the Christian philosophy aspect of it is really more of a statement about the philosopher himself that's practicing it, not so much uh, what you're looking at in, in this kind of narrow sense of saying, oh, well, you're talking about Christianity, so that's what we mean by uh, Christian philosophy. You know, instead, I think we could say that if you're talking about Christianity, uh, maybe you'd want to say that we're we're discussing the philosophy of religion as it pertains to Christianity, but that's much different than this kind of consideration of what the Christian philosopher actually is. Okay, so uh, as far as anti-Christian philosophy, I think that you could think of it in a similar way. Uh, let's say that from the Christian standpoint, you know, what if you have one, let's say like Nietzsche was brought up as an example, perhaps another example would be Marx, where they have an opposition to Christianity. And uh, if, let's say that Christianity is true and Maritain is right in his, in how he's talking about this, then what we're led to think for the Christian philosopher is that there is a certain level of truth or wisdom that is attained because of the help of this virtue, if it is indeed virtuous and true, right? Now, the consequence of that would be that for, let's say, the anti-Christian philosopher, however you want to paint him, then he's moving away from truth, right? So uh, what would happen here is you, you would have somebody that is moving away from the logos, somebody that is rebelling against the logos for whatever reason. Right. And if that's the case, then yes, it it shouldn't surprise us from the standpoint of uh, a Christian philosopher that the conclusions that they're going to reach are far away from what the truth actually is. That, that's kind of how we would think about it. OK, um, there are more and more questions. I will I, I'll try to read uh, a few more. Uh, the question below is uh, below the, 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 the previous one is. If, if you would therefore distinguish Christian philosophy by its method, what would you differ from theology? Okay. So here I think that uh, method is a tricky word to use because we could talk about, uh, you know, that, that's how you could distinguish analytical philosophy from non-analytical philosophy. You could say that analytical philosophy refers to a particular method. Now, you know, that's putting aside the fact that within practice, there's a tradition of analytic philosophy that has reached certain conclusions, right? But I'm putting that aside. Now, I don't think that this is quite the same as Christian philosophy, because uh, when Maritain is talking about it, it seems to me that the method is essentially the same. The only difference really has to do with let's say, the skill or the level of wisdom that the philosopher himself reaches. But he's really doing philosophy more or less the same way. And I think that this is important because uh, you're correct in thinking that if we're thinking of it as a strict method, as a distinct method, then what that would imply is that you are using faith as uh, premises or premises taken from faith as part of your philosophical investigation. And if that is indeed the case, then we're going to fall into the mistake of just theologizing philosophy. Then I think it would be, in fact, fair to say that you're just talking about theology at that point. So uh, I think that's the distinction that, that I would make there. Okay, uh, there is one more question below the previous one, which I think shed some light on it. Uh, I will read it. The quotation mark. There is no Christian math, but there is a Christian ethics. The end of quotation. So you say that in every area of human activity, that includes some axiology, 
there can be distinguished its Christian type. Am I right? Can you repeat that uh, last part again? Um, so you say that in every area of human activity, which includes some axiology, there can be distinguished its Christian type. Okay, I think I understand. So I, I think that the difference here would be that uh, what moral philosophy is after, the, the way that Maritain is describing it, it is fair to say that it is subalternated to theology on account of a shared end. Now, uh, this is kind of a finer distinction, right? But this is why uh, Christian ethics is said to make sense more than something like Christian mathematics, because what could be the shared end? answer is that on account of the shared end, right, uh, this is something that I think is clear if you go back to the beginning of uh, the Prima Secundae. When we talk about imperfect happiness, you know, it seems to me that uh, what Aquinas is doing is he's building much of his ethical system on that of Aristotle. Now, uh, there's a shared end between the two here, but we have to acknowledge that as a pagan, there's going to be a limit to uh, what Aristotle is going to reach, right? Now, if you are a Christian, on the other hand, see, this is where it gets tricky because it's very easy to slip into... Uh, Francisco, we can't hear you for some reason. I don't know whether this is the internet or... Right. Is there anything within this life without necessarily uh, relying on premises of faith, right? Is there anything that we can take from that that uh, we don't need to rely on as an authority? So in, in other words, we know as Christians that our supernatural end is beyond this world. So let me give you an example of how that might affect political philosophy, just real quick. So uh, for somebody that's an atheist like Marx, it makes sense for them to try to seek the perfect end in this world because they don't believe that anything lies beyond the next. Now for the Christian, on the other hand, if we believe that there is this afterlife, that there's a supernatural end beyond the temporal, then we're not going to place politics as this supreme system. We're not going to seek perfection in this world because we know that, well, this is going to be a search that's in vain. Now, the question for the philosopher here is, can we justify that truth only as a Christian, or are there philosophical reasons that will allow us, within the confines of natural reason, to be able to hold that position as well. And so that's what I think the Christian philosopher has to do, is just to get into that uh, little middle ground where you can answer that, right, something that you know as a Christian, but with this justification of natural reason. And, and I think just to say very generally, uh, what, what is a sketch of how you might be able to do that? Well, for example, for what we're talking about here, it would be an adequate metaphysical consideration of the contingencies of this world, you know, something like that. So you could take that avenue to be able to say that uh, even from just a philosophical standpoint, taking religion out of it, there are reasons why somebody like Marx is wrong, even just from a, a metaphysical standpoint, that doesn't have to do with these kind of faith premises. But let's say that in your own personal life as a philosopher, what got you to that point or what helped you philosophy to reach that and that's that's what Maritain's talking about it's more on the level of virtue not so much the method and science 
Okay, Francisco, just two last questions. This will be a very quick one. I love this question. Um, so the question I received is, can there be a Christian practicing philosophy which is not Christian? Hmm. That's interesting. So uh, I think that we have many examples of people, especially today, that like to study, you know, things like Eastern philosophy even, even though they're Christian in their own life. Now, I think that there's nothing wrong with this in the sense that uh, we're not, not so naive as to say, I think, that, I think it's fair to say, right, that the position that we're presenting is not that only the Christian has access to the truth in such a way that anyone who is not a Christian has absolutely, you know, nothing to say at all. Uh, I think that the way that truth and, you know, Logos, let's say. The way that this works is uh, clearly um, you can find inklings of this within various traditions. And so how might you as a Christian study non-Christian philosophy, which I think all of us do, especially when we read, I mean, I myself reading Marx or something like that. Now, obviously, I'm going to read Marx with a critical eye. And I think that's kind of the key, right? That as a Christian, obviously, there are going to be certain things with non-Christian traditions that will be incompatible with your own. So if the question would be, well, can you as a Christian hold incompatible philosophical views? I think that there we'd have a disagreement, right? There we'd have a problem. But how about uh, can you as a Christian look for not just even, you know, purely for critical, for the sake of criticism, but... Uh, can you pick up truths from non-Christian philosophers? And I think that we would have to say, yes, we do that all the time. I mean, we certainly, as Thomas, do that with Plato and Aristotle. Okay, thank you for this question. We have a last question uh, from the audience on site, Father Darius. Um, yeah. Yes. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Or uh, thank you, Francisco, for your presentation. I liked that you stressed the role of logos, um, and uh, especially saying that logos is more than truth. My question is: um, In your opinion, logos is uh, very constitutive for Christian philosophy? Or this is more contingent because of this uh, encountering of Christianity with Greek philosophy at the very beginning of, of, of Christian doctrine? Um, can you repeat the, the last part of your question? I, I want to make sure that I, I caught that. With, with regard to logos. Uh, structure logos within the Christian philosophy, is it the very content and very constitutive idea of Christian philosophy, or Logos is just historical and contingent term which happened to function in Christian philosophy? Oh, I see. I, I see. I think that uh, the way that I'm, I'm viewing Logos is, of course, there's the Greek import of the term, which uh, we could, you know, point back as early as Heraclitus and talking about this sense of uh, a kind of divine order or eternal truth, overall truth of everything. And uh, I don't, I, I don't think that this is merely. Um, I don't want to reduce it to just this idea of uh, truth in a in a very general sense or in a fancy way. Um, the reason why I'm using it is specifically because for the Christian, right, uh, beyond just this philosophical or scientific order of things, um, Christ himself is the Logos incarnate. So I think that there is something to be said for this as far as how this should impact uh, the way that we view Christian philosophy in the sense that uh, should this make a difference, right? Because if we're just talking about truth in a scientific way, then uh, why even, you know, why even bother to use that term and why not just talk about truth in general, right? Or, or uh, in, a, 
in a kind of reduced way, perhaps the way that a, an analytic might say it, right? That it's just meaning the meaning between the mind and the object. I think that for the Christian, this sense of logos is, uh, it, it ties to what Maritain is talking about with the sense of virtue as well. In other words, it allows us to think that not only am I trying as a philosopher to, uh, to understand truth, but that there's a, also even a personal connection with this truth. There's a kind of personal interaction with, with this order. So in other words, it's not just that my mind is apprehending something in the transcendent, but even that there's, uh, even beyond that practice, some kind of uh, interpersonal relationship or contact between myself and being and logos, right? And so I think that that awareness as a Christian philosopher can take us a bit further because we could even think, for example, of, uh, let's say, uh, Aquinas's formulation of God as um, subsistent being, right? Something like this. It's easy as a metaphysician to just stay within the abstract consideration of this. But I think as a Christian, we could take that even further and denote that, you know, what this really means for us is that it, it shows us just how God is present to all of us as Christians, as being itself. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that it's not just that this is a metaphysical idea. It's that for a Christian, existentially considered, it means that all of us as beings are participating in this universal of being itself. So there's a link at every single moment that we exist, God is maintaining us in existence, right? So that that's kind of what I'm getting at here, that there is that existential consideration. And so I think that uh, when we start thinking about these things as Christian philosophers, that's the avenue or that that's the way that propels us further into our religious and practice of theology too, right? So that's where there's a kind of uh, natural jumping point for us as Christian philosophers into thinking about religious matters and, and theology as well. Sorry, again, uh, thank you very much for, for your talk, Francisco, and thank you for the questions from the people watching us on YouTube and Facebook. Thank you for answering them. Thank you, Father, for the question. And now um, we'll have a coffee break, and we will meet here uh, five minutes after six o'clock to hear the keynote lecture from John Hittinger, University of St. Thomas, the same university, I guess, in Texas, isn't it? Okay, uh, so let's meet in 25 minutes, uh, so, so in order to hear the lecture and then have a discussion after that. Thank you. Thank you.
Kuba, jesteś? Dobra, zaczniesz. Okay, um, hello everyone, after the coffee break, uh, can everyone, can, can you hear me please? If you're, um, uh, can you hear me please? Someone let me know please. Yes? Yes, thank you, thank you. And can you hear me on the other, on, on the other room? Room number two, can you hear me? Can you see me? Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. So now, um, hello, John. We, we, we're going to have a, a lecture by John Hittinger, our keynote speaker. Uh, John Hittinger from University of St. Thomas, uh, Houston, uh, will give a talk titled Ask, Seek, Knock, an Augustian Motif for Christian Philosophy. So I will display the lecture right now and please keep in mind all the questions you have to, to ask them in the discussion after the lecture. Greetings from, greetings from the University of St. Thomas in Houston, Texas. My name is John Hittinger. I am the director of the St. John Paul II Institute, and I am on the faculty of the Center for Thomistic Studies. It is my pleasure and honor to be part of this conference. I want to thank Dr. Jakob Proust for inviting me. The title is Ask, Seek, Knock, an Augustinian motif for Christian philosophy. And he says the term indicates primarily a Christian way of philosophizing, a philosophical speculation conceived in dynamic union with the faith. If we turn to Fides et Ratio number 74, he talks about the fruitfulness of the relationship between faith and reason in various exemplary thinkers, he lists five from the pre-modern era and nine from the modern, or the 19th and 20th century. He says, Christian philosophy is a process of philosophical inquiry, which was enriched by engaging the data of faith, but it's this attention to the spiritual journey of the masters that will give the great momentum to both the search for truth and the effort to apply the results of the service of that search to the service of humanity. thing he says about Augustine's relevance to today, he says, he teaches the person who searches for truth not to despair of finding it. He teaches this by his example and by means of his literary activity, the program of which he had fixed in the first letter after his conversion, in which he said, it seems to me that one must bring men back to the hope of finding the truth. Now John Paul II adds, what is this way of philosophizing that will give momentum to the search for truth? And he adds this, one must seek the truth with piety, chastity, and diligence in order to overcome doubts about the possibility of returning to oneself, to the interior realm where truth dwells. Likewise, to overcome the materialism which prevents the mind from grasping its indissoluble union with the realities that are understood by intelligence, the spiritual life, the spiritual reality of the soul in God. And also to overcome, he says, the rationalism that refuses to collaborate with faith and prevents the mind from understanding the mystery of the person. Well, these 
are some themes I will want to look at in Augustine, but I would like to do it under this motif that I've learned from reading Augustine, and uh, I think it's clear in the Confessions, and I'll say a word about that at the end of my talk, but it is ask, seek, and knock. This passage from Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 and 8, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. A good way to get oriented to St. Augustine's use of this um, saying from the Gospel is to go to his commentary on the Sermon on the Mount, an earlier work written around 393. And he, he he goes at it this way, the asking refers to the obtaining by request soundness and strength of mind so that we may be able to discharge those duties which are now commanded. As for seeking, he says, that refers to the finding of the truth inasmuch as the blessed life is summed up in action and knowledge. Action wishes for itself a supply of strength, contemplation, and that means that matters must be made clear. So we must seek the truth. And then for knocking, he says the following, knowledge in this life belongs rather to the way than to the possession itself. But whoever has found the true way will arrive at the possession itself, which, however, is open to him that knocks. What if um, someone who is weak in limbs and cannot walk? In the first place, he has to be healed and strengthened if he is going to walk. This it refers, then he says, to asking. But what, is, what advantage is it to walk or even run if you'll go astray by devious paths? So second, we should find the road. We should seek the way. And then when he has kept that road and arrived at the very place where he wishes to dwell, if he finds it closed, it will be of no use to have been able to walk and know the way unless it be open to him. So let's begin with the more obvious one, the seeking for truth. Because by all accounts, Augustine was a great seeker of truth. And we open the confessions, learn about his life, and indeed we know how many questions he takes up, he took up in his life. He talks about hedonism, rhetoric, materialism and Manichaeism with its dualism as well, astrology, natural science, skepticism, stoicism, neoplatonism interpretation of scripture, the list goes on. You know, it's interesting that a great testimony to Augustine's work is given by Hannah Arendt, who in her book Life of the Mind on Willing, she says, Augustine, the first Christian philosopher, and one is tempted to add the only philosopher the Romans ever had, was also the first man of thought who turned to religion because of philosophical perplexities. I find that a useful quote because that is often a misunderstanding about Christian philosophy, that first there is faith, faith becomes a set of blinders or ideological demands, and it's just a philosophy that flows from dogma and there's really no time for thinking. Well, that's false on a lot of levels, but just on the very first one with Augustine, and I think many Christian philosophers, is that it is philosophy that often brings someone to the faith. That is certainly true of Edith Stein, St. Augustine, Jacques Maritain, it's philosophy that opens the way to perplexities and questions or an aspiration that finds a fulfillment in faith. I won't read off all the lines from the confessions that I can put on the screen here, but the great part of his seeking 
was that he was someone who did think through and learn from his experience. And so from his teaching of rhetoric, he came to see that it's not the way a statement is said that makes it true. There's a difference between truth and the expression. That's a philosophical thought. Ideas about um, a critique of hedonism and acquisition of wealth, all of these things he was thinking through, much like Aristotle and Plato do in their examination of opinions about ethics. And certainly when he was struck by his reading of Cicero, that he wanted to find wisdom, gave him a great impetus in his life. Now what John Paul II thinks is most decisive in his Christian philosophy is that he came to discover the presence of God in the human person, in himself and in others. He said, it's above all studying the presence of God in the human person that Augustine used his genius, this profound and mysterious presence, um, led him to find God as he was seeking himself or his own happiness. And John Paul II goes on to say here, the human person cannot understand himself except in relationship to God. Augustine found ever new expressions of this truth. Of course, the key here is the discovery of interiority, uh, the phrasing that Augustine used of the great abyss, or the great question, that he found himself to be an abyss or an enigma, and has he attempted to understand himself better in his search for happiness and truth, he encountered perplexities about his existence, human existence, the use of language in explaining these mysteries of personal life and love, as well as the existence and life of God. Um, John Paul II points out these Themes are present in Vatican II and their interest in the mystery of the person and the enigma of the human person, particularly the greatness of the person with the incomparable wretchedness, that grandeur and wretchedness of the human person so well expressed by Pascal is certainly started in Augustine. And then, finally, John Paul II points out, he finds one solution, which is Christ, the Redeemer of man. That is part of Christian philosophy, is to see how many of these philosophical perplexities and existential challenges um, lead one to encounter Christ and to, through conversion, to become like Christ and to be able to live and think according to, to faith and charity. Um, John Paul II wants to add his own work to this Augustinian tradition. He mentions Redemptor Hominus. And um, Redemptor Hominus, I would just take a minute to point out that Augustine does appear in that encyclical at a very strategic point. It's in section 18. Looks at Augustine to explain the church's work and where the new evangelization should begin. And it is a passage that has to do with the restlessness of the human heart, that the, the temporal and finite goods for which we live in which the modern world has been so efficient in delivering for many people, still leave the heart restless. You made us for yourself, Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. And John Paul II expands that notion of restlessness to say it is a creative restlessness that 
comes from what is most deeply human. He mentions the search for truth, the insatiable need for the good, hunger for freedom, nostalgia for the beautiful, the voice of conscience. <clears throat> of course, all of these topics are taken up in the work of St. Augustine. But these are the points at which he thinks the Church can be a witness to a life that leads to an answer to conscience, uh, an appreciation for the beautiful, the discovery of true freedom, the fullness of truth, and so on. We should now move from the question of seek and ye shall find to back up to look at the first part we must ask and receive. Why must this be added on to Christian philosophy? Why make? One of them being, a promise is made in those lines from Scripture. So it is a matter of trust. It brings up the idea of faith. That faith aids in the search. And it is something that John Paul II explains in Fides et Ratio in his letter on St. Augustine that if faith and reason are two wings by which the human spirit ascends to contemplation of God, both are needed, and faith has the role to play of um, engendering trust and confidence and stepping out on the search. So, John Paul II comments in the letter on Augustine that reason and faith are two forces that are that need to cooperate to bring the human person to know the truth and that each one has a primacy. Faith comes first in the sequence of time and learning, but reason has an absolute primacy. Again, quoting Augustine, the authority is first in the order of time, but in reality, the primacy belongs to reason. And so it is both faith and reason that make the search, the seeking, the getting on the road and following through confidently to see where it goes is a function of faith and reason. Now, I think he does, uh, John Paul II has a, a marvelous way of putting this need for faith in Fides et Ratio, in the contemporary context, when he says that faith or revelation is a lodestar, he says. It's something that guides us. The truth of Christian revelation, he says, enables all men and women to embrace the mystery of their own life. It summons human beings to be open to the transcendent, respecting their autonomy as creatures and their freedom. But it, it's something that he says stirs thought. But Christian revelation is needed as this lodestar, he says, particularly in our society in which he says is characterized by an immanentist habit of mind, the construction of technocratic logic. And it's discouraging for many people to seek the truth about themselves or the good, or God. And here in Fides et Ratio, he takes St. Augustine as one of his guides who counseled us to not wander far and wide, but return into yourself. Deep within man there dwells the truth, and that interconnection of God's presence in the person. The motif of ask not only designates this receptivity of faith, but also in the interiority, turning to God in prayer. Ask and you shall receive points to the primacy of prayer. As a matter of fact, Thomas Aquinas, when he was commenting on this passage, drawing on Augustine very heavily, summarized it very neatly. He said, you ask by praying, you seek by study, and you knock by acting. Well, St. John Paul II said that
Prior to all planning for new initiatives, we must acknowledge our receptivity to the truth and the love of God, especially in prayer. That is the moment of ask, you see, is a reminder of a fundamental receptivity that the creature has towards God, that human beings have towards others and towards the truth itself. In prayer, John Paul II said, the true protagonist is God. And we find that, of course, in St. Augustine's work. The protagonist is the Holy Spirit who comes to the aid of our weakness. So we see why seeking requires asking. It's the mode of receptivity. It also requires knocking, the mode of action. Knock and it shall be opened. You know, it's interesting when I was working on this topic, I went to the Lewis Short Latin Dictionary and looked up pulso pusatum, and it said it means to push, to strike, to beat, one variation and even to stomp. The point is knocking is more than a polite little tapping. You see, knocking, you, you have to mean it. You have to really want to get in if you knock. You have to have the gumption to go knock at the door, call out, and be asked to be let in. There's a certain commitment and earnestness that comes in knocking. Um, so I would say, as a starter, the action of knocking, first of all, signifies a decision to act. It is the full affirmation to live the truth, the fortitude of love to serve God and others. Those last two phrases, one of them from Guardini, about the affirmation to live the truth is what Augustine's conversion ultimately would turn on. We do know Augustine frequently in the Confessions and, of course, in other places, came to realize his inability to sustain the life of contemplation because of his distraction, weakness, disorder. And that's why in his commentary he uses the word possession, that knocking has to do with possessing what it is you're seeking. You might find something but still not be able to hold it, pick it up, make it useful to yourself. There needs to be some cooperation. There needs to be some appropriation that is meaningful in one's life. Living the truth is a challenge. So John Paul II said this, the great doctor of the West had come into contact with different philosophical schools, but all of them left him disappointed it's when he encountered the truth of Christian faith he found a strength to undergo the radical conversion, which the philosophers he had known had been powerless to lead him. Now, this is another theme as well taken up by Newman, that education in and of itself will not make you a better person. Knowledge does not make you a better person. There is a perfection in knowledge. But what is the purpose of the knowledge, or what is rather the fruitfulness of the knowledge? There is a fruitfulness of knowing for its own sake, yes, but when it comes particularly to the higher wisdom and to God, it is not something we can possess like we do a mathematical truth. You know, just a few of those passages from the Confessions in, the sec in Book 7, in which the crisis of this inability to live or to act is indecisiveness. He's still stung by that beggar whom he said was happier than he was. Augustine said, I had no strength to fix my gaze upon them. In my weakness, I fell back. I had the memory something that I loved and longed for, but I, I could not approach or, or abide with the, the object of my joy or my seeking. 
Um, so he'll talk about grace. By the gift of grace, he is not only shown how to see you, see the seeking, who are always the same, but is also given the strength to hold you. That will require knocking, which I'll explain here in a minute from Augustine. We know he discovered in Book 7, or it becomes thematic, the weak will or the divided will. He explains in Chapter 9, the reason why the command is not obeyed is that it's not given with the full will. It's that mystery of evil, the mystery of the divided will. It's because we will it partly. He calls it a disease of the mind, which does not fully rise to the heights where it is lifted by the truth, because it's held down by habit. So there are two wills. That's what he's unable to overcome. That's the main point of encounter with grace. To one's life, it is to live the faith. After all, that is the challenge that John Paul II saw at the heart of the renewal of Vatican II. It's the unity of faith and life. But the unity of faith and life requires an ongoing entry, if you will, into Christian life, into the gifts of the Spirit, into a way of living that requires, again, grace with our cooperation. Now, I've really been impressed by the book by Peter Brown, Augustine of Hippo. It, it's actually a book I first encountered when I was an undergraduate at Notre Dame, which is now 50 years ago, when I first encountered Augustine, and it will help us understand why we need to knock, why it must be open to us. Augustine wrote, who can embrace wholeheartedly what gives him no delight? But who can determine for himself that what will delight him should come his way, and when it comes that it should in fact delight him? Now that got me to go read from the footnotes from Peter Brown, Augustine's spirit and letter. And sure enough, it, it's just overwhelming to see how many times the word delight appears in that text, along with the citation of Romans 5.5, 5, that God's love is shed into our hearts through the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. Just a brief example here, he says, We affirm the human will is aided in the pursuit of righteousness, that he receives the Holy Ghost by whom there is formed in his mind a delight and a love of the supreme and unchangeable good God. Okay, so not to lose track of what we're doing here, talking about knock and it will be opened. I think knocking is what is the manifestation of love. That one has the love that raises one up to go forward. The weight of the soul is love, and that is the love of God that impels one, stirs one to convert and to act. Augustine will say that, see, the doing of duty and living rightly require, he says, this encounter with God's love poured into our heart by the Holy Spirit. Since uh, so well, now I am going to read you one more passage from St. Augustine that I think will help understand why, in addition to asking and seeking, we need to know how to knock. We need to know how to go forward to the object of our love and seek it with the greatest ardor. In his commentary on John, Augustine says the following, Give me a man in love. He knows what I mean. Give me one who yearns. Give me one who is hungry. Give me one far away in the desert who is thirsty and sighs for the spring of the eternal country. Give me that sort of man 
He knows what I mean, but if I speak to a cold man, he just does not know what I'm talking about. So the conclusion here is, why must we knock? Because things are not readily open to us. Some things also may need the manifestation of love. You know, why does one knock at a door? For a businessman, it may be an opportunity, but he must have that ardor to make the deal, the art of the deal. Why does a young man knock on the door of some young lady whom he finds attractive? It is the boldness of love, and it requires that one be able to go forward, to make the declaration, if you will, to take the stand, and then your life and the conversion of life becomes more solid, real, and concrete. Okay, so I would like to conclude by looking at briefly this theme of ask, seek, and knock in the confessions. Looking at the beginning, but primarily at the end, you know, book one does open with this, an allusion to this particular passage, Matthew 7.7, 7, in which he talks about the restless heart asking and seeking God. The phrase knocking is not in there, but that we will see as part of the story. And uh, I would suggest that's what we find in book seven. I've suggested that. I follow Frederick Crossan, the late professor of philosophy and liberal studies at Notre Dame, who says there are actually two middle books to the Confessions. Book five is the middle book of the nine books of narrative, but book seven is the middle book of the Confessions as a whole, with 13 books. And Crossan points out the two significant terms in book five and seven. That five is that he leaves Africa to go to Rome, leaving the Manichees and starting to um, embrace the teaching of Ambrose. In book seven, we have the beginning of the turn from Platonism and pagan philosophy to come to the conversion through the reading of St. Paul and hearing the story of the conversion of St. Anthony, which is iterated through a number of stories, the open-ended power of the gospel, the story of the rich young man affecting Anthony, and then other Roman officials, ultimately Augustine, and it can roll on to any reader of the confessions, this call to conversion. But let's go to, I think it's the last two books that are often mysterious to people, why they are there or what they add. We know they are a commentary on Genesis. But I think an interesting part of their power is that they pick up this theme, seeking, asking, seeking, and knocking. Book 12 opens with quoting that scripture and talking about the difficulty in asking, seek, and knocking, and then 12, an extended search for the meaning of the line, in the beginning God created heaven and earth, but the great discovery is about the heaven of heavens. That is, there is an abode of contemplation, of joy and truth that is part of God's creation. And then in book 13, he develops the theme of the weight of the soul, which is love, looks at the rising and falling of the soul, and then the very end of the book, conf the Confessions ends with a quotation from Matthew 7, 7 and 8. It is a variation that he gives that I want us to look at. So let's go to that. The opening chapter of Book 12 of the Confessions. He says, Given the promise of Matthew 7, 7, and 8, we do not fear to be deceived. 
But then he says this, the poverty of our human intellect produces an abundance of words and more talk is spent in search than in discovery. It takes longer to ask than to obtain and the hand that knocks toils harder than the one that receives. But we have your promise and who shall annul it? Again, I think that's just the weight of the the experience of human life, the search of the scholar, the time of the man of the word writing his homilies and um, talking to his friends, there is a challenge and a difficulty. But he will go forward, you see, to, to in this book, look at the goal of our pilgrimage. So if the Confessions is about his journey and his pilgrimage, he now puts the pilgrimage in the largest possible context against the scriptures about the creation of the world and God's design for creation. And a significant part of it is when he understands there is a heaven above the heavens, or heavens has a twofold meaning. There is the heavens that we see above us, but there is a significant meaning that refers to a spiritual heaven. That the heaven of heavens, he says, is the dwelling which forever contemplates the blessedness of God. And there's a lesson for the soul when you become aware that there is this heavenly abode. It's to ask for one thing, to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So now he is modifying even the phrase ask. Let's make the ask not complicated, but simple. Here's the simple ask, to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He then says in chapter 15, O house of light and beauty, in my pilgrimage, let me sigh for you when I pray to him who made you to possess me too in you. And then he talks about his conversations with people about the meaning of the heavens and those who are skeptical about there being a heaven of heavens. And he says, I'll leave them basically to inhale the dust of the earth but I withdraw into my secret cell and sing you hymns of love, groaning with grief that I cannot express as I journey on my pilgrimage. Yet I shall remember the heavenly Jerusalem, and my heart shall be lifted up towards that holy place. Inspire me to long for it. Again, I think we see here that idea that Peter Brown was on to, the delight that motivates choice. And that's what is motivating Augustine as he's writing and what he is encouraging us to consider. O oh, house of light and beauty. As we go into book 13, he talks about the abyss, the depth at the beginning of creation, and that the Spirit hovered over the depth. And it was through God's light, the Logos, that things came to be. But it's interesting, he sees this meaning of the abyss as a constant reminder, see, of the abyss of the self, the abyss of the spiritual reality that he says. We can be drawn down into the dark or drawn upward by the love of God through the Holy Spirit. And he says, the depth, the abyss is not a place, but an analogous spiritual reality. And so he says, spiritual creatures were plunged into a dark abyss. And when spirits fall, he says, their darkness is revealed, for they are stripped of a garment of light. But by the misery and restlessness which they then suffer, we see that nothing less than yourself suffices to give it rest and happiness. This means they cannot find it in themselves. So the search, the seeking, see he's modified the ask, now he has us think about the searching, the seeking, 
the seeking must be outside of ourselves to find God, the light, the divine light. And it's through grace. It's by the gift, he says, of the Holy Spirit we are set aflame and born aloft and our hearts are set upon an upward journey, a soul of ascent. I'm sorry, a song of ascent. So the journey is not just this temporal one. Yes, it is that. But it is primarily that journey upwards towards God that we live every day. Augustine sees see the possibility of each soul's rising and falling, and that it's something that is an ongoing challenge. And I think that's what we'll get again to the need for knocking, is to always be taking the stand for assent. He does say at the end here now in book 13, or it's actually in the middle of 13, but it's as far as I'm going to read, my soul is still sad because it falls back again and becomes an abyss or realizes that it is still a deep abyss. But faith, the lantern to give light to guide my feet in the dark, speaks to my soul to have hope and persevere on the pilgrimage. Again, the pilgrimage in time, but even more so the pilgrimage of the heart, the pilgrimage of prayer, the pilgrimage of the seeking of divine wisdom. So now to conclude here, at the very end of the book, it may be surprising, but here we are, the last lines of the confessions. We must ask it of you, seek it in you, we must knock at you or your door, only then shall we receive what we ask for and find what we seek only then will the door be open to us. So this is a fascinating way of, of again, this modification of Matthew 7.7, 7, deepening its meaning. Yes, you should ask, seek, knock, but after this long journey, after the testimony of the confessions, here is what this means. We must ask of God. We must seek truth, the truth of God, and we must knock at. I mean, the literal meaning is at you. It's understood your door, but the door is just the metaphor for the need to cross over, the need to enter into something that we have not had access to or that we need to enter more deeply and the door will be open to us. So that concludes my talk on Ask, Seek, and Knock, a motif for Christian philosophy. It shows philosophy at the heart of Augustine's Christian philosophy, but it is enhanced, obviously, by the asking. It is enhanced by the knocking. Um, thank you very much, John. That was John Hittinger from the University of St. Thomas, Houston. Um, so, do we have any questions on site? Yes, we have questions on site. First question, please. I'm asking English. Hello, John. It's great to hear from you. I have a question. Um, you can hear. Can you hear me, John? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, Greetings, Father. Uh, it's good to okay. see. You. Great, yeah. Great to hear from you. A very good presentation. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I'm not a great specialist in Saint Augustine, but uh, I found it quite interesting. You know that characterization of that great saint and philosopher as someone who moved from perplexities of philosophy, perplexities of human reason, into theology, into the Christian faith. Uh, very interesting uh, comparison. 
Uh, but my question actually concerns the opposite direction. Do you think that St. Augustine can help us to move uh, from Christian faith, from um, our union with God, to the world with, which surrounds us, the world which very often is very hostile to Christians, yeah, and demanding um, from us, you know, a justification of our faith of what we believe in, in the terms they consider worthy and valid. So, in short, do you think that in the contemporary time at present, we can use St. Augustine philosophy to deal with uh, the great chunk of contemporary philosophy, which is not Christian, uh, sometimes very hostile to Christianity, uh, do you think that St. Augustine can be helpful in this respect? Thank you. Thank you, Father Gregory. That's a great question. You know, I, I'll first just go back to that passage from John Paul II in Redemptor Hominus and then give some examples. You know, he's that idea of a creative restlessness. That, that's John Paul II's letter on Augustine of Hippo. It's not that well known, but it's an extensive study of St. Augustine. And at the end, he says, you know, Augustine is a philosopher for, for the young in particular because he talks about freedom, beauty, love. I mean, I think those things he picks out, conscience, the, the, the issues of conscience, beauty, love, community, that Augustine, I think, will push people to, to an honest acknowledgement of, of the failures that are due in part to the weight of human sin. Now, I know sin has a sting that people don't want to hear, but that's where I would say, I love those passages in Book 13 of the rising and falling of the soul. And, and let me just give you two very contemporary points that I, I use with students anyway. You know, the center of Solzhenitsyn's book, The Gulag, it's called Soul Under Barbed Wire, and it's called The Ascent. And he wakes up on his rotten straw of a prison bed and says, I thank you, rotting straw bed, because you have taught me that life is not about when will I get my freedom? Where is my food coming from? But it's about what kind of person I am, that I need, even in prison, all the more so to know how to rise, how to rise and, and do what is something that is just, something that has integrity. Another one in our previous session, we talked about Rene Girard, and Girard has a terrific book on Dostoevsky in which he goes through this whole business of the underground man and how our modern society is racked by envy, by, by a false identification of who we are with what others do and what others consume. And it gets into the spiral of, um, of a mimetic rivalry, you call it. But again, I think it's the Augustinian solution that Dostoevsky comes up with because it's the gospel, which is one has to return to yourself and in conscience, you know, knock and make your stand that I will act. I will act with love. I will act with, with truth. And if one finds oneself falling, I think that's where one has to say the grace of God has to be brought in. And that's up to him, not us, Gregory, as you know. But I think that witness to, to the rising in love, to the act of love that Aloysia learns from his elder, and it, it, it's the teaching of the saints. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I have another question from our YouTube stream, so I will read it to you, and please... John uh, answer. The question is from David Ezekiel Telles. Does knock have something to do with the bi biblical violence which Jesus refers to when he says the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent bear it away? Uh, 
I was going to bring that in, but was short of time. Um, yes, you know, Augustine, when he saw, remember when he saw the drunk beggar back in its book five or six and realized, you know, he is the learned man with a high position in government, <clears throat> but he's racked with his misery, <clears throat> his frustrations, and it's the simple faith that propels him forward, the faith of his mother, the faith the, the simple faith. So um, the violence is the knocking. I would say it, it is the taking the stand for what ultimate counts, which is the coming of the kingdom. And the coming of the kingdom is about, you know, the Beatitudes. One can just spell that out. And it's not a function of philosophy. And that that's the inversion of Greek philosophy, isn't it? That the Greeks tended to see the philosopher as a pinnacle of the possibility of virtue. And um, look, Augustine in his overstatement says the great souled man is condemned to hell in the city of God. I think we know what he means there, which is just pride goes before the fall. And Thomas has to interpret, you know, magnanimity is still a great virtue, but it has to be based upon the truth it's the courage that's based on truth for the gifts that God gives you. But thank you for bringing that passage up. It's, it's very apropos. Okay, thank you for this answer. We got one uh, question on site. Hello, John. My name is uh, Andrew, critics of uh, Krakow. Uh, many thanks indeed for your interesting philosophical but uh, uh, spiritual um, um, presentation. Uh, I would have one uh, question regarding our conference, uh, regarding Christian philosophy. So, your country is profoundly divided on the religious level. There are many different uh, Christian uh, denominations. So, what can you say uh, about uh, many different interpretations of uh, Christian philosophy in your country among uh, different Christian denominations? Thanks. This is one reason I chose this topic, because I think it's a unifying topic to propose that Christian philosophy is and ought to be Augustinian. I mean by that, not that it must follow every way of Augustine, Augustine's philosophy, there will be differences. <clears throat> I mean, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I have colleagues who think Augustine is the problem with all thinking, and they want to say Descartes was an Augustinian and are very hostile to Augustinian method. But I, I think, I, I think that's an incorrect view of Augustine, obviously, because he he doesn't just stop at doubt and truth, but includes the good and so on. But look, nevertheless, I would say I see this as a way of going forward that. Certainly all Christian philosophers can join in. It should not be problematic that seeking is number one. And, and maybe that's a message right there, that too many Christians stop seeking. Uh, I was actually up at 2 a.m. Houston time and heard some good talks this morning. But someone talked about instrumentalizing, you know, Catholic faith to achieve a political goal. I mean, that's always a challenge. One has to witness to the truth. But I think the purpose is not to pick up the clubs for political battle, but it is to deepen our understanding of it. That is the seeking. And then the crossing over through knocking. I think that's, that's the true witness again that I think brings us together. Knocking means to enter into uh, living in the truth. And by the way, um, Benedict in his Wednesday audience, I had not really heard it put this way. He said, Augustine underwent three conversions, not only the conversion of the confessions, but a conversion to service to others <clears throat> as priest and bishop, and then a third conversion of every day a growth in humility. 
So isn't that, uh, I, I, again, I think good counsel for us today that uh, we must be careful of seeing the beam in the eye, uh, the speck in the eyes of others and not seeing the beam in our own eye. I think all of this would fall out, you know, with this Augustinian spiritual journey <clears throat> where the, the seeking is prepared by asking, receptivity and humility, but also galvanized by an action <clears throat> that is a desire to live like Christ, which is not easy, particularly in the modern political climate. Uh, thank you, John. I have a question from our participants. Can you can you see the can you see the question on the chat from, from Daniel Spencer? Um, would you like to read it? Yes, this is the one I'm wondering about the central claim or the claim that a central part of Christian philosophy might involve to paraphrase, hopefully not tendentiously, an inward seeking of the divine presence within. Okay, so I, I will have to fill that in, and then, Daniel, you can add to it. I, I presume this means that it could sound like the, um, yeah, a kind of withdrawing from the world and action in the world or care for the world. And, uh, you know, that's certainly not what Augustine means eventually. We know from his life that perhaps he did mean that after his conversion, wanting to live with his friends in a contemplative community. Well, that's what Pope Benedict called the second conversion, when he realized, um, what's the point of philosophy? Just sitting around with a dozen friends, talking. I mean, that's a great thing to do, but... There's more to life. There's more that I'm being called to do. So if I rephrased it, uh, t tell me what your objection was more specifically. Was it that or something else? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, sorry, it's a bad internet connection. I don't know if you'll hear me. I Something went wrong with the formatting on the chat on the side. So there's a couple of follow-ups there if you scroll down. Let me see. I... I'm sorry I didn't see that. Oh, there they are. Yes. Okay. There it is. The objective presence of God inside of us, something true of everyone, everyone and at all times, such that anyone can in principle apprehend this apart from grace, or is this a special gift reserved for those in Christ, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? Well, let me answer that and then read your last qualification and see if I get to it. I mean, this came up in, in an earlier session. I was also asking, I think it was, um, who was it who gave a very good paper here? Was it Hunter? Hunter, yes, about Augustine's first encounter with truth. Is that prior to grace? Well, no. I mean, there is a special grace that came through the the, the turning, the hearing of the gospel, the receiving of faith, but it does seem to me that there is some, now I'm not a theologian and I might get in over my head here, but just the, the meaning that Benedict gave that, look, truth is something given. Love is something given. There's something graceful about any encounter with truth and love that we realize we receive it, we don't deserve it, or we didn't create it, we encounter it, and that brings us joy. I mean, certainly God uses those moments for people to step along the journey. So um, I would say then that, yes, Buddhist, Platonist, you name it. Um, again, I understand that to be part of not only the teaching of Vatican II, which for some may not be great, I think it is, but back to the fathers, back to Newman, you know, that there is some seed of the word cast throughout the earth from the very beginning. And Augustine's finding of the truth within, I think, is a manifestation of that. So, okay, the last question is the pluralism. Um, and that is the phenomenological similarity of many Christical mystic, I'm sorry, Christian mystical experiences. Try to say that fast. With those of, say, various Buddhist, Platonists, and so on. Um, you know, this is where the 
good theological work needs to be done. And again, it's not in my area, but I do know that uh, there there is a lot of good work ha- that has been done, actually for decades, maybe even a century of, of Catholics and others who have gone and sought that encounter with the other ancient traditions and seek to find the similarities but also acknowledge differences. I mean, that's part of the interreligious dialogue. You know, John Paul II was criticized for the prayer day at Assisi, but, you know, he, he was seeking to find uh, a stand by those who are seeking God as a witness against the secularity, the aggressive secularism, not secularity, which is a good thing, But in his book, Crossing the Threshold of Hope, he has very sharp comments about Buddhism and other religions. And that that's part of the dialogue. You know, that's I I think that's yeah, that that's a great challenge of the day. Thanks for asking that, Daniel. Uh, hello, John. Can you hear me? Okay, okay. Dariusz Dankowski, a Jesuit from Poland. Uh, my question is a sort of pedagogical question. If I understood you correctly, John, your lecture was the proclamation of the virtue philosophy. Ask, seek, and knock. It means, in fact, keep asking keep seeking and keep knocking and not just one day not two days but always so immediately after i started to hear you i started to think about our undergraduate students who are not patient enough and sometimes they ask and they are not answered they see they don't find and they knock and the door is not open, seems to be closed forever. Students are not patient. So my, my question is simple, very, very much pedagogical. What would be your advice in this proclamation uh, of virtue philosophy, not for academics who are trained, who have been trained for years, but for the beginners, for the undergraduate students, um, would you start with uh, joyful, uplifting piece of philosophy to give them the taste of this philosophy or with challenging philosophy? Uh, because what you have said is not just intellectual, it's also spiritual. And, and my question comes to the, this, this borderline of intellectual action when it starts to be spiritual, but, but the classroom is not the retreat house and it's a question of method. Um, does it make sense what I said? Yes, it does. Thank you, Father Darius. I heard your talk earlier and I appreciated it. So thanks for having me. I look forward to coming to Krakow to meet you sometime and all of you. Okay, um, look, that, that's another terrific question. I mean, where to begin? You notice, Father Darius, I began with seeking. I mean, I think that's where to start. And so Socrates is always our guide here, you know? So with your question about students, I wouldn't want to start by making them, I mean, not that I can, that's part of the teaching, <laughs> feel the joy in truth, but to have the uncomfortable experience of realizing, come to know that they don't know. So as far as the educational gambit goes, I don't see any way to avoid, uh, we've got to begin with the Socratic moment, and I think Augustine does that, right? He opens with a torrent of questions in the confessions that challenges us to think. Now, where the asking and the knocking come in, that, yes, I I suppose that's outside of the classroom, or maybe it's also, though, I do think at some point there's got to be a discovery of truth. I mean, really, if we spend all this time with undergraduates and they never had the experience of discovery of joy and joy in the truth. Somewhere we're failing. I'm not sure where. Yeah. So I, I find, you know, I remember when I was an undergraduate, I've been teaching for over 40 years. Um, 
there are always moments, many moments. You just have to know where to go, right? I mean, that's where I do think philosophers need to learn about the literary and the artistic to bring in, and I think most of us do that, uh, to, to encounter those moments of insight or um, some truth in which there is a joy. And then to build on that, uh, you know, the asking, the receiving of faith, I know that's, that's also not something that's common among the young, among the millennials and those after them. And it's, it's frustrating, you know, but I think the patient witness to the faith as all our great leaders from Pope Francis back through John Paul to Benedict, uh, Paul VI, what the world needs is not teachers, right, but those who live the truth and love the truth. I think that's very John Paul II in approach, that the personalism, the respect for the person, students will respond to that. And then finally on knocking, and, and really I like the way you put it, it is an ongoing thing. That, that's what I saw the meaning of uh, book 13, chapter 1, the weary Augustine, saying, I have been asking, seeking, and knocking for a long time, and it gets long, it gets empty. And he is restored with some of those images of the, you know, the abode of light and beauty, but, but the knocking, just to finish my answer here, I think, you know, the coming to take a stand for what is right, that, that's the knocking, to enter into something greater. And I think that's another way to see faith also. If somebody is searching, you need to knock at the door of faith and baptism. And that's the ultimate goal, isn't it, Father? I mean, that, that's where it will come together with faith, and then the living of faith. So thank you for the question. Okay, do we have more questions uh, from the participants on WebEx or from the participants on site? Um, if we have no questions, um, I'll thank you to you, John, for the very interesting lecture and for all of you who participate in our conference today. Um, so again, thank you very much. Uh, that's not the end of the conference. That's, that was the only the first day. Tomorrow we meet at uh, 9 o'clock Polish time, uh, and we will start in, uh, in breakout sessions. So in room one, we're going to have session session five, and in room two, we're going to have session six, uh, dedicated to Polish Christian philosophy. And so we, you, you will receive the, the links to YouTube, Facebook, and the WebEx uh, at the morning before the conference starts. Uh, so I wish you to have a good evening for the European time, and have a good day for the Americans, and uh, wish you all the best and see you tomorrow. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you, Jakob. Thank you, everybody.